24. Prince Antar set out in pursuit of Princess Anna jo with an expeditionary force of twenty knights and sixty soldiers, and also the sorcerer's blue voice, who would keep the prince apprised of the girl's position through contacts with his far-seeing master. The men of Labernock travelled from the citadel in three large flatboats, equipped with auxiliary punts. The Fronio mounts belonging to the knights were left behind by princely order, which occasioned great grumbling by Sir Rinitar and Sir Caron and their cronies, even though they could not say how and where they hoped to ride the great steeds in the trackless mazy mire. The flatboats each had three crews of oarsmen to row double time in sequential shifts, and the big boats fairly flew along the calm waters of the lower Mutar and Lake Wum. Following Oregastus's triumphant second scry, the search party was augmented by the master trader Edzar, who was as experienced in dealing with the timber purveying Wavilo aborigines of the Tassaleo forest as he was with the Nisimu of Trevista. Through the intermediary blue voice, Edzar had conferred with the sorcerer and devised a plan that he declared to be foolproof. Now the Labernaki force was fast approaching Tass Town, the only sizable human settlement on the lake. The timber trading center of Ruenda was a rather shabby agglomeration of docks, warehouses, and shanties situated on an island, surrounded on all sides by floating booms which formed great pens that enclosed the raw logs. The master trader Edzar explained to the knights that many of these would be transported to holding yards at the upper end of the lake by forming them into rafts and sailing them north during the rainy season, when the prevailing winds were favorable. The more valuable cut lumber and peeled spars were loaded on flatboats and transshipped at any time of the year to the northern yards, whence they were carted away via the trade route during the dry seasons. Riding on the forward deck of the flagship with the awning shading them from the blazing lake sun, the prince's men were bored with voyaging and the genial trader's lecture, there being little else to do but drink and watch the scenery, and eager to begin their hunt again. Their first search for Princess Anagel in the mazy mire near Citadel Knoll and the Great Causeway had been a near fiasco. The men were chevaliers, not sailors, and had no knowledge of how to direct a search on water. The force of twenty auxiliary punts, each bearing a knight commander, three men-at-arms, and three oarsmen, had milled about the mire every which way under the orders of their inexperienced captains. There had been squabbles over who should search the near areas and who the far, who the clear channels and who the dense thickets crawling with venomous water-worms, stinging vermin, and voracious mylingal fish. Several hours were wasted, crisscrossing the same easy territory and leaving other places untouched, until the skipper of the flagship had tactfully suggested to Prince Antar that the watermen, rather than the knights, should direct the movements of the boats, with a large reward offered to the crew that should first locate the princess. An efficient search was then conducted, which, unfortunately, came to naught. Prince Antar did not seem at all dejected by their lack of success. Now, as the search party approached the scene of more promising action, Antar became morose and edgy, so that the rough-hewn Sir Rinitar whispered to a few of his intimates that the prince seemed not to subscribe wholeheartedly to their quest. His remarks were overheard by the bluff and loyal Sir Penipat, who took great exception to them, and threatened to break Rinitar's head. An unseemly fracas was avoided only by the intervention of Antar himself, who restored order with the help of his marshal, Sir Owanan. The prince then retreated to his solitary position in the bows of the flagship, where none dared to disturb him, and remained there until they were about to dock. At this time the prince called upon the master trader Edzar to bring out his maps once again, and recapitulate his scheme for the entire knightly party, so that there would be no misunderstandings when they disembarked. Edzar still wore his gold-embroidered green tabard, but he had exchanged his orange robe for a vivid purple one, and his leaf hat for another even broader of brim, woven intricately of long conifer needles and banded with large cerise flowers. As you can see, my lords, he began, three large rivers, including the lower Mutar, feed into Lake Wum, but there is just one outlet the great Mutar, which flows into the Tassileo forest, and is the only corridor into that howling wilderness. If the mighty Orogastus has interpreted his vision correctly, 
then Princess Anagel is heading for the forest, and to get there, she must pass here. His finger indicated like one's southern outflow, which on the map was labeled Tass Falls. The lanky, saturnine blue voice now insinuated himself forward. He usually kept to the flatboat skipper's cabin, being shy of sunlight as a slug, but their near approach to Tastown had brought him on deck. My worthy master trader, the ice mirror of my almighty master not only sees, but also hears. The far sensing lasts but a minute. Nevertheless, on his second scrying, my master clearly heard the Princess Anagel's servant remark about their impending journey into the Tassileo forest. The prince scowled at the map. If we miss her at the falls, we'll have to chase her down the great Mutar. It's less than a fortnight to the rainy season. And what in Zoto's name are we going to use down there for boats? Edzar said, It should be possible for us to lower our own punts via the log lift. However, the Wavilo have their own much faster river craft moored below the falls. In the normal course of events, humans do not ride in them. Ruendian humans, that is. But if we find it necessary to pursue the princess down the great Mutar, we might, er, uh, try to convince the Wivilo to transport us. Sir Renatar gave a wicked chuckle. Now, how could they possibly refuse to help a fine lot of lads like ourselves? He had been sharpening his sword, which he now swept up in a gentle arc, bringing the point to bear on the master trader's bulbous nose. Edzar spluttered, and the knights laughed. The blue voice said, I am empowered to demonstrate certain magic to the forest oddlings, should they be reluctant to assist us. Between my sort of persuasion and Sir Rinitar's, we should experience no great difficulty securing additional transport, should that contingency arise. Of course... If Master Edzar's plan succeeds, we will take Princess Anagel here at the falls. Sir Owanan, who was Prince Antar's close friend as well as his second in command, was a younger man with a humorous, intelligent face. He now lifted an admonitory finger. Hark! Is that the cascade itself, I hear? It is indeed, my lord, the traitor replied. Tass Falls are quite impassable to rivercraft. They are more than sixty ells high and spew a great volume of water, even in the dry season. Below them, the great Mutar flows wide and slow to the sea. Wavilo loggers have no trouble bringing their timber upstream to the falls. It is a droll sight to see the strange inhuman beings perched in a long line atop a floating log of heroic proportions, pulling it upstream while singing their barbaric anthems, and no doubt planning ingenious ways to slice up the liver of the next unlucky human they meet, drawled Sir Karen. Most of the other knights laughed grimly. No, no, my lords, Edzar protested. For all their horrific appearance, the Wavilo are er, relatively civilized. You are thinking of their cousins, the Glismac, who live further south. They are the ones with cannibalistic tendencies. Stones of Zoto, somebody exclaimed. We must fight man-eaters. You can hold our cloaks, Stolafat, if the prospect freezes your guts, jeered Rinitar. Enough of this, Prince Antar broke in. Master Edzar, show us again this so-called foolproof plan of yours. And to his men... Pay attention and cease this bickering. Edzar flourished the map and re-spread it, beckoning all to come closer. See here. Tass Town on its island lies near the lake's eastern shore. The eastern channel is completely blocked with log booms. To the west are fewer booms, for there arise the rocks called the Fangs of Munjuno, through which swift currents pour before surging over the rim of the cascade. The western lake shore at this point is sheer rock and quite impassable, while on the eastern shore is thick jungle, penetrated only by the skid road that leads from the great log lift at the precipice edge to the cove opposite Tass Town, where the wood is put into the water. This eastern road is the place where we must set up our ambush. 
Edzar pointed first to the map, then to the eastern shore, which lay across from their docking place, beyond a great labyrinth of floating timber. The prince and his men could see numbers of skeletal wagons parked on the skid road, having wheels taller than a man, but there seemed to be no people or draft animals moving about over there, and indeed the shore looked deserted. The war brought most commerce in Tass Town to a halt, Edzar explained. The Ruendian workers who normally staff the lumber mill below the falls, the Great Lift, and the Skid Road have not yet returned to work. Lord Zontel, one of General Hamel's most trusted aides, has been charged with setting up a garrison here. He expects to have the situation well in hand by the end of the rains. All the logs that you see now in the water will be sent to the northern end of the lake by that time, and by the spring dry season, timber production should be back to normal. Cease boring us with your mercantile trivia, traitor! Sir Rinitar slapped the map impatiently. Do you guarantee that the fugitive wench can get to the Tassileo forest by no other route than this, this skid road? Edzar drew himself up in offended dignity. I do. There is a vast, unscalable escarpment along this border of the Ruenda tableland. Untold ages ago, a narrow footpath was cut by the oddlings in the cliff, east of the falls. The great log lift and the lumber mill below, that is powered by the falling water, were built by the first humans inhabiting Ruenda, utilizing foundations that are said to have been left by the vanished ones. There is no way from Lake Wum to the great Mutar River, save the lift and the footpath. The princess must take the skid road to attain either one. The three flatboats of the search force were now being tied up at the main Tass Town dock, which also seemed conspicuously devoid of activity. Well-armed soldiers of Labernock stood guard all along the quayside as glum-looking Ruendians handled the lines and pulled the gangplanks into place. A labor knocking nobleman in elaborate armor, attended by several officers, waited impatiently for the docking maneuvers to be completed so that he could greet the prince. But Antar was bent over the map, giving instructions. This is the way we shall deploy them. We will divide our force into three companies, Awanin to lead the first, Dodabalik the second, and Rinitar the third, to be stationed at the skid road landing, midway down the road where the footpath cuts off, and at the top of the log lift. Do you not intend to command a company yourself, my prince? Sir Rinitar's tone was tainted with the slightest archness. No, said Antar coldly. The blue voice and I will coordinate the action from a point of vantage. He is able to far see for short distances. Penipat will also remain with us, since his foot is not yet healed from the waterworm bite to handle the signalmen and messengers who will transmit my orders. We must make absolutely certain. The prince's gaze met that of the hovering blue voice. That Princess Anagel does not slip through our fingers again. It was just after noon of their third day on Lake Wum, and the sound of Tass Falls rumbled in the air like faraway thunder, its brink lost in sparkling mist. Anagel and Imu had approached Tastown's island with great care, and their boat now lay concealed beneath a weeping tree that grew from a cleft in a great precipice along the western shore. All about their hiding place huge rocks rose from the water. Between them and the island less than two hundred ells away, the five pointed fangs of Munjuno marked the point of no return above the falls. A small boat could breast the current north of the rocks and safely reach the log booms and the opposite shore, but to pass south of the fangs meant being trapped in swifter waters and swept over the cataract. What we must do, Imu said, laying out a frugal lunch in the green shade, is wait until nightfall, then cross over above the fangs. There is a road on the shore over there that runs less than half a league. We follow it to a steep path that leads down to the Ruendian sawmill at the foot of the falls, and steal another boat there. But the Rimericks! Anadil cried. But, but, but! We let the good creatures go free, back to their home waters. Did you think you could keep them as pets forever? Anadil hung her head. I did not think at all. Imu patted her shoulder. 
Never mind. The great mutar is very shallow, aside from the main channel. We can make a log raft and pole downstream if need be, and at least one of your great fears will be left behind. The troops of Labernock will never think to look for us in the Tassileo. With Locke, the Wavilo will respect your Trillium amulet, just as the Wizgu did, and they will help you on your quest. Anadja looked up dubiously from munching her dried roots. Do you really think so? I have heard that they are very hostile to humankind, and fearsome to look upon as well. They're not the kind of folk you would invite to a grand ball at the Citadel, Imu conceded. Some Nisimu say that eons ago, members of our race were stolen away by the Skritek and forced to consort with them, and from the mating arose both the Wivilo and their more primitive neighbors, the Glismak. What do they look like? Anagel asked, licking her fingers. I have never seen one, but they are said to combine Skritek features with those of Nisimu or Wizgu. Ugh, said the princess. Whatever their aspect, Imu continued reprovingly, the Wivilo are also subjects of the White Lady, who revere the Black Trillium, and so we may hope they will receive us kindly. These Glismak, they are unfriendly to humans. Imu sighed. Like the Skritek, those fiends of the Mazy Mire, the Glismak hate all beings save themselves. We must pray that your talisman— Look! cried Anagel, pointing across the water. Oh, look! A whole fleet of punts coming out from behind the island, and the leader bears the banner of Labernock! Imu shaded her eyes and peered into the shimmering glare. The air was windless, and it was very hot. Are you sure? Oh, I am. The mighten sharpens all senses. She shrank back, terror blanching her face. It's a search party come looking for me, and they are heading for the eastern shore. By the flower, Imu growled, they have cut us off. If we had only arrived sooner. They must not take me. Is there no other way down? Imu screwed her face into a scowl as she thought. Down, down, down. I know only the one way. But then her expression changed, and she seized the girl by the shoulder with one small taloned hand, while the other pointed over the side of the boat. But they might know another. The Rimericks? Anagel whispered. Try them, Imu snapped. The princess leaned over the gunwale. The traces of the harness that the water creatures wore had been greatly lengthened for lake travel, and the water here was deep. The Rimericks were out of sight, seeking coolness. My friends, I have a most important thing to ask you. First one dark shape appeared, then another. The two sleek, green-spotted heads lifted out of the water with hardly a ripple, and the animals bared their fangs in a manner that Anna Jill had once thought ferocious, but now knew to be their fashion of smiling. Human friend, ask your question. Do you know where we are now? Certainly. On the brink of the great white falling water. Do you have any other questions? Is there a way down into the great Mutar River? Yes, there is a way from the wide flat water into the water flowing to the sea. Imu, the princess cried. They say there is a way. Ask them if they can take us. Imu's voice was strained, harsh. Can you take us down there in the boat? If you wish it. There are evil humans on other boats round about the island over there. Can you take us so that they can't catch us? Oh, yes. Do you wish to go now? If so, we must first share Mighton. They say yes, Anagel exclaimed, radiant with joy. They want to know if we'd like to go now. Oh, it's wonderful. What should I tell them, Imu? The oddling woman's great yellow eyes blinked slowly. Her gaze was fixed on that of the human whom she loved, seeing the once delicate skin now sunburned and insect-bitten, the hair that used to be compared to spun gold now turned to frowsy straw, the blue eyes, once brimming with fear, now eagerly aglitter. My sweet child, of course you must tell them to take us. 
Having spoken, Imukame set about repacking the food, then tied their two packs by the cords to one of the pump ports. Anagil had taken the mitten gourd from her belt wallet. Sipping first, she then shared the liquid with the rimericks. Now we are ready. Take your place, Imu. The princess returned to the driver's thwart in the bows of the punt and took up the reins, wrapping the leather straps once about each well-calloused hand to keep a good grip. Her mind called out, My friends, let's go. The two powerful beasts submerged, thrust forward with their clawed flippers, and hauled the long, slim boat out of its hiding place and into the open lake. Tracing a long, curved path, swimming with all their prodigious strength, they turned south, heading straight through the fangs of Moon Juno toward the brink of the huge waterfall. Leaning on the stone rail, Prince Antar watched his knights and the men-at-arms disembark from the punts and begin to spread out along the skid road. He and the blue voice and the limping Sir Penipat had taken up a position in the loftiest structure of Tass Town, a lighthouse about fifty nails high on the western side of the small island settlement. The prince and the knights stripped to tunic and buskins because of the heat and surveyed the scene from the outer parapet of the lighthouse while the skinny blue voice was not only robed but hooded, seated upon a stool next to the great unlit lamp, while his far-seeing mind's eye followed the deployment of the forces on shore. I wouldn't like to live here, Penipat said. Why not, Penny? Antar was idly scanning the roofs below, from which only a few threads of smoke arose. Lord Zontel had told him that most of the population, save for the log raft sailors, abandoned Tass Town during the rainy seasons. The war had simply started the exodus sooner. Too noisy, the big man stated. The waterfall hurts my teeth. Your teeth? Can't you feel it? A sound that's so deep it's hardly a noise at all. It comes up through the rock and makes the whole lighthouse shake and my body, too, and hurts my teeth. Antar began to laugh, and then he suddenly cut short, having caught a glimpse of something out on the water. My God, he breathed. Penny, will you look out there? Do you see what I see? A little boat, Penipat affirmed. The big man's expression was sweetly quizzical. It shouldn't be going beyond those rocks. The traitor said there's a strong current out there that'll take you over the falls. Blue, roared the prince. Get out here, quickly! The blue voice rose with evident reluctance, only to be dragged unceremoniously to the lighthouse rail by Antar, who pointed out the vagrant punt. That boat! Who's in it? Antar demanded. The blue voice pursed his lips. You roused me from my trance, prince. That's a most dangerous thing to do. Antar's hand, which was very strong, tightened on the scrawny blue-clad bicep. The boat, you warm scat! Quickly! The clairvoyant's eye sockets were abruptly black and empty. His thin lips trembled. My lord, I... I can't tell who rides within. Anagil, the prince cried. It's the princess! The punt, moving with astonishing speed, was now well beyond the fangs. There were two small figures in it, one far forward and stiffly upright, the other huddled amidships. A light breeze had sprung up, wafting away the mist that curtained the lip of the cataract. It could now be seen clearly from the lighthouse, a nearly straight line of blue-black, fringed at the fatal edge with white. Beyond it was a void of sky, and distant haze-shrouded trees. As Antar watched, the racing punt seemed for a moment to be preceded by two dark forms arching through the spume at the brink. Then the slender vessel hovered for an instant, its front half in thin air, its stern still supported by water, before it tilted and slid out of sight. Twenty-five. The Lammergeier flew tirelessly over the peaks and ice fields of the high Ohogans, so high that Harimus found the clear, thin air difficult to breathe. 
She became drowsy not long after the huge bird left Mova's, and was content to snuggle down within her thick fur cloak, sheltered deep in the feathered hollow between the Lammergeier's wings, and sleep. She was unaware of their passage over Mount Rotolo and the slow approach to towering Mount Gidris, which was enshrouded in thick clouds. The Lammergeier breasted strong winds for hour after hour, but by nightfall it still had not reached its goal. Haramis woke when it began to descend through thickly falling snow. As the Visby had taught her, she first brought to mind a clear picture of the creature's striking black and white crested visage, with the glittering eyes like polished jet, and a great beak edged with sharp teeth. Then her mind spoke its name. Hiloro! I hear, Haramis. She heard its reply in a place in her mind that Majira had patiently taught her to use. Haramis had found learning the speech without words a strange experience. Her first attempts had been complete failures. Then, almost by accident, she had managed to bespeak Majira. After several more semi-accidental successes, she had worked out what she was doing. And after that, the process was simple, almost automatic. One simply rendered this part of the mind open after first calling out mentally to the desired person. After Haramis had learned to bespeak reliably, Majira introduced her to the Lammergeier who would become both mount and companion in the next stage of her quest. The great bird had glided down and landed on the slate roof at Majira's summoning. Its wingspan was as wide as the house, and its gigantic black-taloned feet could have seized a full-grown man in armor with the ease of a night caroler snatching a tree vart. But for all its ferocious demeanor, the colossal flyer had greeted Majira with great-hearted affection. I tell you now one of the great secrets of the mountain folk, Majira had said to the princess, stroking the lowered head of the bird. You know that we were made for lands all girt about with ice and snow, but so were these great creatures. When the vanished ones refashioned the abominable flesh of the foundation stock into the first folk, they engendered at the same time the four, which you humans call Lammergeiers, from a lesser sort of bird. Folk and a four were thus newborn upon the world together, since the vanished ones knew we Visby would need helpers in order to move about over a world locked fast in ice. Our towns are few and widely separated, but with the help of our great friends, we journey over the long distances in safety, as you shall, in fulfilling your quest. The Lammergeier, landing with confidence in spite of the blowing snow, pecked with its great beak at the white frozen cliff face, whereupon the ice cracked and revealed a dark opening. Is this the place where my three-winged circle is hidden? Haramis asked. No, this is shelter for the night. We both need food and rest, and you will be safe here while I hunt. I shall return soon. Hiluro lofted back into the sky. Haramis drew out her black trillium amulet from her bodice. It glowed like a lantern, casting light ahead as she stepped over broken bits of ice into the cavern. It was a huge place, mostly dry, although the wind swept flurries of snow in after her. Several tumbled blocks of dark stone, all shot through with thick veins of white quartz, mingled with another material, reflected back the amulet's warm glow. Haramis realized she was looking at a load of gold. The princess left her pack and wandered for some time by the light of her amulet, finding outcroppings of gold everywhere and sometimes great nuggets lying on the floor. But it was far at the back of the cavern that she made her most interesting discovery. Within a rough alcove, the amulet's golden light had flickered on something very dark and shiny. And when she approached, she found a wall of perfectly smooth black ice in which she saw herself holding the glowing amulet an ice mirror. And was it not some such thing that the sorcerer or Agastus was rumored to use for scrying? She asked the question of her image within the dark ice, a tall and beautiful young woman whose pale face, framed in black hair, was haloed in the white fur of her mantle's hood. The glowing amulet at her throat had a reflective radiance that drew back her eyes whenever she would look away. She stared at the amulet's golden glow, and it seemed that her vision swam, and the image of herself became that of another, a man, attired in strange robes and crowned with a headpiece like a great silver star. 
He smiled at her and held out his hand, offering to show her his secrets, to share his knowledge, his magic. Aramis. Orocastus, she whispered, petrified with sudden recognition. He seemed to reach out to her, through the mirror of black ice. Aramis. The mental call was inhuman, familiar, urgent. Hiluro. Aramis, come back. Now. She saw her own face again reflected in the sheet of ice. Chilled to the bone, she turned and hurried back to reassure Hiluro, whose calling of her name by the speech without words still resounded in her head, driving away all other thoughts. 26. Jagan made no attempt to start a fire. Instead, he stood with his hands hanging by his side. He might have been one who had come to the end of a trail to find nothing but a wall over which there was no climbing. Katie watched him uneasily. This was a Jagan she had never seen before. She was about to ask him what was the matter when he turned quickly and clawed and fought his way up to her, to the top of that bowl-like opening. Slowly, he paced around the broad rim, but he did not look down at the path his feet followed. Instead, his head was up, turning slowly from side to side, his tense body expressing the need to hear, to see, to know. When he completed the circle, he came back to her, and she asked, What is it, Jagan? For a moment, she thought he would not answer. Then he raised his head to face her squarely. Farseer, for us all, there are hidden things. This is a strange land, as much so to me as to you. But I think we come now to an even stranger one. There is something to be feared, she demanded. I do not know. Now he drew his bag to him and rummaged quickly in it, bringing out food, some dry cakes and two small smoked fish, so brittle that they broke when touched. Again Katie wondered over the lack of fire, but some caution kept her from asking. Though night in this waterlogged country was apt to be dank, she did not feel that chill now. Rather it was as if the bowl still held about them a little of the sun's heat. The full burden of the day settled upon her. Although thought about the larvae and those poisonous balls they had passed flitted through the sudden descent of fatigue, she could not raise energy to suggest guard duty. The sensation of safety which had closed about her when she had first climbed up here was like a warm robe promising sleep without fear. Did she sleep, or did she wake? She could not have truthfully sworn to either. As the night darkened and drifts of mist floated over their heads from one side of the bowl to the other, she lay quietly. Their root guide she had set up by her head, but in drift of soil, black tip up. There was no flame from that. However, it was not completely dark, after all. She was first aware of a shimmer which she could catch only in the corners of her eyes. If she shifted quickly to view it, it disappeared, or seemed to move enough out of sight to remain only a suggestion. So it went for a time. Then those shimmers rooted themselves. They were at least as tall as Jagan, thin pillars in which swirled faint colors, so pallid that one hue might hardly be distinguished from another. At first they only stood still, not in any pattern Cadia could discern. Then they wavered and floated free. She could not understand why they moved so, but she was sure they were weaving an intricate pattern whereof she and Jagan were the heart yet no fear stirred in her. Finally, she did not see the pillars any more, except as a whirling mist which spun slowly about the opposite slope of the bowl. The mist glowed, and within it she saw a beautiful city, the same city she had dreamt of before reaching Noth. It seemed also that she had once known that city and found happiness and contentment there, and she wanted nothing more than to go seeking it. Somewhere there was singing, a music different from any that a Ruendian bard could draw from a harp, raising in Cadia a new longing, and then the vision disappeared. Cadia sat up, suddenly chilled, her hands going to her amulet. That feeling of being guarded and comforted was gone. Instead, she had a sudden, vivid mental glimpse of the diseased land through which they had come to this place. And then she realized that it was early morning. There was movement nearby. 
Jagin stood ready for the trail, beckoning to her, that strange, bleak look still on his face. Cadia arose, took up the route, shouldered her bag, and prepared to set off once again. The two wayfarers looked down and away from the great mound which enclosed the bowl. Swamp mist swirled about, and there seemed to be no sign of a rising sun to burn it away. In Cadia's hand, the trillium root came to life, slipped easily through her fingers, and started to glide downhill on the slope opposite that which they had yesterday climbed. We go. Jagin's voice held as little expression as his face, and he said nothing of food. Rather pointed on toward more of the tall thorn ferns and the bulbous horrors which had taken root among them. They trudged on, slowing as they wove a zigzag path to avoid the poisonous balls. After a time, they came to an open space carpeted with a furry yellow scum. There were no trees here, only a series of columnar projections, almost like miniature clay towers leading out into what looked like a cleared and leveled field stretching ahead of them. But Jagan warned her that it was Quickmire, a single misstep here, and one would be swallowed forever. Jagan delved into his hunter's bag and drew out a packet. Freed of its ties, it proved to be four dish-like ovals. Once released from their fastenings, the ovals opened, took on thickness in the humid air, and became boat-shaped leaves curling up about their outer edges. Skimmers, the hunters called them. Katie had used these before, always cautiously, and only when she was with Jagan. Seating herself on a rounded outcrop, she made fast the lashings of the skimmers around her ankles. She stamped to test the tightness of the cording before she started carefully after Jagan, making sure she followed his path. The root guide had already slipped out ahead of him upon that treacherous ground. Under her feet, Cadia was aware of the give in the surface, and their pace was now swift. Always flanking them were the lumpy columns, taller than either she or Jagan. The mist swirled so thickly now that she caught only a very hazy glimpse of the shore of the thorny hell from which they had set out. Sometimes even the stubby pillars were nearly blotted out. As they went on, she became aware that the footing became steadily more secure. Then suddenly a large veil of mist hovered as if it had been caught on something, and then freed itself and drifted away. The last of the pillars was revealed. Only it was not a pillar. Chunks of mud, as hard as if baked, had scaled away, and what stood there was unmistakably a figure, though certainly no monstrous one. It had been made to represent no oddling. The proportions were as human as her own, although the image was masculine. Save for an elaborate crown helm and three scarves or belts, the statue wore no clothing, the belts were drawn one over each shoulder, crossing on the breast and ending in a wide waist belt latched together. The body itself was of an ivory shade and possessed a sheen as if highly polished. Scarves and belt were covered by small flakes or scales, green, gold, blue, shaded from the palest to the darkest in each hue. It was what was gripped in the image's outstretched hands which drew and held their eyes. Cadia had seen great savagery in the days just past, but the severed head that the figure held was so foreign to the feeling that the rest of the statue aroused that it startled and sickened her. For that was the head of no Skritek, nor Oddling. In spite of the fact that it was utterly hairless and the rounded skull bulged overmuch, it might have been the head of a man of her own kind. She moved a little away the better to see the face of the statue, expecting somehow to witness there a fierce countenance, such as the Labernaki had worn when they dabbled in horrors at the citadel. But the face overshadowed by the elaborate helm was calm, full of strength and serenity. The image might have been fashioned as a dire warning, or a monument to some victory, but the longer Cadia looked at those eyes, which stared to her right as the head was slightly turned, the more she was sure that what she saw signified some ancient justice, intended to stand as a warning for all time. The eyes themselves were not blank carving. Instead, the hollows were inset with dark stones, 
and in each, even as in the heart of the black trillium flower, there was a hint of gold. The Sindona! Jagan sprang back a little from the statue. This is the forbidden way. He wore an expression of awe which held more than a tinge of fear. Katie's eyes did not leave those of the figure. Who? Jagan did not answer her. Instead, he stooped and caught up one of the shards of baked mud which had plainly been scraped from the figure. This was done, not long ago, but not by the Skritek. They would not lay claw to this. Then who? Please, what does this statue represent? Katie raised her voice. Jagan blinked. Sentinels of the Vanished Ones. They who could command the earth and water. His words trailed off as he caught Katie's arm. Look. Resting on a nearby chunk of the hard mud lay the trillium root. Its small candle was aflame, pointing not in the direction they had been traveling, but that in which the figure was looking. Jagan sank the butt of his spear into the yellow muck. It penetrated for about a finger's length, and then met resistance, though the surface looked no different from the morass they had traversed so carefully. Katie watched as the hunter moved on, tapping the end of the spear before him. The root wavered back and forth, as if it wanted to take the path Jagan followed, but would not leave Katia behind. Magic! Oh, magic! Her old impatience flared, but so far the guide had not played them false. Though she inwardly shrank, the princess strode behind the hunter in this new direction. The skimmer leaves sank a fraction under her weight, but no more, and the root raced ahead, as might a hound unleashed. At length, the yellow morass was broken here and there by what might once have been pavement. They came through the last of the thinning mist to a place covered with clean, coarse turf, such as grew in the polders to the northeast. There was a straggle of other vegetation, and Katia gained smarting thorn scratches as she took the trillium root into her hand. Her back and legs ached with a steady pain, for she had unconsciously tensed her body through all their journey over the morass. Now she stumbled twice and then went to her knees. Jagan was beside her at once, water bottle in hand. Katia gulped gratefully and then sank down to rest among the tussocks of grass. In less than a minute, she was asleep. Light shining in her eyes awoke her, and she stared up at the open sky, bewildered. She had dreamt she was in her own chamber in the Lady's Tower of the Citadel, but there was no carven roof above her. She sat up and groaned at the stiffness in her back. Trees surrounded the turfed area where she lay. Their smooth trunks were greenish bronze, and their green-edged bluish leaves rustled at the tug of a breeze. She was alone, though Jagan's pack lay in sight. A blaybat bird perched on an arched stem of bramble, snatching at a bright red berry. It paid no attention as Katia got to her feet and stretched. The trillium root was planted a stem up, near where her head had lain, and it was quivering. Nah, nah, nah. That sound the girl recognized at once. The Nisimu were never loud or free of speech, but they sometimes voiced a croon of content. Jagan rounded a big bramble bush, carrying in one hand a vine from which hung some oval scarlet fruit, swollen near to the bursting point with ripeness. Katie nearly swallowed the first fruit whole, and had a second ready to eat before she was able to ask a question. Where are we? Jagan was carefully peeling more of his spoil, a long length of sweet cane. He shrugged, indicating that he did not know. The girl was so used to crediting him with all Meyer knowledge that she could not believe they were lost. He chewed a bit of cane core and then spit out the pith which had been drained of its sugary juice. We are beyond all trails I know, Farseer. I know only that there is stone under this. He thumped the turf with the end of the cane. And that, he nodded to the upstanding root guide, has brought us here. More ruins. Laying aside his piece of cane, Jagan carefully used his knife, levering up a patch of sod. Beneath was indeed a dark-stained stone surface. A roadway. That is what this is. 
he gestured ahead where there was an opening in the trees. A road made by the Sindona. Jagan looked away from her. Instead, he stared at the hole he had dug as if the uncovering had been a mistake. He spoke hesitatingly, with pauses between his words, as if the information came from him unwillingly. The Vanished Ones, and with them their sentinels, the Sindona, once ruled the water in the isles. We were of their making, fashioned by their minds and their hands. The dark powers arose, and there was death in the land. But before the Ancient Ones left, they called us forth and told us that we were free. Only certain oaths they asked of us. Jagan looked down at the knife in his hands, turning it over and over. The Sindona remained to watch over what was left by the Vanished Ones. There were certain things, and certain knowledge, which they could not take away with them, nor were they able to destroy it. This roadway, he waved to the rows of clay-covered sentinels, leads to one such guarded place. He dropped the Saudi had dug up back into its hole. King's daughter, your father had old companions who served him even unto death. Though we folk owe allegiance elsewhere, our oaths bind us as fast. But, Farseer, I have now broken that vow. Yonder, through those trees, lies the forbidden way. Last night I sent forth the great call. There was no answer. I could not link with any scout of the folk. We have come past the barrier set up for my own race. That goes. He pointed to the root with his knife. And you must follow. I do not know if I will be able to accompany you. I thought we were going to the Wizgu, but instead we are here. And someone uncovered the captain of the sentries. Lamaril, the great one, not even the Skritek would dare to front. No. I had no answer to my call. But yonder, again he waved the bared steel, and even under the faint sun it gave off an ominous glint. There was a fire in the night, off in those trees, along the forbidden way. Katie was startled. I slept. For the first time, Jagan looked less grim. Farseer. You slept part of a day, and all the night which followed. This is the second day. She frowned. You should have awakened me. Not so. What lies before us I do not know, save perhaps it may be greater peril than we have yet faced. Any hunter would choose fronting a Skritek over traveling the forbidden way. You need to face the future with all possible strength of mind and body. And so I let you sleep. This fire you saw. Jagan looked grim. The fires our people use are small. What I saw was great. To feed it must have been a task for many hands. Voltrix men? If so, they await where that, he gestured to the root, would lead us. The two of them walked on in silence, but it was clear that Jagan was becoming more and more agitated. Cadia was also unnerved. She was almost ready to snap the little guide in two, only she could not destroy it. She was ensnared by the Archimage's magic and her quest for the talisman, the mysterious three-lobed burning eye, and she could not gainsay it. Suddenly, Jagan gave a loud cry and reached for his hunter's bag. From it, he snatched a golden armlet inset with red stones. Only twice had Cadia seen such a thing before. First, when he had come to the Citadel to receive formal greeting from her father, and again at a sing-chant of his people when he had worn a similar thing on his upper arm. He must have obtained the sacred object at the Nisimu village. Now he turned it around in his hands, groaning as his fingers caressed its smooth surface. Then he grasped the armlet tightly, the straining muscles of his shoulders betraying the effort he made, his face a mask of dread. The armlet snapped. Jagan hurled the pieces from him. An eerie warbling sound issued from his lips. That, too, she had heard, always when one of his own clan had died and the raft bearing the body had been pulled away to the secret place of interment. Jagan, she ventured. His face had stiffened. 
Never had she viewed such coldness in his expression. Jagan is dead, he told her tonelessly. This one is no longer named. I am Oathbreaker, cast off of kin, one who cannot speak and to whom none will speak again. We go to break the forbidden silence. The Lady of Noth has the right to wring the life from us. When we follow her own guide, Cadia demanded hotly, did he hold her at fault when it was certainly none of her doing? Against her breast, the amulet heated. I am going on, she cried. But an instant later she stumbled and caught her balance with an effort. The feeling that flooded through her was so alien that she tried to scream and found she could not make a sound. For that single moment she had a sensation of such overwhelming fear that it shook her whole body. Fear of what? she demanded of herself. She caught at a nearby bush to steady herself. As ever, fear awoke rage in her. Dagger out, she turned around. Near her, Jagan lay on the turf which covered the ancient roadway. His thin fingers clawed feebly at his chest, and he was breathing in short, fluttering gasps. Jagan! Katie went to her knees beside him. His mouth opened, and a trickle of moisture oozed from one corner. Back! His voice was only a thread of sound. He threw out his arms in a frantic gesture and strove to pull himself upright. Take me back. Katie sheathed her dagger and took him by the shoulders. Exerting her full strength, she pulled him a full fifty ells along the turf, back from that ancient roadway which the root guide urged her to follow. The root had halted, but it wavered as if beckoning her on. Her own fear was now gone as if a door had been shut. She caught at her amulet. It was blazing with color and warmth, but not as if it were giving forth a threat. Instead, it seemed to encourage her. Wind arose, coming at them through the trees. Jagan coughed and levered himself up to a sitting position. A barrier, the hunter wheezed. I cannot go that way. His head drooped forward. There was a blankness now on his face. He faced something which was beyond his power to fight, and he had no weapon left. Farseer. There was pain in his voice. It is forbidden. Only you can go on, alone. But I swear that if there is a way I may come to you, I shall discover it. I... Now it was her lips which had frozen. Jakin, take care. His hand went up in a gesture of reassurance and encouragement. Then he turned and crept away, and after a time got to his feet and waved to her. She guessed that he would indeed range wide to discover whether there was a way past that which held them apart. There was movement in the grass. The root was switching back and forth as if expressing exasperation, beckoning her on to action. She shouldered Jagan's bag, and unwillingly and with a lagging step, she followed her root guide forward into the trees. There was a nauseating whiff of something in the wind which now blew steadily at her, a stench which was neither like that of the Skritek nor the bog. Twice she looked back, hoping to catch sight of Jagan, but he was not to be seen. However, there was something ahead, a dull gleam at the foot of one of the trees. She stooped to pick up an arrow, well made, with a shaft and feathering the color of dried blood. She had seen such before, yes, and during the siege had helped to gather all which had not hit marks or shattered against walls to replenish the stocks of archers at the citadel. This arrow was not of the swamp, but of the intruders. How had it come here, and why did it lay so balanced, as if, like her root, it was a guide? She nearly threw it from her, and then thought more clearly. It took but a moment to replace it with a point set in the opposite direction. How had the labor Naki been able to pass the barrier which had defeated Jagan? Her amulet must have been the key for her, but Hamel's men, what did they carry except the steel they had already so foully bloodied? Was this more of Oregastus's dark magic? Within a couple of strides, she came upon the impression of a boot in a wet patch of earth. And beyond that, 
Katia fought down the rise of bile in her throat as she saw a dead Skritek lying to one side, as if the body had been kicked out of the way. The creature bore no wound that she could see, and there was no puddling of blood. She turned determinedly away and continued on, counting steps under her breath, trying very hard to keep her attention alert to all which lay about her. Then a new noxious odor fouled the air. She looked to the right. An oddling, its thick body pelt, revealing it to be Wizgu, was bound to a tree. This time there was evidence of how death had come, and it had not been easy. Not far beyond the first Wizgu victim, there was further disturbance of the ground, and the smell of fire was strong. Bushes were torn from the ground, and the turf was scuffed up. There she found another tortured oddling. She could not make herself look closely, until there came a thin cry, and she was forced to go to the Wizgu. A crooked hand strove to rise, and I looked at her from a broken face. Once more, Katia called upon the brace of anger. Who did this thing? She hesitated. How could she ease such terrible hurts? She had nothing. The hand moved. It would seem that the wounded mouth could no longer shape words. The Wizgu made a greater effort, a small gesture toward her knife. At last she was able to guess the nature of his plea. Katie's heart raced. She had always been fascinated by weapons, and had once or twice indulged in sword play when she could get the master at arms into a good mood. Jagan had also taught her oddling knife tricks, but this she was not prepared for. Once more that faint cry, the small gesture. Katia set her mouth firmly and took her dagger hilt in both hands. Something else came to mind. Words she had heard Jagan say when he had found a strayed froniel so entrapped in a suck vice it could not be freed. Go safely beyond. She brought down her blade and felt it enter living flesh. Then she swallowed and swallowed again. Getting to her feet, the girl stumbled on, wanting to be away, free. Yet when she glanced down, she saw the root guide still sliding ahead. That she went into danger, she could guess and her preparation for it was as woefully small as had been those of the citadel garrison when the invaders had stormed in upon them. She became aware of mist gathering between the trees ahead, edging out now and then into a tongue of fog. The root bore steadily onward. She was startled when the tip of the trillium root lifted, blazed green, and then spun to the left, now pointing between two of the largest trees she had yet come upon. It was a thin, high-pitched whistle. Cadia instinctively leaped to one side as something struck the trunk of the tree just ahead of her. A spiral of thick and oily smoke arose, and she threw herself belly down and thrust her way, in spite of the pain, into the shelter of a great bramble bush. Again came the whistling cry, followed by what might have been a muffled answer. Cadia was caught face down on the ground by Jagan's bag, which had snagged on a bramble. Aroused to a frenzy, she fought to free herself. Smoke blew into her face, and she choked and then coughed without relief. But that deep-lunged coughing saved her. The brambles gave away as she struggled, and she fell forward into what seemed like a dark hole. Her outflung hand scraped against stone, not bark or branches. As the hunting cry sounded for the third time behind her, she wormed forward into the dark, in her panic, one part of her thought she might be pushing into a trap, yet she continued to crawl ahead. Any moment she expected her pursuers to catch up, to seize her by the ankles and pull her out of this hole as a suck brie could be jerked from its shell by a skilled hand. Somehow she managed to keep going until her outreaching hands met only emptiness, and she plunged down and down. Water closed about her, and with it, light. But this was not the turbid, murky liquid of the swamp pools. It was crystal clear, except nearest her own body, where swirled the muck and soil she had picked up during her crawl. Though Jagan's bag pulled her down, she refused to rid herself of it. Rather, she kicked and fought her way to the surface. A gleam of green caught her eye. So she had not lost her guide. The root was swimming before her. There was a wall about this pool, over which she splashed and struggled into the air. She crept on hands and knees over a pavement of metallic blue mosaic. 
There was no growth of weed, nothing to sully the pool and the limpid water it held. Before her was a flight of stairs, on either side of which stood ranks of statues. She got to her feet. The utter silence of this new place struck her first. Once she had pulled herself out of the water and her own splashing ceased, the smooth surface of the pool was undisturbed. Katie ventured to look up the flight of stairs. There was not a hint of greenery to be seen, only the rows of statues that Jagan had named Sindona. The light which appeared to pour into this place struck an eye-tormenting glitter from the ornamentation on the motionless figures. Not all the Sindona who seemed to regard her so calmly were male, yet they were clad alike, and there was about them such a feeling of life that she would not have been surprised had they moved and spoke, perhaps to refuse her entrance, perhaps to bid her welcome. She looked down at her bruised and scratched body, the tattered Nisimu garments which had not survived too well her battle with the wilderness. Strangely, she felt renewed, stronger. She wanted to press on to see this place, of which no legend or traveler's tale had ever spoken. At the top of the stairway, Katie paused before one of the figures. It was taller than she, perhaps life-size for the race whose hands had modeled it. She looked up into the face beneath the shadow of the helm. Who are you? Her words sounded abrupt, too demanding for this place of silence and beauty. And how could she expect any answer from the silent sentinel? Of course there could be no answer. Nevertheless, she was aware of an odd sound, as if a deadening curtain had been pulled aside. There came a crystal tone, as if small bells chimed. Birds twittered, and a breeze wove a breath of scent about her, which banished the last of that choking horror which had driven her into cover. She looked further. Here was another flight of stairs, even wider, but without the guardian figures, and it led up and out into such a stretch of parkland that no one born in the swamps encircling Rwanda might have imagined. It was a place of rich and paradoxical growth. Unfamiliar kinds of ripe fruit hung beside the very blossoms from which they developed. Above was an azure sky. So enchanted did the garden seem, so enwrapped in magic, that Cadia dared not venture into it. On the top step of the second stairway lay the root guide, the green halo at its point sparkling as if it had been fashioned from an emerald. Cadia blinked, and blinked again. She was no longer alone. The one coming across the garden to meet her was plainly one of the statue people, even though helm and military belts had been exchanged for a gauzy robe. Woman? Truly? Cadia could not have said. But she knew that here was one to whom even the Archimage would make obeisance. Princess Cadia sank to her knees. Daughter of the threefold, what have your people done that the great balance of the world no longer holds firm, that death and pain have come into this? the last stronghold. Cadia could not believe that she was actually being accused. It was only that this being wanted the truth. Slowly, Cadia arose. Firstly, she strove to give her words the same easiness that the others held. I am the daughter of King Crane of Rwenda, those of Labernock, under Voltric, using treachery and force of arms, and above all, the talents of an evil sorcerer have laid waste my country. By the aid of the Nisimu hunter Jagan, I escaped from the citadel at its fall. Then I went to the Archimage, who rules at Noth, and this was given to me. She picked up the root and held it out. On me, she set also a solemn task, that I must search for a certain talisman. It has been foretold that only through a woman of our house may justice be wrought for Ruenda. The Archimage named me and my sisters Petals of the Living Trillium. There are three of us, although I am not sure now that the others still live. And this small trillium root has led me here. The Archimage of Noth, the robed one, said slowly. It has been long years since she sent one here to the place of knowledge. But if she does, we can well believe that there are shadows abroad in the land. By the ancient ways, life must here be so... The stranger held out one hand horizontally and set the other under it vertically. 
Dealing with the dark powers upsets the balance. Once before this happened, and there was a mighty battle and a rending of the earth. Dry land became water, water became land, and the conquering ice formed a shroud over all. Katie asked, how did those of blood find the road to this place and pass the barrier which holds back the Nisimu? King's daughter, once the smallest opening is made in a wall, it may spread to a tumble of stone. This sorcerer you have spoken of as your enemy reaches high and has learned much. He has given certain protection to his followers, which have proven keys for the unlocking of our ancient gates. King's daughter, the woman pointed to the root, still in Cadia's hand. Finish out your journey here. If the Archimage of Noth has chosen you, then you will indeed go into battle. Whether you stand alone or not, that will also come from your own actions. There is no safety here in the place of knowledge. Not from what has come. For have I not been summoned by the threat of the dark powers? Her head went up as if she listened. So. They do not have quite as much power as they think. The secret way which led you here is closed, and they must now cast back and forth blindly with their skritek. The old protection holds after all. What do they seek? That which they deem treasure, King's daughter. But what the troops of Labernock and the skritek are greedy for is not what moves their master. He seeks what is forbidden, and his followers are greatly wearied. They would return to the citadel without that which would appease him. And what about the talisman that I seek? Cadia cried. She dropped the trillium root, and it did not move. Its color had faded. Where is the three-lobed burning eye that the Archimage commanded me to find? Look within you, King's daughter. Open wide your heart and mind. Cadia stared. I have no magical talisman. I have no army. I have not even a sword. All these exist, King's daughter. There was a chill in that answer. Look within yourself, and you shall see. And she was gone. Cadia sank down onto her knees. Nothing in that wondrous garden charmed her now. She was spent, lost. Only the shriveled-looking root of the black trillium was left to her. Magic! She pounded both fists against the pavement until the pain of her bruised flesh broke through the consuming rage. Look within her! Look within her! Within was fury. Leaning forward, she snatched up the stem which had mocked her and led her to this useless place and strove to shred it between her fingers. But it resisted. One of three. Out of nowhere came the phrase which rang in her head. Cadia looked up quickly. Had that sentinel woman returned? No, only the silly garden lay before her, and the worthless root guide. With all her force, the girl threw the root from her. It flew through the air with the precision of one of Jagan's darts, turning but once in flight so that it landed, root end down, upon a patch of open earth in front of her. There it stood upward, quivering a little. Cadia scrambled up, thinking to finally crush it. But she held back. Before her eyes, it was growing thicker, taller, wider. Wondering, Cadia crouched before it, watching. Two smaller stems sprouted from near the top and straightened into bars. Below them, the stem enlarged even more, forming a thick, dark cylinder. At the very tip, it budded, or so it seemed, for there three spheres grew, closely conjoined. Katie watched, amazed, hardly daring to believe what she now saw. There was movement in each of those spheres, a splitting of their black covering. What was revealed were three eyes. One was an eye of the folk, yellow-green, one was gleaming brown, and Katie had only to look into a mirror to see its like in her own head. The third was silvery blue, with its pupil enormously wide, and in the depths 
a spark of golden fire. Her amulet burned at her breast. Before she could put a hand to it, the trillium amber sprang up as though it were a thing alive, and the golden chain about her neck broke, and the amulet flew toward the three-lobed eye and became fixed at the place of the sphere's juncture. Even as those three eyes had opened, so they closed again, leaving three featureless black globes behind. The girl took hold of the stem just below their swell and above the outthrust leaves. Then, with a certainty that this is what must be done, she pulled. What she drew forth from the earth was not the root end of the broken plant, but a gleaming sword, and one whose hilt fitted so well into her hand that it might have been forged for her alone. Cadia fingered the three spheres on the pommel. The three-lobed burning eye. She was overcome with delight. But then she noted that the bright weapon was dulled at the edges and lacking a point. Lords of the air, what manner of sword is this? How can I use such a thing against my enemies? A soft voice, hardly more than a breath in her ear, said, Learn. 27. What are you doing? Anna Jo shrieked to the racing Rimericks. We cannot go this way. We will be killed. But the animals made no reply and only swam faster, so that the boat fairly tore through the water, and it was all the princess could do to brace her feet against the bow wood and hang on to the reins. Her mind refused to accept that these animal friends, these loyal creatures who had brought her so far, were now pulling the punt with her and Imu in it straight toward the brink of Tass Falls. Anagel saw the drop-off coming closer and closer. She was incapable of uttering a sound now, unable to form one single coherent thought that she might have flung at the minds of the Rimericks to turn them aside from their suicidal folly. Even the Trillium amulet was out of reach, since the reins wound around her hands were so taut that she feared her arms might be yanked from their sockets. She thought not at all of Imu, so convinced was she that her own death was approaching. The sound of the waterfall grew to a roar. Airborne droplets of water thrown up by the cascade soaked her clothing and her hair. Her eyes were locked on the approaching rim, where the flowing water changed from the near black of the deep lake into a glorious medley of blue, aquamarine, green, and finally white. As the punt finally neared the brink, it slowed abruptly. Anagel unwound the reins from her hands, threw them down, and gripped the gunnels. She gasped as two great dark bodies leapt up, throwing a shower of diamond-bright spray, and then plunged out of sight. The bow of the punt where she sat thrust out into mid-air. For an instant she was able to look down, beyond the tumult of whiteness that was the face of the cascade, and see a great azure pool with tiny buildings on the left-hand shore. From the pool flowed a wide, many-channeled watercourse that shone like a silver braid in the high sunlight, winding away through the dark green expanse of the Tassileo forest until it was lost in purple haze. She saw this picture with her keen eyes, and her mind seemed to hear Imu and the two Rimericks say, Trust! And then the punt tipped forward and there was flying spray all around her, and a hundred circular rainbows, and she began to fall through a terrible crashing white world that soon faded into blank nothingness. In the new dream, her mother, Queen Calantha, was walking swiftly along a path in an unfamiliar landscape that Anagel somehow recognized as a dryland forest, wearing her coronation robes and the awesome crown of state. Anagel was a long distance behind, running to catch up with the queen, crying out for her mother to wait. But Calantha could not hear. There was nothing else to do but run faster, and Anagel did this with her heart thudding in her breast and her lungs burning and her legs hurting so badly that she would have cried out at each step except for lack of breath. She should have given up, thrown herself to the ground in despair, and let the queen hurry away. But instead, she forced herself to go on. And then the miracle. The queen stopped and turned and waited, smiling, while the girl staggered up with the last of her strength and collapsed into her mother's arms, weeping with happiness. Dear little daughter, Calantha said, I was so afraid you wouldn't come either. Your sisters have gone on other roads, you know. But all will be well now, just as soon as we get you ready. 
Then, amazingly, the dream queen led Anagel to a nearby brook, opened a velvet pouch, and took out soap and a soft cloth and an ivory comb. We must clean you up, Calantha said, and dress your hair, and find you rich robes to wear so your subjects will recognize you. The washcloth rubbed away at the dirt on Anagel's face, rubbed harder and harder until the flesh stung and the princess cried out, and woke up. She was lying on soft ground, heavily carpeted with moss, near a river bank. A tiny creature with striped yellow fur, a pointed face, and big black eyes was licking her cheek with its rough tongue. When she uttered a cry of surprise, the little thing squeaked in alarm and scuttled away into the dense undergrowth. An unfamiliar white bird was singing on the lowest branch of the tree she lay under, its complex song threading like a bright ribbon through the sound of distant thunder. The river, a few ells away, had numerous small channels flowing and intermingling on either side of a broad, twisting mainstream, and there were mudflats and low-lying islands everywhere. I'm alive. The realization came to her slowly, and she moved each arm and leg in turn, and her fingers, and then slowly sat up. Her woven grass garment was in tatters, as was the worn linen shift beneath. Her feet were still shod in the discerner's stout leather sandals, but her buskins were mostly torn to shreds. She still had her belt with its wallet attached, and the trillium amulet hung about her neck. Her skin was caked with mud, but quite dry, which meant that she must have been lying on the bank for some time. She had no memory of how she had got there. Walking carefully over decaying driftwood, she went down to the riverside. From the water's edge, she had a clear view upstream. Along the entire northern horizon was a high green rampart, rearing up out of the forest and cloven in two by a silvery swatch, the waterfall. It looked like it was at least a league away. The great blue pool at its base was not visible, nor were the buildings she had glimpsed momentarily before plunging over the brink. There was only the broad, shallow river, its flow dissected into scores of braided channels, and the dense forest on either bank, which had vivid blue-green foliage very different in hue and texture from the jungle woodlands of the mazy mire. Even the smell was different, sharper, more resinous, with occasional whiffs of unfamiliar flower fragrance. I'm alive, she said wonderingly. Then she flung out her scratched and mud-smeared bare arms and cried, Alive! In that same instant, guilt smote her. Imu! Where was Imu? And her two loyal Rimerick friends. She peered up and down the river bank, but saw only long-legged vermilion birds with spear-like beaks, dabbling in the shallows. For a moment, panic threatened to overwhelm her. She was alive, yes, but all alone in the Tassileo forest with no notion of what to do next. Should she call out, what if the Labernaki searchers had followed her and were lurking somewhere, listening? There was no place she could go, no path along the bank, only the small clearing with its decaying driftwood, surrounded by dense shrubbery, and further inland, the massive trunks of soaring trees. Were Imu and the animals dead? A terrible thought struck her. She recalled Imu's strange, almost resigned attitude as she repacked their lunch things back on the lake. Imu had tied the packs to the thwart. She had never done that before. Had she known what awful escape route the Rimericks would take? Did she stay with me out of love? Anagel asked herself in a whisper, hoping that I would survive the plunge, since I had been given Rimerick's strength by the Mighton, but knowing that she would surely die? She felt her heart contract. Oh, Imu, dear old friend! but she mustn't start blubbering uselessly. It was time to get on with it. Why not take some of the sacred drink to build up strength, then try again to summon the Rimericks? She found a moss-covered rock in the shade, opened her wallet, and took out the scarlet gourd with its net covering. Removing the stopper and lifting it to her lips, she closed her eyes and uttered an unspoken prayer. Then her mind called, Friends! There was a sudden splash, she opened her eyes and saw two sleek heads out in the main river channel, a stone's throw away. Rising, she waited for them to haul themselves over the shoals and rivulets, their glossy pelts getting more muddy with each awkward shove of their flippers. Finally, the pair of rimericks reached her and rested in the shallows, 
regarding her solemnly with huge black eyes. Human friend, we have searched for your friend of the swamp folk. Imu, did you find her? No. We went a long way, looking, but the water that flows to the sea is wide and has many backwaters where your friend's body might have been washed. Anajo's eyes stung, and she pressed a knuckle to her lips to stifle a cry. Her body! You do not think she survived the falls? We searched. We did not find her. Now it is time to go on. Your human enemies are coming down the great vine that takes trees to the sky. They will catch you if we do not take you away. Anagil understood at once that the Labernaki were descending, via the log lift, into the great Mutar Valley. For a moment she was tempted to command the Rimericks to resume their search for Imu, but in her mind's eye she seemed to see her good old oddling nurse shaking one taloned finger and scolding her. Was Imu's sacrifice going to be wasted? She had not died on a whim to comfort an ordinary girl. Her great gesture was intended to show her loving support for a princess on a quest who must not shrink from facing the worst tragedies or dangers. Imu had gone bravely to her death. It was up to Anagil to press on, now that she was so close to her talisman. Did you find the punt? she asked the Rimericks. Your boat is smashed into small pieces. We found your friend's pack, but not yours. We have taken a boat belonging to the forest folk. It is hidden over here. They waddled and wallowed downstream for a dozen ells before turning into the deeper water of a narrow creek. There was nothing for Anagil to do but wade into the river and follow them. The bottom mud was as soft and tenacious as glue, and she dared not stop moving lest she sink down and become trapped. Splashing along frantically, she caught up with the Rimericks as they nosed a fairly large, oddly made watercraft out of the creek mouth into waist-deep water. It was, perhaps, twice as long as the wooden punt had been, but narrower in the beam. Its white frame looked like it was made of soft bone or ivory wood, lashed together with dried sinews. The hull was translucent, hard but resilient, almost like dull, flexible glass. Pieces of this strange material were stitched together in nicely sewn patchwork, and the seam smeared with some shiny, waterproof resin. The craft rode high in the water, and must have been of negligible weight. Anagil flopped in. Imu's sodden pack lay on the bottom. There are no reins, friends, and you seem to have lost your harnesses. How am I going to drive? They grinned at her. This boat need not be pulled. It floats as easily as a dry seed pod. We will swim along on either side, pushing, and you shall tell us which way to go. The princess settled herself and opened her belt wallet. From it she took the unwilted leaf of the black trillium. For the first time she noticed that the upper portions of the golden vein, those representing the part of her journey already completed, were beginning to fade to brown. Below a large tan spot that represented Lake Wum, the golden vein twisted and turned over a distance about as long as Anagil's little finger, before entering the very short, sharply bent stem. There is some distance to go yet, she told the animals, but it seems to be entirely on the great Mutar River. I suppose we must simply travel on as fast as we can, keeping ahead of the enemy soldiers, until I receive some magical sign. Do you wish us to take you to the forest folk of the river? Why, Anagil hesitated. I never thought of that. Perhaps you had better. Those would be the Wivilo, I suppose. Do they have villages? There is one place only where they live. We will take you there. Very well, said the princess. Growling and woofing with the effort of moving out of their element, the Rimericks nudged and shoved the boat over one mud flat after another, sliding it along through subsidiary streamlets whenever they could, until it finally reached the main channel. There the big creatures rolled about in the dark, clean water for a few minutes, in evident relief, before settling in on either side and beginning the journey downriver. Without any urging from Anagil, they propelled the craft rapidly along. She guessed that it must be late afternoon. Opening Imu's drenched pack, the girl laid out her nurse's sleep sack and a few pieces of extra clothing to dry. Fortunately, Anagil was a small person, so she would be able to use the things. 
there was a soft, wide-brimmed grass hat, a little leather rain cloak, and an extra pair of buskins to wear under her sandals. The supply of trail ration roots was now running very low, and Anagel carefully set out the remaining ones to re-dry in the hot sun. The fruit leather had been eaten up long ago, and they had been living mostly upon wild fruit and nuts, augmented with a shared prey of the rimericks. She would have to be very careful about sampling unknown plant food. So many of the most tempting-looking things had been designated deadly poison by Imu. Thanks be to the Lords of the Air and Imu's Iron Shell Fire-Making Kit, which would be serviceable again once the damp tinder dried out, she would be able to broil her fish instead of eating them raw. The rest of Anagel's treasury consisted of her own small knife and the other items in her wallet, a comb, a handkerchief that she rinsed out each day, a small cup, and a sliver of soap. My riches, my royal robes, and my sumptuous foods, she declared, surveying the poor collection of things laid out on the bottom of the boat. And two faithful retainers to stand by me. What more could any princess ask? Sighing, she found a clear space in the bottom of the boat and lay down with a hat shading her face. My friends, I think I am going to sleep. They said, it is a good thing for you to do. Freed from the chore of driving for the first time since they had left Noth, Anagel fell into a dreamless doze, too weary even to mourn Imu. She woke hours later, when the Rimericks beached them on a small narrow island where the grass grew in soft clean sand instead of mud. The evening was very warm, but the island was swept by a cool breeze that kept the stinging insects at bay. The bed of the great mutar had widened as they traveled downstream, and now was almost too wide to see across. The forest on both sides was nearly lost in the deepening haze. From far away came a trumpeting sound, the cry of some large animal. But Anagel was confident that her friends had chosen a safe place for her to spend the night. One small bruddock shrub grew on their island. She drowsily congratulated the Rimericks for having found it. They bared their fangs briefly and swam away to hunt. The princess ate a few of the sweet, juicy fruits, made a nest of the sleep sack beneath the traveler's friend, and burrowed into it. Once again, her sleep was without dreams. Prince Antar's force spent all of the next day searching the great pool at the foot of Tass Falls, but had no luck finding the bodies of Princess Anagel or her companion. The remains of her wooden punt were found washed up near the deserted sawmill, and the consensus among the knights was that no one could have survived the trip over the cascade. Their opinion counted for naught, however. The decision whether to call off the hunt rested with a sorcerer or a gastus. The blue voice would confer telepathically with his master on the morrow, when fresh intelligence would have been vouchsafed by the all-seeing ice mirror. The search party made camp at the pool's edge, knights, men-at-arms, and the flatboat crews who had been pressed into service for the body search. Sitting around their bonfires that evening, the sinister chorus of nocturnal hoots and roars emanating from the forest behind the mill ensured that no one strayed far. The Labernaki commoners were in a mood of suppressed cheerfulness. With the princess surely dead, they looked forward to returning to the civilized comforts of the citadel. Most of the knights felt disappointed, cheated of their chance for glory. It seemed unlikely that the force would go any further down the great mutar, searching for the mysterious talisman that the sorcerer had set his heart on. Contrary to expectations, only three Wavilo boats had been found at the lower landing, and there were no aborigines in evidence to serve as guides. The master trader Edzar feared that the forest oddlings had retreated to their large village called Let, where the labor knock invasion brought a halt to the timber trade. There was small hope they would come back upriver before the next dry season. Prince Antar sequestered himself in his pavilion that night, refusing even the kindly overtures of Sir Owanan and his other loyal friends. His grief at the apparent death of the princess was an open secret, the simple Sir Penipat having blabbed to all hearers how distraught Antar had been when the punt was swept over the falls. The following morning, the blue voice was alerted mentally by Oregastus and retreated to his own small tent for a long telepathic conference. 
Antar was left to cool his heels, meanwhile, and with Sir Owanin, took the opportunity to study more closely the water-powered mill and the lift mechanism that had transported them all down the escarpment. The elevating device is most cunningly made, the prince remarked, craning his neck for a better look at the woven steel hoist cables. All one need do is load a single giant log, or a batch of lumber, onto the platform. The huge counterweight and the system of pulleys ensure that the draft animals at the top are able to lift the heaviest load without a great exertion of energy. Ingenious, these Rwendians, Owanin said. Still, we have similar machines in the shipyards at Deraguilla, even if they be not so large. Antar said in a low voice, Large though it is, the lift can hardly handle the great flatboats that brought us down the lake, even if we could wrestle the things along the skid road. We could lower the punts, certainly, but they would be inadequate to transport our entire force and its necessary supplies down the great Mutar. Owanin nodded agreement. Effectively, our expedition is stalled. This is what I have instructed the Blue Voice to tell the sorcerer. I have no intention of leading a blind search into the Tassaleo for this magical talisman he covets so greedily yet I would not put it past him to press such an adventure upon us. I will depend upon you and Dodobolik to support me when I decline to take our force any further. This goes without saying, my prince. Antar's face was grave within the open visor of his blue enameled helm. I fear the sorcerer will use this expedition's failure to further diminish me in my royal father's eyes. The insidious spellmonger knew full well that I have no stomach for this harrying of helpless women, and there was also my breakdown at the lighthouse yesterday. Awanin was tactfully silent. The prince eyed his friend with an expression that was both sad and self-mocking. Do all of them know that I had fallen in love with her, Owen? I, my prince, but the better men think none the less of you for it. One cannot help the inclinations of the heart. And you have carried out King Voltrick's commands, meticulously. No true-spoken man can say that you shirked your duty. Or Agastus can, the prince retorted bitterly. He has always hated and envied me, convincing the king that I am too immature to grasp great matters of state. This damnable invasion, the monstrous cruelty with which we treated the vanquished Ruendians. All the sorcerer's doing. He has turned my father into his creature, playing upon his fears and encouraging his basest instincts. Again, Owanin forbore to speak. King Voltrick was not always a cruel man, the prince said. When I was a small boy and my dear stepmother Shonda yet lived, he was a noble crown prince, a loving husband and father, and a man of sanguine and kindly spirit. It was only after the coming of Oregastus that his soul became envenomed. Father had to wait too long for his throne, and the luckless Shonda was barren, and the sorcerer encouraged and abetted every wicked and extravagant ambition that stole into father's mind, even the contriving of Shonda's death. Owanin said gently, These sad matters are common knowledge, my prince, but your father brooks no criticism of Oregastus. And he is king. Yes, sighed Antar. Only sometimes, when I remember the awful scene when he ripped the regal diadem from the brow of the dying king Sporokar, and his terrible glee, anticipating the bloodshed that our invasion of Rwanda would occasion, I fear that the sorcerer has driven him mad. But to suggest this would be high treason, of course. Awanin's face was somber. You would not be alone in your belief. There were many in our army who thought the invasion of Rwanda unwise, but I fear these matters must worsen before they can be bettered. At that moment he spied a man running toward them and cautioned the prince to silence. It was Rinitar rushing up, his armor clanking and his face alight with a malicious grin. My prince, amazing news! The Lord Oragastus has determined that Princess Anagel yet lives. She is on her way down the great Mutar. 
You are commanded to follow her, but only with your body of knights and a servant for each. And here is the strangest part. The sorcerer no longer commands that the girl be hindered from her quest and killed. On the contrary, she is to be given free reign, and only after she has secured her magical talisman are we to seize her and put her to death. Antar stared at the knight, thunderstruck. She lifts, he whispered. So says the ice mirror. Rinitar's smirk was insolent. I had a feeling you'd be pleased at being given another chance at her. 28. The Lammergeier said to Haramus, There is the cave you seek. On this morning, the storm having blown away, the fresh whitened southern face of Mount Gidrus was so dazzling bright that Haramus was almost blinded. Even shading her eyes with her gloved hand, she could not see the place Hiluro pointed out. But the great bird spiraled down, 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 and what had been a featureless glare became a vast bowl just beneath the mountain's summit, from which a colossal glacier flowed. The river of ice poured over a steep precipice before beginning its gentler descent toward the Ruendian Basin, fracturing into a mass of titanic ice blocks that were partially buried in new snow. The cracks and chasms of the icefall glowed with a hundred varied shades of blue, but in the midst of the tumble shone an unexpected golden gleam. As the great bird flew closer, Haramis saw that this was an upthrust spire of rock, milky in color but flecked with gold. What had seemed a fragile needle viewed from afar soon became an outcropping some eighty ells high and five ells in width, apparently formed of white quartz with sparkling inclusions of precious metals. The glacier had so abraded it over the ages that it resembled a slender tower, making a valiant effort to remain above a chaotic frozen sea. Halfway up the spire was an opening, with a narrow rock shelf just below it. I can only hover while you alight, Hiluro told Haramus. The ledge is too narrow for me. The huge black and white bird descended. The mouth of the cave was twice the height of the princess, but seemed smaller because of the dangling icicles that fringed it like diamond fangs. Almost all of the small ledge was slippery ice, in which gold nuggets and chunks of white rock were embedded. Haramis touched her amulet, offered a wordless prayer, and clasped Hiluro's feathery neck. Her hands just met, and she locked her fingers tightly together. She hung blind, her fur cloak billowing and the toes of her boots pointing down, and she heard not only the shrill piping sound of air rushing through wing plumage, but also a thunderous growl, and along with it a deep, eerie ensemble of musical notes, as if some giant's fiddle were being bowed. Her feet touched a firm surface. She relaxed, sank slowly with hands still holding the bird's neck, then let go. Opening her eyes, she saw the huge form shooting skyward while she rested precariously on her knees at the entrance to her goal, a cave of glittering ice with its entrance gold-framed. Or so it seemed. Overcome with awe, Haramis looked about her. The rock spire in the midst of the glacier vibrated like a tuning fork to the constant scraping flow of the ice, which filled the air with an immense musical sound. How many thousands of years had the ice ground away at this hard, gold-veined quartz mass before diminishing it to its present slenderness? Seen from close by, the rock tower looked incredibly fragile. The cave's mouth, bordered with large amorphous lumps of gold, was partially barred by icicles that were beginning to melt in the brilliant sunlight. Haramis climbed to her feet, slipped cautiously through the dripping tusks of ice, and came into the interior chamber, whose walls and ceiling were streaked with flows of black ice. A pale glimmer behind the ice sheet at the back of the cave attracted her attention. She moved toward it, on realizing that the trillium amulet she wore was warm against her breast, as if it were calling to something. Was the glimmering object the talisman destined for her? She moved closer to the great dark mass of ice and to whatever it was that glowed beneath it. She still could not see it clearly, but her amulet continued to grow warmer against her skin. Might her talisman itself be trapped in the ice? If so, how could she get it out? 
She moved still closer to the mysterious gleam. Her trillium amber was now so hot that it was burning her breast. She pulled off her gloves, hooked a finger around the amulet's chain, and pulled it from under her tunic. The flower flashed as if it were a fire, and the amulet was so hot she could barely touch it. She slid the chain carefully over her head and held it so the amber dangled in front of her face. Instead of hanging at the end of the chain, however, the amulet pulled away from her, drawn to the glow in the wall. The blazing light from the embedded trillium turned an entire section of the wall bright gold. The glare was painful, filling her eyes with a large gold spot encircled by a bright blue corona. The amulet dragged her several steps closer to the wall. Now it gave off such extreme heat that Haramis turned her head away from it. Out of the corner of her eye, outside of the area where the light blinded her, she could see water flowing in a thin stream down the wall. The amulet was actually melting the ice. Suddenly there was a flash of silver amid the gold as something melted free and it slid to the floor. The amulet's glow faded and it cooled rapidly, falling back against her clothing. Haramus bent quickly to grasp whatever had been freed before it could refreeze into the puddle on the cave floor. Before she could focus her eyes on it, she felt its weight in her hand. She waited patiently for her vision to clear. Her eyes hurt, and she fought the impulse to rub them. But even through the pain, deep within her heart, a tremendous sense of rightness bloomed. For an instant, she understood the pattern of the world and her place in it. She knew all, had power over all, commanded all. She had become what she always knew she could be. But for a moment only, and then the transcendent feeling was gone. She stood in the ice cave, now lit only indirectly by the sunlight outside, and realized that she could see normally again. She held a wand made of silver metal, about half the length of her forearm. At one end was a small ring to accommodate the chain, and at the other a kind of hoop, much larger, that she could have passed both her closed fists through. At the circlet's top was a projection that she at first took to be a flower made of the same white metal, but when she looked more closely, she saw that what she had mistaken for petals were instead three small wings, upright. The three-winged circle. Her talisman. At last. Then you will know that the final struggle for Ruenda and for your own soul is at hand. The words of the Archimage seemed to echo in the gold and crystal cave, and Haramis gave a great start, crying, Who's there? But immediately she knew that she was still alone, and her mind harked back to the feeling of incredible power that had suffused her when the talisman was first freed from its icy imprisonment. The amulet and talisman both flared to light simultaneously. Reflectively, Haramis dropped them both and brought both hands up to shield her eyes, but even through the palms of her hands, she could see glowing radiance. She kept her hands in place until the light faded, then slowly lowered them. Her vision was a little blurry, but this time she was not completely blinded. She knelt quickly to look for the amulet and talisman, hoping they hadn't decided to freeze themselves into the floor. Do they think I'm unworthy of them? She wondered anxiously. To her vast relief, they lay loose on the surface of the ice, but now they had fused together, with her trillium amulet nestled within the wings of the wand. It was a source of power. Of magic. Yes, this was magic. And how will I learn to use this power? Her gaze was fixed upon the three wings. The white lady said that there were two other talismans for my sisters, and if all three of us succeeded in our quest then the resolution would come. But that doesn't tell me much. Within the silvery ring beneath the wings, pearlescent vapors seemed to flow. Almost dreamily, Haramis found herself commanding the talisman. Show me if my sisters have succeeded. And she saw Cadia. Her sister stood in the midst of a great crowd of oddlings. Wizgu, judging from their small stature, holding up in one hand a shining thing, like a sword of mercy, a blade lacking a point, with a pommel resembling three conjoined black fruits. The folk were cheering her. 
Yes, Aramis murmured. You were likely to win through. But poor little Anagel. Where are you, timid one? The circle was wiped clear of Cadia's image. In its place, another formed. At first, unrecognizable. But then, Aramis gasped. Anagel! Golden hair streaming, face no longer plump-cheeked and sweetly pale, but lean, flushed, exultant. Sapphire eyes narrowed and flickering from side to side with a keen alertness Haramus never would have thought possible. Annie, dressed in muddy rags, sitting in an exotic boat that fairly flashed down some wide river, leaving a wide wake behind it. Annie, timid little Annie, smiling grimly while some fierce-looking water creatures pushed the boat along at breakneck speed. Impossible, Aramis exclaimed, and the vision winked out. Aramis stared at the empty three-winged circle. Are these true visions? Is the talisman so easy to command? A third vision, the archimage, lying in bed, distinctly weaker than when Haramis had seen her in person, her eyes closed and her skin waxen. Although the creased and sunken lips did not move, Haramis seemed to hear her speak. All three of you must accomplish your foreordained tasks, mastering your own selves above all, before Ruwenda may cast off the yoke of Labernock and the balance of the world be restored. And if one fails, all fail. But that doesn't make sense, Haramis protested. I am Queen of Ruenda. The duty is mine. And the prophecy of your own folk says that a woman will bring down King Voltric, not three of them. The dying archimage opened her fathomless eyes. Still, her lips were unmoving. But I told you also that Voltric was not your greatest enemy. The vision of the archimage disappeared. Something flickered in the icy mirror of the wall where the talisman had been. Haramis looked up and saw the smiling face of a white-haired man. His age was unguessable. The passing of years had left no trace upon his fine features. He wore robes of black and silver and sat at a table on which several strange devices rested with a great book and a tablet half covered with writing. He held a stylus in one strong hand, and a half-eaten, rosy ledu fruit in the other. It was this last homely thing, hardly to be expected of a devil in human form, that made Haramus begin to return his smile. Princess Haramus. His voice was as clear as though he stood beside her. Welcome to our company. And what company is that? she retorted, tightening her lips. That of Labernocky murderers? Unlike you, Oregastus, I am particular about the company I keep. The sorcerer laughed and put down pen and fruit. You have a rare spirit, lady. I must admit that King Voltric and General Hamel and their ilk are not the companions I would have chosen, had it not been that I had no choice. No choice? Haramis asked skeptically. Oregastus continued with perfect amiability. The company I welcomed you to was that of magic wielders. I confess that our number is somewhat reduced in these latter days, consisting of only you, me, and Bina, she whom you call the Archimage, and I fear that soon only you and I will remain. Are you planning to kill the White Lady, now that she is too weak to defend herself? Haramis spoke coldly. My dear child, of course not. I am no wanton killer. No. What stalks Bina is old age and death. He looked saddened and pensive. I fear it comes to all of us in time. Some thirty years ago, there were left in the world only two persons of power. My mentor, Bondanus, and Bina. Bondanus passed his power on to me. Bina? against all logic, would dilute hers by bequeathing it to three of you. In order to save Ruenda, Haramus cried. Ruenda. The sorcerer shook his head in gentle mockery. Your talisman has the potential to do so much more than rescue Ruenda. Bina's vision, like her life, is dimming. 
She truly does not know what power the threefold talisman can command. But you, Haramus, have centuries ahead of you in which to study and use it. Centuries? Haramus blinked. This had never occurred to her. Does using magic prolong life, and by that much? Centuries, Oregastus repeated firmly, always assuming, of course, that you don't accidentally kill yourself with it. He gestured to the talisman she held. Idiot, Haramus told herself. You would sit there holding it in plain sight. Apparently he recognizes it. But how? How much does he really know about it? The Archimage seems unable to teach me, and I don't have time to discover its use by trial and error, not if I want to save my kingdom and my sisters. The Three-Winged Circle Oregastus was smiling. I am happy that you found it. I have several books that speak of it, and I have always wished to see it. You have books about it? Aramis asked. I wish he'd go away and leave me to study his library. What do they say? Quite a lot. Too much, I fear, for me to explain to you now. You would be an icicle before I had told you a sixth of it. He gestured at her surroundings. You have been so engrossed in our delightful conversation that you have ignored the passage of time. Haramis looked quickly around her. He was quite right. The sun was low in the sky, and the cave was getting dark and cold. She looked back at the mirror. Oregastus's clothing appeared lightweight, and there was plenty of light around him. He beckoned to her. Come to my home, Haramus, to my mountain tower. Let me teach you to use the talisman. It would be pleasant to have company here. Mount Brom is rather out of the way, and I seldom have visitors. You don't want my company, Haramus said, looking him straight in the eyes. You just want the talisman. To her surprise, Oregastus actually laughed and seemed to mean it. I forget how new this is to you. No one can take your talisman away. It is bonded to you, and for one who would try to take it, there is only death. But you know next to nothing about the talisman's use. You scry with it. He laughed. The merest oddling conjurer can do the same with a leaf full of water. No, Haramus, you don't understand. But I will teach you. I have a great library and so many magical devices of the vanished ones that they defy numbering. I ask only the joy of sharing my knowledge with you. You are reputed to be quite a scholar. Do you not know the joy that comes from the pursuit of knowledge? The exquisite satisfaction when what was unclear suddenly falls into a logical design and you comprehend it? Yes. Haramis found herself nodding in agreement. I do know what you mean. Then come to Mount Brom, Oregastus invited. With the talisman you can summon your Lammergeier to carry you to my tower, and be here in time for supper. So he doesn't know Hiloro is here, Haramis thought. At least he is not omniscient. Oregastus's face grew grave. I swear by the powers we share that I will not seek to wrest the talisman from you by force, nor cause any harm to come to your person. May my powers leave me forever if I prove false to this oath. He laid his hand over his heart. So be it, Aramis murmured automatically, the formula familiar to her from years of witnessing oaths. The ice mirror went dark. Well, now what, she wondered. Do I go to him, go to the Archimage, stay here, or wander off somewhere and see what I can do on my own? Neither of the last two alternatives was in the least appealing. Also, the Archimage had not exactly ordered her to return immediately. When you achieve your goal of the three-winged circle, return to me, was what Bina had said. Had she meant simply the physical possession of the talisman, or was the ability to use it part of achieving the goal? Since Bina did not command me to return when she bespoke me just now, perhaps she intends for me to master the talisman's use. And perhaps now is the time I should confront Oregastus. While the sorcerer was undoubtedly dangerous, at least there would be warmth and food at his tower. 
The Archimage did tell me that I should learn his weaknesses, Aramis thought. Presumably it is part of my destiny, and it will be a nice change to have my destiny taking place in comfortable surroundings. And if I do run into trouble at Mount Brom, I can always ask Hiluro to carry me away. She suddenly became aware of an increased vibration of the rock spire and sounds coming from outside the cave. The thundering bass notes of the grinding glacier blended with the clarion cries of the lammergeier screeching a warning. Aramis, come out! Danger! Great danger! She threaded the small ring of the talisman onto her neck chain, tucked the wand into the bodice of her dress, and stepped over to the cave entrance. The icicles had all broken off from the tower shuddering, and the chamber within the spire abruptly began to pitch and rock like a boat on a choppy river. Aramis lifted her arms. A familiar black and white form rocketed down out of the sun, and something closed about her body, snatching her off the icy ledge. She saw a brief flash of gold, a clashing collapse of rainbow prisms, and a wheeling sky, violet-blue, behind a great crested head. Then the Lammergeier went into a slow glide, lifted its claw, and carefully held her while she climbed into the soft hollow between its outspread wings. Aramis risked a quick glance at the place where the court spire had been. Now only rock, slightly less white than ice, marred the glacier's surface, and only a few bits of gold glinted in the setting sun. 29. There passed a night, and Cadia slept between the Sindona at the head of the stairs. She had made free with the bounty of the garden for food, but she had a feeling that to linger there was wrong. The living sentinel had not come again. Cadia did not expect her as she lay, one hand tightly gripping her amulet. It was not true sleep into which she drifted, awoke, and drifted again. That the invaders had somehow gained a way into this forbidden land, she had already found proof. And there was Jagan. Would he fall captive to some scouting party, and end as had the poor remnant of a Wizgu who had besought her mercy? Where should she go now? Retrace her path, face those who had hunted her here, and might still wait to pull her down? That was sheer stupidity. Yet she had no guide, and to wander out into that strange garden would do her little good. To her right ran a lofty wall. She would follow it. Jagin's hunter's bag, which had gotten hard usage, she had emptied and dried last night. She had had to discard some of the small packets in it, for by the time she had fished the bag out of the pool, they were thoroughly soaked. She had gathered edible tubers from the garden, woven a lopsided net of grass to carry fruit, and refilled the water bottle. There was nothing more to keep her here, yet Cadia turned once more to look into the garden. Forbidden it might be, yet there was something here that reached out to her, that had seemed to welcome her, even in spite of the chilly demeanor of the sentinel. Katie sighed and shouldered her bag. For her talisman she had devised a temporary sheath and slung it across one shoulder, and its steady weight there continued to reassure her that at least she had fulfilled a part of her quest. One sword, when an army was what she truly needed. She walked for some ways along the high wall, and then it ended as a mighty gateway, and she saw within a broad stretch of park, and beyond that a gleaming city. Awed, she entered the gate and approached the place. Greenery half smothered the silent houses, and grass and vines carpeted the streets. Yet beneath that assault of vegetation there was no sign of decay. The walls which showed through the shaggy drapery were not made of stone, she was certain, but rather of that same peculiar substance that had formed the bowl in which she and Jagin had spent the night. Katie suddenly realized she was seeing the city of her dream. More walls rose beyond, enclosing it. She came into a wide avenue and walked on, marveling. The buildings on either side were well proportioned, and about their doorways and windows were indecipherable patterns in high relief. The avenue eventually led her to a gate nearly as tall as a three-story building. It stood ajar, and Cadia walked out into a far different world, where once again the swamp ruled, though the much-worn remains of a road led off into it. But time had not touched within the city walls. 
had been conquered here. Luckily, that eroded path had not been totally obliterated. She caught glimpses of the ominous yellow scum on either side of the roadway, but footing upon it appeared substantial enough. She stopped to cut a sturdy branch from a bush and use it to test the ground before she trusted her weight to it. She had come well out into the mire when she turned to look back, and then shook her head, unable to believe her eyes. What lay behind her now were broken ruins. Even the wall was tumbled down and overgrown by rampant jungle growth. Illusion. But which was the illusion then, the mysterious garden and the dream city, or this? Had everything that had happened to her been enchantment? Yet there was the weight of the talisman on her shoulder, and she raised her hand to feel the knobs of the three-lobed burning eye. She walked on for what might have been several hours, seeing nothing unusual and hearing only the normal sounds of the swamp. Judging by the light of the sun, which always seemed to be in a haze here, it was midday, or a little later. There were thickets of thorn fern and high brambles ahead. And then she heard it, the distinctive chirp of a rasp beetle, voiced three times in a familiar rhythm. Jacob, it must be. There was a slight movement in the bushes, and then she saw the face of her dear old friend grinning out at her. A dark spot of bruise puffed around one eye. That he had had no easy time of it was clear, for he wore a mass of pulped leaves tied with reed strings about his upper arm near the shoulder point, and he moved awkwardly. Nor did he waste any time on greetings. They are here, the Skritekan soldiers. She thought of those pathetic figures she had seen along the other road, and also of the distant bonfire and the arrow that had marked a route for someone. I have seen signs that the enemy is near at hand. Jagan's face was a mask, and his attention was not really on her, but on his own thoughts. The feast of the three moons nears, he whispered, and the darkness gathers. But soon there will be fire aplenty, and it will be quenched only by blood. The Feast of the Three Moons. They had always celebrated it at the Citadel with feasting, and strange old songs had been sung by the bards, and a raft loosed on the river, laden down with flowers and lighted by three-pronged candles. It was a time when the threat of ancient evil was driven away by the will of all. And when the three orbs shone high in the sky, close together in mystic conjunction, the people rejoiced beneath their benevolent radiance, and sang, but what did Jagan mean? Might he have foreseen some great battle upcoming at the time of the ancient celebration? A battle in which she might wield her talisman to the liberation of Ruenda? Before Cadia could question him further, Jagan said, The Skritek, and with them the sorcerer's voice and a party of human soldiers, have fallen upon a Wisgu village. Fire, they used, and magic summoned out of the air. The folk they still hold captive will soon be meat for the Skritek. They seek me, Cadia cried. This is why they harry the poor Wisgu. Your capture would be a great triumph, but more than that draws them. He nodded back toward where the city of the garden lay hidden by illusion. You have been there. And have you also fulfilled your quest? Wordless, Cadia took the talisman from behind her back and held it up for him to see. Though she had known Jagan since she had first begun walking, she had never seen such an expression of joy and exultation upon his face. He half put out his hand as if to touch the weapon, but then held back. The black lobes at the hilt remained closed, dull, but the blade drew what weak sunlight there was to it. Cadia held the sword closer to him. Tears were pouring down his cheeks. He fell to his knees before her. The talisman! Oh, Farseer, you have found it! There is a custom of my people, she said slowly, that a sword with a broken point stands for mercy. She shook her head. To some I will not offer mercy, but to you. She hesitated, and then the sword gently touched Jagan on the head, and from some place she did not understand, there came words of absolution. My dear friend, be of good heart. Take back your own name. 
Wear again the sacred armlet of the Nisimu. You have broken no oath. You have only followed the course of things as they had to be. Bear no soul burden from this time. Then Jagen did what Cadia had never seen before. When he had first come to the citadel and spoken to her father, King Crane, he had saluted the monarch with both hands high, in the manner she had seen him greet the first of the house in the village where they had stayed. But now his whole body inclined forward, until his arms and forehead touched the earth. All service to you, light-bearer, hope-carrier, protector and defender, heartkin of the vanished ones. Bemused, she held up the talisman. It was as if a far-off echo reverberated his words, yet something in her shrank, wanted nothing more than to thrust the magical blade back into the ground, to return it to what it had been, the root of the black trillium. Jagan, I do not know what you mean. He climbed to his feet and looked her eye to eye, the sturdy master of animals and royal huntsman of old. Lady of the eyes, learning shall be yours, and none will be called where they were not meant to serve. I do not know how to use this talisman, she protested. Never had she felt so at a loss. Even the rage which had always given her strength before was now missing. That knowledge, too, will come. Now, you must begin the true work you were destined for. She took a deep breath, then returned the talisman to its improvised sheath. Very well. These beleaguered Wizgu, she said now, briskly. Where are they? Near the upper Mutar. I heard them sound out the call, but it will be too long before they can be answered by other folk. The Skritek. His lips flattened, showing the sharply pointed small fangs so unlike her own teeth, are not easily kept under control. They must be rewarded by blood and flesh. Cadia swallowed, but she asked resolutely, Is there some way that we can aid the captive Wizgu? Farseer, I would say such a deed is impossible. But to you the forbidden way was opened, and you bear that which is threefold. We shall see. Then let us be off, she said. They no longer followed the road, but took to a tortuous path through the broken lands of the thorny hell. When evening was near, they sought a campsite, since they could not follow the trail through the night on land. But before they could bed down, a familiar and terrifying stench came faintly to them on the breeze. The Skritek were nearby. Jagan had them both rubbed down with wads of acrid-smelling leaves that would mask their scent. Then he dropped belly down while the girl followed his example, and the two of them slithered through the underbrush. Moments later they crouched, shoulder to shoulder, hidden behind the trunk-like stems of the giant ferns, to look out on an open area. It was a camp of sorts. A handful of men in rusty armor were gathered there, Labernaki soldiers. Between them and where Cadia and Jagan crouched in hiding, spears had been driven into the ground and roped together by twisted vines to form a pen, a pen filled with captives. None were males. About a dozen aboriginal women sat or lay in small groups within the cage. Two had children in their arms. There was about them such an air of misery and fear that Cadia felt her heart contract. Her hand sought the talisman sword, and she stealthily drew it. There came a faint wail, and one of the women clapped her hand over the mouth of a child. Four Skritek stood guard at the corners of the pen. One flung up his long-jawed head and bellowed, then took aim with his spear at the Wizgu woman holding the crying child. Cadia lowered the sword although she still kept her left hand on its hilt while her right went to her knife scabbard. There was a way of throwing her dagger. She had learned only last season by watching a performer at a fair, and she had made it her own by much practice. She was sure she could hit the throat of the nearest Skritek guard. Oh, if she had only three or four archers at her back! But she did not, and perforce controlled herself. The other Skritek laughed, and seemed to urge their fellow to fling his spear at the cringing mother and child. 
Arcadia took hold of Jagan's arm. Could they not do something? He opened his own left hand for an instant. On his palm rested a green lump which he held with the greatest care. It was an awaric, a strange fungus, hard to find, but a good friend to any pursued by one of the large predators of the swamp. But the enemy moved first. Two human soldiers came out of the thorn ferns, dragging a wisgu male between them. The Skritek menacing the mother hesitated, then lowered his spear. While the attention of the invaders was centered on the new captive, Jagen drew out his blowgun. Rising to one knee, he flung the Awarik with all his might, aiming at a place between the human soldiers and the prisoner pen. The brittle fungus shattered as it hit the ground, and from its shell flew a myriad of whirling spore carriers, each one sharp-edged as a razor for all its buoyancy. Instantly, all of the captive Wizgu dropped to the ground, shielding their great eyes. But the Skritek and the Labernaki were taken by surprise. Those who were not blinded at once fell into a frenzy as the tiny Awaric blades slashed the vulnerable parts of their flesh, before finally settling to the ground. Jagan already had his blowgun ready, and Katie heard the hiss of the first poisoned dart, even if she did not sight its swift passage. One Skritek fell. With her talisman in one hand and her dagger ready in the other, the princess leaped to her feet. The Skritek nearest her staggered sightless, waving his spear. The girl sent the dagger in the whirling throw she had practiced so long. It struck the soft throat of the monster, and he crashed to the ground, thrashing in his death throes. More poison darts from Jagan's pipe downed the other two Skritek. A bloody-faced soldier came at them with a short sword, but Cadia was ready for him. Her talisman soared upraised as if she were a trained, old companion. She swung and felt the jar throughout her body as the talisman crushed the man's voice box. He fell, strangling in his own blood. She stood stunned for a moment, unable to believe that she had been so able to use the magical sword. There was a din of screams and cries. Jagan's darts were taking a toll of the remaining Labernaki soldiers. Dying Skritek roared and flailed their great limbs, gouging the earth with their talons. Katie raised the sword a second time and brought its dull edge down on the netting of rope which formed the wall of the pen. The vine parted as if melted, not cut. Out! she screamed to the females inside, most of whom were already on their feet. Katie pointed with the sword. Run! Into the thorn ferns! They fled, Katie at their heels, ready for any attack from other Skritek or soldiers. Jagan followed, having retrieved the princess's dagger from the flesh of the monster she had slain. Katie and the Wizgu came to a great river, undoubtedly the upper Mutar, where a raft floated beside a large barge such as traders used. There were four soldiers there, slightly bewildered by the clamor they heard in the distance, and a single Skritek just rising out of the water with his jaws closed upon a writhing fish. Jagan! Katie took in their peril in a second. They needed the hunter with his poisoned darts. She was no match for what faced them. But Jagan had lagged behind, making certain they were not followed. The Labernaki soldiers, swords drawn, were moving to ring her round. Screams of terror came from the female oddlings as the huge Skritek splashed toward them. The girl felt a sudden warmth against her hand, so much that she shifted her grip from the hilt of the talisman sword to the pointless and dulled blade, bringing it up before her. The three eyes on the pommel were open, regarding the nearest of the swordsmen moving in on her. He gave a hoarse cry and staggered back, dropping his weapon and holding his hands to his own eyes. Katie did not know what had happened. She could only guess. She turned the talisman toward another soldier. This one screamed and blundered into his blinded fellow, who immediately whirled and cut at his third comrade, striking a mortal blow. Katie turned the sword to the last man. But he had seen what had happened to the others, and he ducked, throwing himself forward to tackle her. Then he twisted and screamed. From the back of his neck protruded one of Jagan's poisoned darts. A tremendous splash came from the river as the Skritek was struck by another dart. As Jagan ran up, the two surviving sightless soldiers continued to hack at each other as if they had gone mad. Jagan shouted for them all to climb onto the raft. He sliced its mooring rope with Cadia's dagger and tossed the blade on board. 
Two of the Wizgu women had picked up swords, and others readied the raft's poles. Quickly, Jagen shouted. More Skritek are coming. Cast off. Kadia hastened to help the wounded climb aboard. The poles dug in, and the raft responded. One of the women started a droning chant of the river people, and the ones at the poles responded with accelerated swings. Then the powerful current took them. Jagen! the princess screamed. But he only shook his head and then turned to confront five howling Skritek that burst out of the ferns. Helpless, the girl watched him lift his blowpipe against the charging monsters, and then the raft floated around a bend in the river, and Jagen's brave little figure was lost to sight. The only weapons they had were the two swords, Cadia's dagger, and the talisman. The Wizgu females did not even wear much in the way of clothing, save their own bedraggled fur. There were eleven of them, all told, and the two tiny children. Four of the Aborigines wore leaf bandages matted with bloodstains, while many of the others nursed cuts from the Aworic spore cases, or bruises dealt by their former captors. Lady, Cadia had been mourning Jagen, but now she lifted her head. One of the Wizgu women had seated herself nearby. I am Nesak of Dezeris, once first of the house and speaker of the law. These, one outflung arm indicated the others, are also of the village of Dezeris. Misfortune came upon us as we journeyed. Our men, the human soldiers, gave to the Skritek, and we were made to watch. These invaders seek secrets, great lady, which we have no knowledge of, for it is oath bound upon us that we must not go into the forbidden place of the vanished ones, this place which has ever and ever been closed. When we could not speak of what we do not know, the human who led the others, one dressed all in red, ordered that we be held for the coming of more humans who walk with Skritek, and seek to raise dark against light. This man went away down the river shortly before you came and rescued us. Now we are your servants forever, lady, and we thank you for our deliverance. Will you tell us who you are and whence you come? I am daughter to King Crane, who was... And my name is Cadia. These workers of evil have taken our land. My father died of their cruelty, as did all those who followed him. My mother also. She caught her breath for a moment, looking dull-eyed down at the talisman. If she had only had it when the Labernaki invaded the citadel. It had in some way defeated those soldiers. What might it have wrought upon King Voltric himself? There was a prophecy, the princess continued, stroking the closed eyes of the pommel, that the defeat of these evildoers would come through a woman of my house. My two sisters and I journeyed forth, commanded by the Archimage Bina, she whom you call the White Lady, in search of that which would avenge our kin. For the first time in what seemed like days, she thought of Anagel and of Haramus. How had they fared? Were both dead, and she the only one left to demand death price for their house? Anagel. Haramus. She spoke their names aloud as if she called to them. Under her hand, there was movement. She snatched her palm from the pommel of the sword. Two of the eyes were opening. Eyes? No, not this time. Instead, she saw two tiny pictures. Visions. There was Haramus, in her hand, a black trillium full opened. And Anagel next, cupping in her palms a similar one. Katie had no doubt now that her sisters did live, and that somewhere they awaited her, and the hour of their mutual trial. Even as she was assured of that, the eyelids closed, and she looked once more on the blank spheres of the pommel. Katie sighed. Lady, the Wizgu woman said gravely, it is plain that you are the light-bearer, the hope-carrier, the lady of the eyes who is kin to the vanished ones. Katie shook her head vehemently, no, Speaker of the Law, I claim no kinship with the Great Ones of old, although this, she drew her hand down the talisman, might well have come from out of their far time. I do not know how I can bear light or carry hope, 
All I am sure of is that I must bring down King Voltric and his sorcerer, Oregastus, even if I must do so alone. Lady, Nessak said softly, you do not stand alone. Those wicked ones who took us broke the great oath and met their punishment. You have been into the place of knowledge and passed harmless before the guardian Sindona. You have been sent to us. You are the Lady of the Eyes, the one long awaited. So shall the Wizgu rise to your aid. The war has ever been forbidden us. Darkness walks the land, the great balance has been destroyed, and from the struggle ensuing no one stands apart. Once we reach Dezeris, the call will go forth and the folk of the Wizgu race will march beside you. Cadia caught her breath. What she had suggested to Jagen, what she had been told could never happen, now would come to pass. If the oddlings arose, they would turn the very mazy mire into a weapon against the invaders. Her will hardened. This would be full war, and if her talisman's secret could be mastered, the war would be won. Her clenched hands dug nails into her palms. Time. She needed not only time but knowledge. She prayed her new allies might somehow deliver that. Thirty. The Rimerick swam down the river, pushing Anagil in the boat for three more days. Sometimes the main channel twisted near the forested bank, and the princess gazed with awe at the strange trees. Some were very tall, with branches that looped and curved upward like a dancer's sinuous arms. Some had quaintly corrugated trunks, as if thousands of rings were piled one upon another and slanted off-center this way and that, in a manner that seemed to defy gravity. There were massive, squat trees like gargantuan tubers, brought at the ground and pointed at the top, sprouting a ludicrous crown of tiny branches with leaves that never ceased to tremble. There were groves of splendid gonda trees, highly valued for construction larger than any that grew in the mazy mire. Their huge columnar trunks were each wider than the great main gate of the citadel, forming hushed green arcades lit by slanting golden sunbeams. There were flowering trees, so packed with vivid scarlet and orange blossoms that they seemed a fire. There were hulking, shabby-leafed trees with gnarled limbs and gaping holes in their trunks, which harbored noisy colonies of night carolers. The variety of trees was so great that Anagel's mind was finally overwhelmed by them, and she was glad when the river's main stream carried them far away from the banks. It was obvious that during the rains the wide, nearly empty bed of the great Mutar ran brimful in flood. The further downstream they traveled, the more great stacks of driftwood littered the channel, the dry bleached branches often brightly clothed in skeins of flowering vines. Huge flocks of birds inhabited the bottomland, feeding on the mudflats and in the shallows, and rising into the air, squawking and shrieking when the boat sped through their midst. There were occasional animals to be seen, fat gray quadrupeds with gaping mouths that fed on aquatic plants in the sloughs, lithe fish-eating carnivores resembling giant pelrics that the rimericks greeted as comrades and always numbers of the harmless little yellow-striped creatures that had awakened Anagil to the Tassileo, that swarmed about the shore vegetation, and also lived on the river islands. But no people. Anagil questioned her friends about this. They told her that the Wavilo had, for long years now, lived in only one large village. They sought safety in numbers, rather like certain fish or birds, since they were endlessly preyed upon by their glismac cousins who lived downstream and in the depths of the inner forest. Long ago, the Rimerick said, the Wavilo had had no permanent abode and lived in small family groups. They had rather easily avoided their clumsier glismac foes by never sleeping twice in the same place, but after the Wavilo began trading with humankind, they accumulated many things and were no longer able to wander. They became more and more rich as their lives were more endangered by the envious Glismac. But they will not go back to their old ways. Such a pass would be worse to them than death. We cannot understand this. 
but I do, said the princess to the Rimericks. Humans have had a similar history. There is that within certain people that drives them always to do better, to learn more, to strive harder, to climb higher. Not all people are this way, but the urge is easily passed from parent to child. It is not a bad thing. It is a great mystery that the motive power of the world drives living things, especially thinking persons, ever to grow more complex, when one would think they would tire of pressing on and fall back into simplicity, as a fire falls into ashes. The very old among us do grow tired, but there always seem to be new young ones eager to drive further on, to live better and better. Humans and folk are then akin. I, I suppose we are. But I do not know for certain. The Aborigines, the people you call folk, are said by our wise ones to belong truly to this world. We humans do not. The Rimericks laughed. Oh, yes, you do. Anagel chided them. I am no scholar, but I have been taught this by the finest teachers. My sister Haramus, who is very clever, assures me that it is true. And it is a belief not only of Ruendians, but of other human nations as well. Humans walked this world before the swamp folk, before the mountain folk, before the forest folk. Only the great drowners walked the world earlier. Anagel was skeptical. How do you know? You are only animals. But the Rimericks only laughed again, and would not speak of the matter further. And a few moments later, Anagel caught her first glimpse of the Wavilo settlement, and she could not be bothered thinking further about mysteries. The Wavilo obviously knew that she was coming. A fleet of more than thirty of the slender, translucent canoes put out from the shore and came speeding toward her. Each craft carried a couple of dozen aboriginal paddlers, with a coxswain standing proudly in the bow, gesturing to direct his crew. I think we had better stop, Anagel told the Rimericks uneasily. By the flower there are a lot of them. Will you, will you poke your heads out of the water and look protective? Two splashes responded, and the big animals grinned at her, then turned their eyes to the approaching fleet. The Wavilo village was spread out over a large cleared area that the princess later learned was an island surrounded by artificially deepened channels. The shoreline bristled with small docks, at which were tied many more of the lightweight gleaming vessels. The Rimericks had told her that the canoe-making material came from the swim bladder of a gigantic river fish. The houses, all on stilts, were beautifully constructed of peeled logs with shake roofs, shutters, and every kind of balcony and surrounding deck, the latter crowded with spectators. Most of the dwellings were connected by rather rickety-looking aerial walkways. A portion of the village that lay farthest downstream had evidently been struck by fire recently. Blackened structures were in the process of being torn down, and new building frames were rising from the ruins. Strangely enough, the Wavilo had no trees at all in their village, but there were masses of shrubbery and garden plots down on the ground, and many of the mossy shake roofs had flowers growing on them. When the leading Wavilo boat was about ten ells away from Anagel's motionless craft, it hauled up short. The other stopped beside it, forming a solid line of boats jam-packed with gaping oddlings, who were very different in physical appearance from those that the princess had seen before. They were taller than the Nisimu and Wizgu swamp dwellers of the north, about the size of strapping adult humans. Their heads were elongated, not rounded, and their noses resembled small snouts. Wavilo eyes were more familiarly aboriginal, being large and yellow, but they had vertical pupils, such as Anagel knew the Skritek also had. The open mouths of the gawking Wavilo revealed formidable teeth. Their skin was partially hairy and partially covered with dermal plates that resembled shiny brown scales. The forest folk wore gorgeously painted loincloths and were hung about with a profusion of necklaces, bracelets, stomachers, anklets, and other jewelry some of it gold or platinum, inset with glittering gemstones. 
strung blue glass trade beads seemed to be as fashionable as precious metal, and Anagil saw one aborigine sporting the ornate steel cuirass of a Ruendian knight, and another wearing a polder lady's fringed shawl about his massive shoulders. She had calmly combed her hair while the fleet approached, and put on Imu's leather cape to cover her shabby attire. Now she stood up carefully in the boat, flanked by the Rimericks, and raised both hands. The cape fell back to reveal the trillium amulet gleaming on her breast. The mob of floating Wavilo voiced a low cry. Talons pointed, and those in the sterns of the boats crowded and stretched to get a better look, muttering and exclaiming in their guttural language. I come here as a friend, Anagel said. I seek a magical talisman called the Three-Headed Monster. All of a sudden the forest folk fell silent. Again their mouths gaped and their golden eyes bulged. Anagel waited then finally said, Is there one among you who can speak to me? One of the most elaborately ornamented of the coxswains made an abrupt gesture. His boat nosed out of the ranks and approached that of the princess. This one speaks, he declaimed in the tongue of the peninsula. His voice was thick and almost unintelligible, and his brown-furred brow knit in a fierce scowl. He wore a collar of beaten gold, set with multicolored gems, a fine Rowendian hat of creamy brocade with a brooch of brilliance and sweeping red plumes, and a brocade loincloth to match. This one is Sastu Cha, Speaker of Let, he croaked. Who are you, and why do you seek the favor of the Wavilo? I am Princess Anagil of Rowenda. You may know that my country has been seized by human enemies from the north. She lifted the trillium amulet as she continued to speak. The guardian of our land, the White Lady, sent me to seek a talisman. It will free my people from the slave chains of the conquerors. Have you heard of this three-headed monster? The speaker hesitated. We know of one such, but it is no talisman. It lies down the river one half-day's journey, then several more hours' travel up Kovuko stream, in Glismak country. The princess drew in her breath sharply, which brought a smile to the Wavilo's face. Can you furnish me with a guide who will take me there? she asked. No. Anagel brandished her amulet. I demand it of you. By the flower! The crowd of Ovilo uttered a great sighing cry. Desperately, she pulled the black trillium leaf from the wallet at her waist and flourished it. The folk cried out even louder, and this time their tone was clearly fearful. But I must go there. Help me, Anajo pleaded. If you go up the Kobuko, you will surely perish, Sastu Cha said. The trees of that place are as voracious as the Glismak themselves. None of our people dare take you there. Even if it were not a place forbidden by the Sky God, we could not go. Four suns ago the Glismak attacked Let and burned many of our houses. As the dry season ends, they always do, knowing we are richest in booty from our trade with the humans. They will return soon and attack again. All Wavilo must stay and defend our home. Not even the holy black trillium can sway us from this duty. Anagil drew herself up and took a deep breath. Very well. Then I and my Rimerick friends will go by ourselves. Will you at least give me careful directions so that I may quickly find this Kovuko stream? Yes, willingly, and also food and fresh human clothing, if you wish it. That would be most welcome. There is also one other boon I would beg. Following after me are other humans, my enemies. I beg that you do not tell them where I have gone. We will not, said Sastu Cha. He swept his arm up in a gesture to his paddlers. Now this one asks you to follow, Princess Anagil of Rowenda. Accept for tonight the precarious hospitality of Let, then go on your way. 
And if you find your magical liberating talisman, think not only of your own imperiled home, but give some small thought to ours as well. 31. The Wizgu were highly sensitive to the swamp environment, which made them conscious of the smallest change in the life about them. It was twilight when those at the poles, they had changed many times during their journey downstream, suddenly stopped. Cadia saw them draw together, speaking, in whispers, their own dialect. Nessak, who had the trade tongue, came to Cadia's side. Lady, there are more of the enemy before us. The greater part have camped at the river bend. We must somehow find a way around them, or be taken again for their evil pleasure. Cadia nodded. She would have to depend upon their land and water skills, as she had upon Jagen's. Jagen, he remained a painful memory. In spite of all their hopes, he had not reappeared along the Mutar, nor had the Wizgu women reported picking up any call from him. But the princess continued to flinch away from the thought that he was dead. There is a way for us to pass around our foes? Katie asked. The mists were rising again, drifting to veil first this part and then that of the river and the banks. They had encountered no further sign of ruins since they had escaped. Nessak slowly shook her head. Lady, the wicked humans have with them Skritek. But it is also true that they are much wearied, and there are more dangers hereabouts. This is hunting territory for the Luru. Thus, she made a small motion with her hand, after nightfall we must go into hiding from more than men and drowners. Luru! Cadia had heard of those savage night flyers from early childhood. They were what nurses used to frighten any of their charges who lingered in the open after sundown. But since they had fled into this land, Jagen had not mentioned them. She had seen well-tanned squares of their leathery wings on sale in Travista seasons back, but only once, and then they had been something of a curiosity. Now she looked up into the steadily darkening sky. Luru were bloodsuckers that could latch onto a man or animal and suck it dry, with talons to claw the life out of any prey close enough to be captured. Lady, one of the Wizgu who had been at the fore of the raft called softly. Look there. The river had made several bends, even split into more than one channel since they had taken flight. Now it appeared to be straightening out again ahead, and there was a glow on the left-hand bank, one which certainly was not born from any swamp growth, but from a fire or other fixed light. At the same time they heard the notes of what could only be a battle trumpet summoning an ingathering, and then the shouts of men and a droning sound. The Wizgu women set their craft to the opposite shore with hasty polework. The foemen are attacked! Nessak's voice rose above her former soft speech. Maybe the Luru, lady. If they are such fools as to light the way for those predators, commented Cadia, then certainly they are simple as babes in this place. The Skritek should have given them warning. Nessak made a sound which was near bitter laughter. Lady, these men from afar will not listen to the gabble of the drowners. They would think a warning from a swamp dweller need not be taken seriously. There is no good sense among them, only the need for the shedding of blood to satisfy their masters. If the Luru attack them now, Cadia said, thinking furiously, can we not slip by them? Nessak considered. Such might give us a chance, lady. We can but try it. They touched the shore on the left bank. Cadia and several of the others grasped swiftly at reeds there and cut quantities, throwing the bundles back to the rest who were busy working to make the raft appear one of the floating masses of debris which were often to be seen drifting downriver. The only barrier against such a plan was the size of the craft they were trying to disguise. Such floating islets were usually less than a quarter of the size of the log platform on which they had taken refuge. Having made the only preparations they could, two of the polars pressed them back into the current, which was lazier here, 
so they drifted along at a nerve-torturing slowness. The fire in the enemy camp blazed ever brighter. On the raft, the Wizgu lay flat, reeds pulled over them, but watched the other shore with anxious eyes. It appeared the invaders had learned a little something during their earlier battles with the Luru, for a number of men waved torches, each torchman being flanked by a fellow with waiting spear or sword. Several of the beasts were down, struggling on the ground. A Skritek beat in the head of one, and a man who wore a reddening bandage about one leg heaved a light sword as if it were a hunting knife to pin another violently beating wing to the earth. There was nothing proud and self-confident about the bearing of these Labernaki soldiers now. Their armor was rusted, their helmet plumes draggled, and their clothing filthy. A number wore bandages, while the faces and bare skin of near all of them were puffed and reddened by numerous stings of insects. Under one tree, which had a rude shelter braced about its trunk, were at least four who lay motionless. It was very evident that the camp, large as it was, for this was no band of scouts, was completely under concerted attack. Cadia reached out with her pole and drove its end into the left bank, exerting her strength to urge the craft forward faster. Others of the Wizgu women followed her example, but the raft moved on very slowly. It would seem that the Luru were finding their battle more perilous than they had counted on. The swarm sheared swiftly away when one of their number caught fire from a well-aimed torch. The burning thing screeched, and then dropped on its attackers, determined upon retaliation. The talons on one wing hooked a man's jaw, scraping off his helm. He gave a last cry of terror as the Luru dove headlong to the ground, burying its human prey under its own burning body. Katie felt that they had more than a chance of slipping past undetected now. None of the battlers were close to the river, and, even though bonfire and torch illuminated the surface of the dark water, none of the Labernaki or Skritek appeared to look in their direction. But she knew hope too soon. The raft suddenly shuddered under them and was carried toward the right shore. Katie struggled with her pole against what she first thought was some trick of the current. Then, hardly more than an arm's distance away, the camouflage covering the logs heaved. She heard a whizgoo scream as a great scaled arm arose from the water to pull at the stacked reeds. At the same time, her pole was jerked from her hands, and she let go just in time to save herself from being pulled overboard. The raft was now moving steadily toward the scene of the battle. Drowners! Nessak gasped. Underneath! They are pulling us! There was no way to marshal a defense against creatures so used to the water that they could lurk for a long time unseen below its surface. Nor did they dare try to leap overboard and swim for it, since their enemies would only swiftly pull them under. Cadia guessed what had happened. Most of the canny swamp devils had taken to the water at the coming of the Luru attack, leaving the men to do battle. There must be a goodly number of them now in the river, judging by the speed the raft was now making toward the shore. The chaos in the camp was lessening. There were more Luru down, and now the company of vicious flyers had sheared off before making a fresh attack. And then, as Cadia watched, into the full light of the fire there came a figure robed in red, a hood pulled up and over his face. This could only be the voice of Oregastus, who had sought her so long. In one hand he carried a rod, and this he raised vertically, ramming the lower end into the ground. A soldier ran forward and helped to steady the staff. On the upper end, well above the level of the bonfire, was a circular plate. Now the voice stepped back, and from his hand there shot a beam of light which struck the plate. There was a small explosion. Orange-yellow flames spurted from the plate's rim, and it began to spin, making an ear-splitting, keening sound. The swarm of flyers uttered squawks of fear. In a body, they lofted high into the night sky, and a moment later had disappeared. The whirling firework blazed and shrieked on for a few minutes more, then subsided into a shower of sparks and died. The man in red strode down toward the shoreline to stand watching the incoming raft. 
Katie heard no call from him, but immediately several men wearing the torn cloaks and tarnished insignia of officers came to join him. There were orders shouted, and troops came running from the recent scene of battle. Katie saw a ragged handful of archers with arrows at the ready, but an officer in a full suit of elaborate blood-red armor threw up his arm, and they did not fire. None of the Wisgu females had risen out of hiding, but Katie had no doubt that those ashore were quite aware of them. Clambering out of the river now and setting the big raft to rocking, the Skritek grinned in triumph, their large eyes returning the red gleam of fire and torch. The officer, whom Katie now recognized to be General Hamel, turned to the red voice and spoke. Straightway, the acolyte of Oragastus shouted in trade tongue, Ashore, swamp scum, or shall these allies be allowed to take what they wish? He made a small gesture to the waiting Skritek. The reeds shifted as the Wisgu women crawled out, but Cadia did not follow at once. She gripped her talisman. Surely there might be just a chance. Skritek seized the Wisgu and hurled them ashore. However, the voice had no eyes for their capture. He stared at the place where Cadia still lay hidden, frowning. The talisman seemed to be shielding her in some way. The voice said something to General Hamel, and the officer turned. One of the Wisgu women who carried a child had stumbled and fallen at his feet when the Skritek had thrown them ashore. Hamel stooped and caught the screaming child by one arm, jerking it out of its mother's loosened grasp, and tossed it to one of the Skritek. The monster roared with delight and caught the prize easily out of the air. Cadia burst out of the covering of rushes, talisman in hand. No! she screamed. Take her! shouted Hamel. Before she could move, the talons of a Skritek who had climbed up from the river closed upon her, twisting her arms behind her back painfully, and she was dragged off the raft onto the shore. The talisman had fallen in the mud, but when another Skritek stooped to pick it up, he yelped and pulled back, while around the now glowing pommel there arose curls of smoke. Thrust before the general and the voice, Cadia stood tense with impotent rage. Hamel's helm was open, and he bore very little resemblance to the splendid man she had seen at the Citadel. His bristly, bearded jaws and cheeks were lumped with bites, some of which were badly swollen. One beside his left eye had pulled down the lid so that he could hardly see out of it. But he was smiling, and now he laughed. Well, boys, he spoke to his companion, now here is something that can make all this damned muck-treading worth it. The Princess Cadia. We have indeed been favored this night. A hand shot out, and nails cut cruelly into her cheeks as he cupped her face and held it higher. Swamp vort, he said with real pleasure. Far from your silks and pretties now, aren't you? It did not take long to reduce you to a mud runner, soft meat like all your kind. He let go his hold and slapped her face, a blow so sharp and heavy that tears came willy-nilly. Hamel snorted. Weep your eyes out, girl. There is no mercy for any of your house. He looked at the red voice and added scornfully, so the women of Crane's blood are to bring great labor knock down. His heavy hand fell again, this time on her shoulder, and he brought her about to face the minion of Oregastus. This, this is what your great lord sees as death to us? What a joke! The voice was not looking at Cadia, rather at the talisman, which lay a short distance away. He stooped to take it, and then drew back, scowling. What frights you, voice? Hamel was jovial. It is the talisman, the magical gym crack so coveted by your master. Take it, man. What are you waiting for? The red voice stiffened. He seemed to grow taller, more massive. From the eye holes of his mask, dazzling white beams shone, so that even General Hamel joined his men as they all exclaimed in fear. Hamel! As if born on the night wind, came a new voice Cadia had heard before. It was the acolyte speaking, but the tones were those of Oregastus. You have done well, better than you know. But you must take great care. That lying before you is bonded to your prisoner. Neither you, nor any other who has not the old knowledge, 
can handle it. Only she. My red voice, obey me. Make Princess Cadia carry the talisman back to the citadel, but be sure she cannot use it. The red voice slumped. His eyes were dark again, and he whispered, Yes, master. Hamel spat, loudly and noisily, the spittle striking the mud just beyond the pommel. So she and that stick are magically bonded. Well, boys, how do you solve this problem? It is plainly of your master's kind of warfare. The sorcerer's acolyte produced a length of cord, not woven from any fiber, but oddly mottled in color as if it had been the skin of some small swamp worm. As Cadia watched, he fashioned a small noose at one end of it. This he proceeded to roll between thumb and forefinger, muttering to himself. Then, with the care of a fisherman about to entice some wary pond-dweller, he lowered the loop and, with great patience, worked it over the pommel of the talisman, giving it a stiff jerk when he had it in place. Having made sure that his noose was secure, he lifted the snakeskin and so drew the pointless sword entirely free of the ground. As he stood dangling it before him, Hamel reached forth carelessly to touch it, only to have the voice pull back. Lord General, this be truly bonded. Lay hand fully upon it, and it may have you entrapped. The General snorted. You heard the orders of my master, the voice went on. This is a thing of great power he wishes to possess, and since it is bonded to Princess Cadia, he wishes her also. Hamel eyed the girl thoughtfully. But what if she contrives somehow to use the damned thing? Through the eye-holes of his mask, the voice was regarding Cadia intently. Lord General, we do not know what this girl can do, but my master has given me a device to subdue her. At the end of the spotted skin which held it, the sword swayed hypnotically back and forth. The red voice reached into his robe with his other hand, brought out a small white object, and touched it to Cadia's forehead. Cadia cried out, and then her voice died away. It was as if the biting cold of ice struck her, freezing her very bone marrow. The cold spread through her body from head to foot. She tried to move, but her body did not respond. The voice nodded. Just so. For a space, Lord General, she will be harmless, though this will not hold forever. The device works but once, and I have but one of them with me. There is another way that we can coerce this girl. That which is bonded can be released. By willing. But such breaking of another's resolve will take time. We must see that this talisman goes with her until we are in a position to accept it freely from her. Accept freely? Hamel stared and then laughed. Oh, that can be arranged. Oh, yes, it can. There was a volley of orders. Katie was trussed like an inert bale of goods, with her talisman lashed to her back. Then poles were run through the ropes, and two soldiers bore her off, like the trophy of a hunt. The whizgoo from the raft had been once more herded together and were bound up, their necks noosed one to the next in a line. However, it would seem that their captors had no intention of going farther that night. Perhaps to leave their fire would appear folly after they had beaten off one Luru attack. There were a couple of strong-rooted trees growing among the ferns, and to those the neck ropes of the captives were made fast. Skritek squatted nearby, grunting among themselves, eyeing the prisoners greedily. Cadia's thoughts moved sluggishly. She had a queer mental picture of one pushing step by step through a great bank of snow. She considered General Hamel. He was a fit and ready tool for King Voltric. From him there flowed a sense of evil, not of unearthly darkness such as the voice and his master projected, but rather a brutality which was worse in a way because it was fully human. Nevertheless, it seemed more likely that she might influence him than the sorcerer's puppet. She tried to use anger, as she had so often before, to arouse herself out of the deadly cold. But she was trapped. There was no warmth either from the talisman to which she had been so carefully bound. She closed her eyes and willed herself to think clearly, but her congealed nerves seemed only to urge surrender. 
Then she was aware of a rustling beside her, and that for some time she had not heard the grunting of the skritek. She opened her eyes as breath, foul with the fumes of brandy, puffed against her cheek. Then there came a clamping down of a hand, harsh and hard across her lips, and strong fingers tangled in her hair. Princess! It was a tainted whisper. What of the treasure you have seen in the swamp ruins? Where is that beldame of the ancient legends who plays with magic, who is said to have gathered the most powerful tools of the vanished ones? Orgastus thinks to gather all into his own hands. Ah, much I know of that. More than Voltric, who may be dead by now, along with that stupid boy, his son. But the sorcerer is far away in his tower, and this voice of his but a weakling and a fool when he is not possessed by his master's spirit. Tell me the secrets you have learned. By a clean death, king's daughter, if you gain one, you buy it of me, and me only. Hamel, this man was playing some game of his own. The hand uncovered her mouth, but the fingers remained painfully twisted in her hair. Oddly enough, the brutal general's threats appeared to have broken through some of the icy sorcery which held her impotent. So there was no longer a meeting of common purpose among the enemy. How could she turn this to account? It was so difficult to think clearly. Would you rather face the Skritek, then, Mudcrawler? Well, we can make a pretty show in the morning for you. One you can watch. His grip on her loosened, and she was abruptly alone. For a big man, he could move silently enough, though she had been cast down on the ground not far from his tent. And then she saw another shadow moving, one that did not approach closely. But she heard a sibilant whisper. So, Hamel believes that he is a match for the master, as if there was ever any need for him, or King Voltric, or Prince Antar, once this land was overrun. What you carry, girl, that is what matters. Or Agastus would be willing to let you take your blood payment from the Labernaki king, if you would meet him with truth. The red voice crept nearer. Then his hand was on her shoulder, very close to the pommel of the talisman. See, I will play you fair. I can free you from the spell that freezes you. We can be far from here before that morning Hamel prates about, if only you will bond the talisman to me. Exerting all her strength, she managed to gasp, I am no fool, faithful servant of a foul master. Foul? Ah, oh, no, princess. You will find Orgastus a most pleasing friend. Already your dear sister Haramus is his cupmate, and learns from him such wondrous craft as your archimage never even dreamed might exist. She has a taste and a talent for such things, has the princess Haramus, and already she sees matters through the master's eyes. You can join her. My master will not gainsay you if you bring King Voltric and Hamel down. They have begun to weary him. You can be a queen, if you wish, a ruler of two lands, and your sister will have a thaumaturgical throne to reach the stars. There was a poisonous reasoning in what he said. That Oragastus might be tired of his Labernaki allies could be understood. That he believed he could use her, a royal princess, to rule both Rwanda and Labernac. Yes, that too was plausible. Of course, he must be lying about Haramus submitting to Oragastus. Still, she might temporize. I, I cannot give anything when I am so bound, Cadia pointed out. The sound that came from the voice was nearly a snicker. Princess, you can command your talisman even if you are bound. Release by word and thought what you carry, and I shall speedily release you. Of course she did not believe him, but there was so little time to think, and her thoughts still seemed sullenly slow. Then she remembered, remembered a blade which had grown from a root. She might carry a magical sword, but it was rooted in something else. And that 
this follower of Oregastus did not know. I grant you permission to draw it. She found words coming to her tongue which had not been in her mind a moment earlier. Plant the blunt end of the blade in the ground. She could hear his quickened breathing. That he trusted her was a wonder, but one she had no time to consider now. She felt the talisman slide out from between her shoulders. There was no gleam to it now. It remained quite dull. The red voice was on his feet. She saw him put the blade into the soil until it stood upright, even as she had asked. Then there was a radiance. The blade thinned, became as slender as a stem. But the three lobes remained the same. She heard her own voice in a fierce whisper. B, O oh living talisman, O oh rootstock of the black trillium, the emblem and strength of our house, as you have always been. At her order the spheres opened. The three eyes were alive. They turned on the voice, who had stiffened. For an instant his own eyes gleamed star-bright as the distant sorcerer sought to invade him. But Oregastus was not quick enough. One eye of the talisman shot forth white light, and to that was joined a green beam from the oddling eye, and a shaft of gold from the human. And the voice burned. He writhed as the magical radiance enveloped him, a column of tricolored flame entwined about his body, sealing him in. He had not even time to scream. And then the fire was gone as suddenly as it had come, and cinders lay heaped on the ground, giving off wisps of smoke. In the place of the three-lobed burning eye stood the talisman, lifeless and dull. 32. Never had Prince Antar spent such wretched days and nights as those on the great Mutar. The unrelenting sun roasted him and his armored companions like holiday togars. They had taken only the seven largest of their wooden punts, deeming those of the Wavilo too fragile and tippy and these were cramped and crowded when loaded with a reduced force of forty-three men and the necessary supplies. In their inexperience, the Labernaki almost always chose stopping places on the main banks of the river that were too hot and too muddy, and infested with slimy bloodsuckers, biting gnats, and small yellow-striped vermin that gnawed holes in the supply sacks. The meals prepared by amateur soldier cooks were usually either burned or raw. Two men already suffered the bloody flux from snacking on poisonous fruit. Bereft of their comfortable pavilions and folding beds, which were too large to fit in the punts, the knights had to sleep on the ground as the common soldiers did, covered only by their capes. And finally, when the unkempt force reached the attractive Wavilo settlement of Let, which looked by then as inviting to them as Deraguilla Palace, the accursed oddlings refused them permission to land. Meeting the Labernaki in midstream, the Wavilo were totally unimpressed by the prince's offer to reward them handsomely for their trouble. The speaker declared that the village had no time for guests. It expected to be besieged by its glismac foes at any time. The humans must move on. Neither guides nor food supplies were available. Sir Rinitar took it upon himself to revile the assembled flotilla of forest folk and their speaker roundly. He threatened them with the thaumaturgical fury of the mighty Oregastus, this same to be delivered via the blue voice if the Wavilo did not accede at once to Labernock's demands. Rinitar's friend, Sir Karen, not wishing to be bested in defiance of the insolent primitives, surged to his feet in his punt, drew his sword, and challenged Speaker Sastu Cha to single combat. At this point, the apparently unarmed aborigines whipped out small catapults and bombarded the seven Labernaki boats with a barrage of smartly flung flintstones. The prince and most of the knights in their armor were hardly hurt, although the luckless Sir Penipat narrowly missed having his eye put out. But the twenty-one soldiers, having been pressed into service as reluctant oarsmen and shucking most of their armor because of the heat and constraints of rowing, sustained many a bruise and laceration. Sir Karen was startled into overbalancing when the assault commenced, and his massive flounderings caused his punt to roll over with a tremendous splash. Still waving his sword, the iron-clad stalwart vanished into the depths of the great mutar, 
never to be seen again, as did his knightly companion in the punt, Sir Bidrick. The blue voice, who had also been a passenger in the capsized craft, popped to the surface of the water with remarkable buoyancy for one so skinny, and struck out for the prince's boat, into which he was dragged by Sir Owanan. The three decanted soldier oarsmen thrashed about pathetically, calling for help, since they could not swim and their boat had drifted off down the river out of reach. Eventually they were hauled safely aboard other punts by their mates. The Wavilo had watched this spectacle phlegmatically, slingshots at the ready. Go away, Speaker Sestucha commanded once again. We will not harm you further if you leave at once. Prince Antar spoke in a whisper to the dripping blue voice. Can you magic yon oddlings and force our will upon them? Nay, High Lord. The voice was calmly wringing his skirts over the side. The instruments of enchantment I might have used are, like the late lords Karen and Bidrick, now resting on the floor of the great Mutar. Very well, sighed the prince, and he called to the oarsmen. Row on. Thus ignominiously did the search party continue down the river, until it was nearly dark, and the prince deemed that they had gone a safe distance from Let. Then they put in at an inviting small cove, hard by the main channel and smoothly sanded, and made camp by firelight. There were seven soldiers so badly battered that they were useless for fighting or arduous rowing. These were excused from further duty. Tomorrow, Prince Antar told them, you men, and two others more able-bodied from among the wounded, will take one of the punts and make your way back to Tastown. Tell the boat skippers and the master trader that they are to await our return upon pain of death, even should we not have returned by the start of the rainy season. There was much murmuring among the knights and the other men at this, but the prince paid no attention. He then summoned the blue voice. Call upon your dark master to scry for us, Princess Anagel, so that we may know where to betake ourselves on the morrow. Tell Oragastus also to inform my father, King Voltric, that I continue to follow his orders faithfully, and those of his grand minister of state. With that, the prince tramped off down the moonlit shore by himself. The other men went about their business, sunk in melancholy, excepting the blue voice, who retired to a grove of weeping wydal trees at the margin of the strand, knelt down, and passed into a trance. Almighty master, hear me. I, Oragastus, hear you, my voice. Alas, my lord, our expedition has suffered a grave setback at the Wavilo village of Let. The oddlings caught us unawares with a shower of missiles, upsetting the boat in which I rowed. All of the magical equipment was lost, and the knights Karen and Bidrick sank from the weight of their armor and drowned. Also, seven men-at-arms were so badly banged about that they must retire back to Tastown in the care of two others less seriously injured. And Sir Penipat has a black eye the size of a ladu fruit from being smote with a flying rock. Orgastus digested this news. The prince and the other seventeen knights are yet hale. Aye, great lord, and twelve soldiers, although most are bruised and full of complaints. I have scried the princess Anagel. She is encamped at the mouth of a small stream down river from you, and intends to go up this waterway tomorrow, travelling on foot when she can no longer use her boat. It will take your party about five hours to reach the stream, if both the men and knights row double time. You will order Prince Antar to depart at dawn, and pursue Anagel with all speed. But see that she goes unscathed until she secures the talisman, which must now be very close by. I will transmit your commands to the prince, master. Tell the prince also the good news that his royal father is very near full recovered. Furthermore, General Hamel has Princess Cadia in custody, and will shortly take charge of her talisman, the three-lobed burning eye. Master, the voice faltered. This evening, as we made our landing, I felt a sudden brainstorm. It, it seemed as though my red brother, who accompanies General Hamel, had met with misfortune. My blue voice. You must be brave. 
your brother has perished in my service. Oh, woe! The dark powers will receive his life energies and glorify them, and you two voices who remain shall share an even greater earthly reward when my great ambition is fulfilled. But recall now the other matter, concerning Prince Antar, that you must yet carry out. I wait only for the appropriate moment, Almighty Master. The doughty Serenitar, a man after your own heart, will be taken into our confidence after the deed is done. He will surely lead our party back safely once the talisman is secured. The sorcerer's mental speech now lost all tinge of sympathy and became charged with a dreadful resolution. It is of the utmost importance, my voice, that Anagel's talisman be not lost. Great Lord, I understand. Gadia's talisman is all but secured. That of Princess Haramis will soon be mine, perhaps even before this night is over. But these two are fully empowered only by the third, the one you must bring to me. On my life, the blue voice vowed, I will place it at your feet, and if all goes well, Prince Antar will not see tomorrow's sunset. I am pleased. Farewell, my blue voice. The enchanter's minion made his way back into the camp, where one cook of the evening was preparing a stew of dried meat and vegetables garnished with fatback, while another attempted to bake loaves in a sooty reflector oven. The smells were not encouraging. The blue voice approached the prince boldly. Antar's preoccupation vanished, and he looked almost eager. You have news? Aye, High Lord. The fugitive princess is only about eight hours ahead of us. She nears the goal of her questing, and perhaps tomorrow or the next day we'll see her taken. The voice went on to tell of the king's recovery and how the sorcerer had nearly secured the other two talismans. He did not mention his fellow acolyte's death. The prince listened with half an ear, then walked away without another word to share the poor supper with his men. That night... A great thunderstorm struck the Tassileo Forest, the first genuine precursor of the rainy season which would officially begin in six days, after the Feast of the Three Moons. The men of Labernock were roused by the thunder and hastened to turn over their boats and take refuge under them. But once again their lack of wilderness experience betrayed them. The sandy flat that had seemed so pleasant earlier was now inundated as the great Mutar rose in brief flood. Cursing and groaning, the party had to right the punts and climb into them, then paddle into an adjacent thicket, now also underwater, and tie up there for the rest of the night. They dozed fitfully beneath their streaming capes as the storm raged on, bailing out the punts as rainwater accumulated. Prince Antar was as soaked and miserable as the lowest soldier, yet he thought not of his own discomfort, but rather sat sleepless as he worried how Princess Anna Jo fared throughout that endless, blustery night. Friend, they called to her. Friend, awaken. It is first light. You asked us to call you. Awaken. Inside the hollow tree, Anna Jo stretched and yawned. She lay on dry, clean wood dust, a product of the carpenter worms that still worked industriously around and above her to reduce the dead forest giant to a mound of humus. Her hair, sleep sack, and the handsome new clothing that the Wavilo had given her were powdered with the stuff, but it was a small price to pay for snug shelter during the storm. She had dreamed again, but the memory faded with a Rimerick's call. She had bade the animals rouse her early, knowing that she must be nearing the object of her quest. Last night, awakened momentarily by the crashing thunder, she had seen her trillium amulet glowing like fire. The small flower it within was very nearly full open. She ran the comb through her hair to dislodge the worst of the dust and took out the mitten gourd from her wallet. The black trillium leaf wrapped around it no longer seemed so fresh and green. Its upper portion was withering where the vein had turned brown, and only the base was moist and alive. The golden trace that had guided her from Noth now extended only through the short bent stem. 
We have a fish for you, friend. Come out and see. Gathering her things, she stopped and squeezed out of the hollow tree. The two rimericks were there beside the punt, which was drawn up partway on the bank of the stream. A fat windju fish lay on the moss. Rags of mist stole in and out of the surrounding trees, and the undergrowth of great ferns and shrubbery dripped even though the rain had stopped. The sky seemed clear, and the white birds were singing their welcome to the dawn. The creek, she noticed, ran much fuller than when they had entered it last night. That was fortuitous. It meant that she would be able to travel farther upstream in her boat. Thank you, my friends, Anagel said. But I think I will eat only this wavilo pasty and some of these berries for breakfast. It would be hard for me to start a fire in this dampness, and I would like to be quickly on my way. That would be a good thing, said one Rimerick. The second one said, It is known to us that your enemies are fast approaching on the water that flows to the sea. Our comrades tell us that the humans are very wet and very angry, and more eager than ever to catch you. Anagel sighed. For some strange reason, I find it hard to fret over them now. I am no longer even afraid of the three-headed monster. But I don't think this has anything to do with bravery. I am only sick of this quest and anxious to bring it to an end. When I have the talisman, well, perhaps then I will worry about how to save myself from the foe and return to my sisters. The creatures took hold of the punt's stern in their strong jaws and pulled it into the water. Share mighten with us, and we will be on our way. She performed the ritual, then climbed into the boat. They began to move up the stream that the Wavilo called the Kovuko, and slowly the sun climbed higher and the dense foliage of the Tassileo forest began to steam. It grew so sultry that Anagel shed most of her clothing, save for the new shift she wore under her hunter's tunic and Imbu's broad-brimmed hat. It had surprised her that the forest folk's homes were so richly furnished with human luxuries. The modest Nisimu of Trevista had household goods and garments mostly of their own manufacture. But the places she visited briefly in Let had been crammed with all manner of Ruendian and Labernocky things. Iron kettles and silver spoons, fancy oil lamps and gilt candelabras, expensive leather furniture, seed poppers and toasting forks, tapestries and paintings, plush toy animals, rugs, harps and mandolins and bagpipes, satin cushions, porcelain and fancy glassware, playing cards, game boards, and every sort of decorative trinket or knick-knack that the dialects crafters had ever invented. Speaker Sastu Cha and his wife had even owned a copper hip bath, of which they were inordinately proud. Anagel had soaked in it and washed with perfumed soap. The fresh clothing she wore came from the speaker's sub-adult children, who were faddishly fond of certain kinds of human garb. Once she became used to their forbidding faces and rather grumpy mannerisms, Anagel quite liked the Wavilo. They were a forthright people who worked very hard during the dry season, and fought never-ending battles with their poorer Glismac cousins during the rains. The speaker confided to her sadly that the human traders had placed an embargo upon one kind of goods only. No weaponry was ever traded for Wavilo forest products. Both Ruendians and Labernaki hold fast to this policy in their own self-interest, Sastu Cha had told her. For if we had modern weapons, swords and lanceheads of steel and powerful crossbows, we would be able to defeat the Glismak once and for all, and extend our sway down the entire Great Mutar into the land of Var, and sell our timber to the agents of King Fiodalon more easily and profitably. Anagel had not known what to say. It does not seem fair to deny your people the means to defend themselves. On the other hand, my little country lays claim to the northern Tassileo and depends upon its timber exports to support its economy. Surely there must be a way to compromise, so that both Wavilo and Ruendians can live safely and prosperously. If there is, only you Ruendians can find it. But we no longer rule. You know that Labernock has crushed us. 
Are you so sure? What of this talisman you seek? Is it not to provide your salvation? The three-headed monster? Anagel gave a sad little laugh. Do you really think I can tame such a thing and send it against our foe? No, the speaker had said. Not if your quest ends with the three-headed monster we know. He refused flatly to describe this thing further. But before Anagel departed from Let, he told her, Soon it will be the Feast of the Three Moons. You can see, when they rise in the night sky, that the orbs are drawing closer and closer to each other, in the kind of conjunction that only occurs once in a thousand lifetimes. If it happens that this year the moons can join, then a great wonder work will certainly take place. And it could concern you, O petal of the living trillium. Anagel's boat moved up Kobuko stream, and the forest on either side changed character, becoming drier and less choked with undergrowth. Many of the lofty columnar trees grew there, but there were others as well, of a most unusual aspect. They were about three times the height of a human being, herbaceous rather than woody. At their base was an open rosette of thick leaves, some individual trees having leaves colored purplish-green, while others had leaves swirled with patterns of variegated green gold. From the center of the rosette grew a stout fleshy trunk studded with short branches, each one of which had smaller leaves, together with brilliant flowers of luscious pink or magenta, and pendulous clusters of fruit having a most delectable smell. Atop the trunk was another cluster of larger leaves curving upward, forming a kind of chalice. The aspect of the trees was exotic, but very appealing. They seemed almost like gigantic goblets with elaborately bejeweled stems. Charmed, Anagel proposed stopping and gathering some of this strange tree's fruit. Nay, friend, it would be your last meal. Oh, are the fruits poison? They are delicious, but the tree uses them to bait its trap. With a shiver of fear, Anagel recalled certain words of Speaker Sastucha. The trees of that place are as voracious as the Glismac themselves. They... they would eat me? Or us, friend, or any creature foolish enough to touch the tempting offerings that dangle from their trunks. They moved on up the stream, which now began to narrow rapidly and become more choked with rocks. There were fewer and fewer of the columnar normal trees now, and more of the goblets, together with many other species of sinister appearance. The land on either side of the stream rose, and they entered a wide, humid canyon. Strangely, no birds sang, nor did Anagel see any animals. The forest was very quiet, except for the tumbling waters of the creek, and one far distant scream that she heard, which then stopped abruptly. When the sun was nearly overhead, the two rimericks drew the punt up below a patch of white water, thick with boulders. For more than an hour now, they had pushed the boat slowly from behind, squirming and humping through water that was no longer deep enough to swim in, while the banks grew steeper and the country more rocky. Now the two green-dappled creatures turned their great dark eyes upon the princess and spoke the mental words she had anticipated with dread. Friend? We can take you no further. Yes, I see. The water above the rapids is much too shallow. Slowly, she put her hunting garb back on. The friendly Wavilo youths had given her blue boots, a knee-length tunic of blue leather, and an ornate belt that she had hooked her wallet to. The lace trimming of her new shift showed at the sleeves and the hem of the tunic in a way no real hunter would have tolerated, but she did not care. She had so longed to feel something soft and clean next to her skin. Checking her supplies, she decided to leave Imu's rain cape behind. Her garb was now weatherproof enough if it should storm again, and she no longer cared whether hands or face got wet. She strapped on her pack, settled Imu's grass hat, and as an afterthought arranged her small dagger where it could easily be pulled out. Then she said to the Rimericks, My dear friends, what will you do now? Your home is so far away that I do not see how you can ever return. And this is my doing. 
Is it possible for you to make a life for yourselves in this forest? There are none of our kind here, only distant relatives. But this does not matter. We will wait here for you, with the boat, until you have fulfilled your quest. Then we will all return together to our own country. Tears blurred Anagel's vision. Stumbling a little, she stepped into the creek to kiss the top of each wet, glossy head. Then they all three shared Mighton. Again, away in the distance, but echoing now against the canyon walls, there sounded an agonized scream. Anajo pretended not to hear it as she resettled her pack. A faint trail beginning above the rapids paralleled the creek on one bank and led upstream. With a last wave to her friends, she set off alone into the forest. 33. It was the most frightful headache Haramis had ever had in all her life, and she moaned as she sat up in the great bed and clasped her throbbing skull with both hands. She cursed herself for a fool, trying to remember exactly what had happened on the previous night. But pain and nausea defeated her. Had he cast a spell upon her, sapping her willpower, deceiving and ensnaring her? I walked into his trap like a gauze wing flying into a linget web. I was as reckless as Cadia ever could be, and even sillier than Anagel. Oh, my head hurts. Blearily, she peered about her prison. One wall of the chamber was cut stone, hung with tapestries, and there were two small glazed windows through which he could see gray daylight and snow thickly falling. New candles in gilt sconces lit the other walls of rich wood wainscoting, hung with paintings of strange landscapes. There was a brisk fire in a fireplace framed in colored tiles and having curiously wrought andirons. But she was surprised to feel warm air also coming from a small grill in the wall next to the bed. She saw the door. It was of heavy gonda wood, carved in a pattern of stars, and had iron bands and hinges and a massive lock plate. Locked in. Trapped. How? The canopied bed with its downy comforter, soft sheets and brocade hangings. She remembered Orgastus leading her to it when her senses had begun to fail. After they had sat long together by the fire, conversing and sipping cup after cup of warm brandy, he had laughed as he closed the door, and the click of the lock had followed. And for some strange reason, she had burst into tears. Then dizziness had overwhelmed her as she sat on the bed's edge, and with her last strength she had pulled off her outer garments and retreated into blackness. Poison. Had he tried to poison her? To steal? She lifted one shaking hand, but the talisman still hung safe between her breasts, suspended by its golden chain the wand, the three-winged circle. Thank the lords of the air. There was a knock at the door. Go away, she moaned. Can you not let me perish in peace? Haramus, you are not dying, Oregastus said calmly. Open the door. You have locked me in yourself, villain. Look on the table in front of the fire, Haramus. Slowly, to prevent her pounding head from breaking into pieces, she rose and slid out from under the covers. There were black fur slippers on the rug beside the bed, and a dressing gown of heavy quilted black velvet lay neatly folded on a nearby bench. Having managed to put these on, Haramis tottered over to the fire. A graceful little table and a chair upholstered in red leather stood there. On the table was a basket of bread rolls and a silver gilt stand with crystal pots of jam. There was also a tall silver ewer, steaming spicily from its spout. And lying on a folded napkin of fine linen was a big brass key. Please let me in, the sorcerer said. It grieves me that you are suffering. I swear that I mean you no harm. Was he lying? Did she care? Whatever he did to her, she couldn't feel much worse than she did already. She picked up the key, staggered to the door, and after some fumbling, managed to turn the key in the lock. He turned the latch ring and entered, tall and dressed all in white. She felt one strong arm support her and lead her to the chair in front of the fire. She collapsed into it. 
You could have opened the door quite easily yourself, she mumbled, accusing. Don't deny it. You would not even have had to blast it with your lightnings. What lock could restrain a sorcerer? You or one of your attendant demons must have been in the room already, for the fire is lit and the table laid. He was pouring some of the hot liquid into the cup. It was Darcy tea, and the smell of it raised her spirits the merest bit. I have no attendants in this place, and I was not in the room, although I did cause the fire to burn and the food to appear. That was what I would call necessary magic. His deep voice was cheerful. I admit I could have forced the lock, but that is hardly the way to treat a guest. Now, drink your tea and eat your breakfast. I assure you that you will feel better after that. Then, if you feel you can forgive me, come again to my library in the main tower and we will resume our interrupted conversation of last night. She regarded him with deep uneasiness. And if I decline to accept your hospitality any longer? He bowed his head, concealing his face. Your Lammergeier sleeps on the top of this turret. It would come if you called. In the chamber across the corridor there is a balcony, covered with snow and ice, but with plenty of room for you to mount and fly off to wherever you choose, if that is really what you want to do. He went out the open door and closed it softly behind him. Aramis got up from the table and went to one of the windows. In spite of the blowing snow, she could see the dark chasm that split the flank of Mount Brom and isolated the Tower of Oregastus from the passable region opposite. How had he gotten here from the Citadel? Surely he could not fly. And what had they talked of last night? Aramis remembered clearly coming to the tower yesterday evening, and Oragastus standing in the open doorway of the gatehouse, silhouetted against the light, welcoming her as a guest long expected. He had been polite, but not presumptuous, seeming no sorcerer at all, but only the well-bred lord of a rather unconventional manor house. His hair was the bright white of summer clouds, worn long to frame a countenance mature but unlined. The eyes that had blazed like baleful stars in her dreams and fancies now seemed to be the color of very deep water. He wore a loosely belted tunic, narrow trues, and soft shoes, all spotlessly white. Around his neck was a platinum chain with a large medallion bearing the emblem of a many-rayed star. He had played the gracious host showing her through certain parts of the tower, such as the solar, the music room. This had surprised her, the great library, and finally his personal study. There, a crackling fire had banished any thought of the snowstorm howling outside. The floor was covered with fur rugs, and a candlelit table was set for two. Oragastus had cooked her a simple supper with his own hands, and then they had sat together on the rug before the fire, drinking brandy. What did I tell him? she asked herself. But she could not remember. She ate one bread roll, slowly, and finished most of the tea. A small door she had not noticed earlier led to an adjacent bath chamber, cleverly fitted and sumptuously designed. Flameless lights within crystal shells flashed on as she stepped into the room. Both walls and floor were tiled in pale green and warm to the touch, heated by a central hypocaust, she supposed. There was a tall gold-framed mirror and a dressing table with golden combs and brushes, a large collection of other exquisitely made toiletries, and little pots of cosmetics, bottles of fragrant essences to perfume the water, and body powder with a down puff. Hot and cold water came of itself from gilt spigots and poured into a green stone tub, almost large enough to swim in. The water shut itself off when the tub was full. There were stacks of soft towels ready. Instead of a guard robe, there was a water closet, an exotic luxury she had heard of but never seen. Haramis sank happily into the warm water, but even in the water, she kept the talisman secure on its chain around her neck. 
She went to Orgastus later, dressed in the riding clothes the Visby had given her, and with her black hair hanging in a single braid down her back. She found him in the library, poring over a great book, making notes on a strange, glowing tablet with a stylus. When she approached, he laid a fringed leather bookmark on the page and closed the volume. The tablet he touched with a finger at one corner. It dimmed, and the writing upon it disappeared. Do not let me interrupt, she said civilly. If you wish to read on, it would give me pleasure to examine some of your rare books more closely. Your scholarly inclination is famed throughout the peninsula, lady. It is one reason why my royal master, King Voltric, proposed marriage to you. She uttered a small laugh. One reason, forsooth. She bent casually to examine the tablet. What is this? I saw you inscribe words upon it, and yet the tablet is now blank. His expression was neutral. It is a device of the vanished ones, and all such are magic. I am not so sure of that, she said slowly. It doesn't feel magical, she thought. Orgastus was looking at her suspiciously, so she hastily changed the subject. You told me you have many of their things. Yes. She picked up the tablet idly. How does this work? Another time, he said pleasantly, and tried to take it from her. But Haramis kept a firm hold on it, pulling back, and it slipped from his fingers and struck lightly against the talisman hanging at her breast. A spark crackled from the wand to the tablet, and the tablet's glow vanished abruptly. Haramis hastily set it down. Oh, no, she thought uneasily. I didn't mean to break it. But will he believe that? Or care? Oregastus seemed to be controlling himself with great difficulty. Haramis edged nervously backward, away from him, and tucked the three-winged circle away, into her bodice. He picked up the tablet and pressed his fingertip to it in several places, but the glow did not return. It's dead, he said between clenched teeth, lifting his eyes to glare at her. Haramis, who had been considering an apology for the damage she had inadvertently done, lost her temper at that. Her eyes glittered and her voice sharpened. Dead, she snapped. That device was never alive. My parents are dead, and at your instigation. He was silent. She whirled away from him and went to the great library window. The mad dancing of the wind-driven snow reflected the turmoil that had suddenly broken out in her mind. Since the fall of the Citadel, she had not had much leisure to remember the events of that day, and they were certainly something she had preferred not to think about. But now, suddenly, the memories flooded back. The squire's account of her father's murder, the sight of her mother bleeding to death. Tears streamed down Haramis's cheeks. Haramis? She cut him off. What an idiot I have been. You lured me here with your black arts, and because I am young and a fool, you were able to lull my fears and make me forget who you really are, and who I am. He had come up behind her, and now he laid a hand on her shoulder and turned her about. He spoke softly, almost sadly, and there were tiny silvery reflections from the blizzard deep in his eyes. Do you not also remember that I kissed the palm of your hand, and told you how I had loved you ever since the wretched Voltrick showed me your portrait? And do you not remember my telling you how I recognized you as the one destined to share power with me? You are the enemy of the Archimage who has protected our kingdom so long against its enemies. Deny it if you dare. You are the one responsible for destroying the great balance of the world, the one who worships the dark powers. You would steal my talisman and those of my sisters. He kissed her. For a moment she stood rigid in his arms, but his lips were sweet, and warmth from them flowed through her body. She felt dizzy, as if everything were whirling madly about, and he was the only solid thing in the room. Her arms encircled him, and she clung to him. The talisman against her breast warmed with the surging and unfamiliar energies, passing first from him into her, 
and then back and forth in mounting intensity until her lips and body seemed they would burst into flame. In her mind, she heard his voice. We are both wielders of magic, Aramis, born to command the stars. They have lied to you, who say I am evil. I am not. I seek wisdom, truth, and the power and joy that goes with them. Only listen to me. Let me explain why your poor parents died, why I have suffered King Voltric to carry out his conquest, why you and your sisters were pursued. Let me show you the true importance of the three talismans and the threefold scepter of power, and then make up your own mind, your mind so akin to my own. I have called out to you over the leagues and drawn you to me. You came freely. You know you did. You know I love you. Now dare to love me in return. Now, Haramis. Now. Haramis stirred. She lifted her head and gently disengaged herself from his arms. Her body felt strange. Her mind bewildered. What have you done to me? Aramis, you love me. Your body tells me so, even as your heart tries to deny it. No, no! But she was clinging to him again. I am cold, so cold. The flying snow lashed at the window, seeking to penetrate the glass, to reach her, to cover her with its pristine whiteness and quench the last dwindling embers that had awakened and blazed within her. She saw the white lady dying in solitary pain. She saw herself reflected in a mirror of black ice. She saw him. Let us go to your study, she whispered at last. It's much warmer there. I will listen to what you have to say. But that night, alone in her chamber, she remembered her parents and cried herself to sleep. 34. Anija walked slowly but steadily, going gradually uphill alongside the dwindling watercourse. It struck her after a time that she was moving through the very kind of strange woodland she had dreamed of after going over Tass Falls. And, yes, she had dreamed the same dream again last night, only forgotten it. The forest where her mother, the queen, wearing her crown of state and all the royal regalia, walked far ahead, and she... Anagel ran after, trying with all of her strength to catch up. Today, in real life, there was no queen. Her poor mother was dead. And the crown was with Taramis, heiress to the throne, if she still lived. Anagel's heart pounded now with exertion as the trail became steeper. Thank God the terrible goblet trees no longer grew so thickly. But a new kind now became commonplace, having a most horrid appearance that she was careful not to touch or even come close to. These trees were tall and robust, crowned by a heavy head of wiry green foliage. All up and down their smooth trunks were ovoid openings, nearly an L in length, like vertical mouths. These were studded with polished green spikes all around the edges, like teeth, and constantly opened and closed from side to side, as though the tree were breathing. The movement was accompanied by a soft sound, like the murmuring of a breeze, or discordant, chilling music. She knew at once that these trees were carnivores, even worse than the goblets. Their yawning dark mouths sought prey. They only opened and closed and sang as she passed. The trees sensed her, wanted her. Lords of the air, what awful things! Anagel took hold of her amulet as fear gripped her once again, and then a new and terrible realization came stealing over her, and she began to shudder, unable to take another step forward, and felt the flesh crawl on her bare arms. Where was the path? It had disappeared. Only pristine vegetation lay beneath her feet. How long had she been walking off the trail? She had no idea. She had only thought of following the creek. She stood paralyzed with fright, surrounded by the monstrous trees, not knowing which way to turn. White lady, 
she cried impulsively aloud. Help me. The amulet inside her clenched fist had become very warm. When she let it fall free at last, the honey amber glowed brightly, even in the broad daylight. The terrible fang trees hummed and moaned all around her, nearly drowning out the brawling little brook. The leaf. Cast the leaf. What? What did you say? She swung about, seeking the one who had spoken. But there was no one. Lady, is that you? The black trillium leaf. Cast it from you. Let it lead. Her hands shook so that she could hardly open the wallet. Clouds had come over the sun, bringing a gloomy dusk to the canyon. She felt as though she were freezing. The leaf. It crackled as she drew it forth. The entire broad blade was dry now, dun-colored instead of green. Only at the very tip of the stem remained a tiny fleck of gold that glittered even in the deepening shadows. Cast it forth. Rising on tiptoe, she threw the leaf into the air. There was no wind, and yet it soared slowly away, leading her up the creek bank. As though she were sleepwalking, she followed. The leaf drifted along faster. She began to run, uphill, the way ever steeper, the undergrowth thicker, darker. It was only that dancing bit of gold on brown, wafting ahead, drawing her on. She came into a clearing. It was the canyon's head, all framed in moss-grown rock. The stream had its source in a wispy little trickle of water that fell from a tremendous height, blanketing the clearing in thin mist. And beside the waterfall grew a tree. It was the most immense living thing she had ever seen. Beside it, the other forest giants were insignificant, mere straws. Thirty men could have stood shoulder to shoulder in front of this tree without giving the measure of its trunk. It was of the same species as the thorn mawed carnivores back along the trail, but its mighty bowl had only a single opening in between the buttresses of two roots, and this was of the same size as that of its lesser kin. Princess Anagel stood before it, utterly amazed, forgetting her fear. Her gaze lifted, and she saw that its height exceeded that of the cliff from which the water fell. And instead of one leafy head, the tree had three. She approached it, seeing the fanged mouth constantly open and close, open and close, faster and faster. Its breath was a soft roar of a note so deep that it might have escaped ears less keen than hers. And inside the mouth was not darkness, as in the mouths of the smaller trees, but a rich golden glow that was twin to the color of her own amulet. The three-headed monster held her talisman and its breath came faster and faster because it was afraid. Of me, said Princess Anagel. Afraid of me. It was part of the wonder that she knew exactly what to do. At the foot of the little cascade lay piles of dead wood, the remains of trees that had been swept over during the season of flooding. She took up a sound billet, about as long as her arm, but thicker, and walked directly to the gaping mouth between the roots. The glow from the cavity intensified, and her amulet blazed. Calmly, she held the small log in both hands, horizontal in front of her. She studied the rhythm of the opening and closing for a moment, then with one quick movement thrust her arms into the thorny jaws. The mouth began to engulf the wood, and could not. The log was wedged against the cavity walls, propping them open. The tree roared, but Anagel knew that it was voicing fear, not fury. She had let go of the wooden billet, and now the tree exerted its great strength to crush the foreign thing. The log buckled and began to splinter, but for a moment more the mouth was propped open, quite long enough for Anagel to lean forward over the bristling teeth, snatch the thing that lay within, and leap back out of reach before the log broke with a great crack and the mouth snapped tightly shut and remained so. The edges of the bark pursed into a knot, hardly as broad as her two fists. Anagel held a coronet, a C-shaped open tiara of brilliant silvery metal, having six small cusps and three larger. 
It was strangely and beautifully wrought with rokai work scrolling, shells and flowers, and within each of the three larger points was a stylized, grotesque visage. One of the monster faces had an opening beneath it, and she knew what fit there. Withdrawing to the stream side, she sat upon a rock, took off her hat, unfastened the chain of her trillium amulet, and slipped the gold-framed bit of amber off. It went perfectly into the hole at the front of the coronet, and when it was in place, it could not be removed. The fossil flower within the amulet was now completely open, except for a slight curling of the petal edges. Anajo put the coronet on and went back to stand before the tree. It was silent, and its mouth remained tightly closed. Now the talisman is mine, Anajel told it. You guarded the treasure well, but I am the one for whom it was intended. You do not have to be afraid. I will leave you here in peace. She turned away. Strangely, her eyes had filled with tears. She felt a new heavy weight in the pit of her stomach and a sense that something else, something terrible, impended. She thought, I have my talisman, but it is only one of three. What of my sisters? Instantly, the tree and the clearing and the waterfall disappeared. She saw in a flash another place, a scene deep in a swamp overgrown with huge thorn ferns. Cadia! Her sister was crouching, tear-stained and screaming defiance, in the midst of a crowd of armed men, knights of Labernock. She wore no trillium amulet, but she held close against her heart something like a sword, with a pommel that glowed with a throbbing amber light. And in the background stood a tall, hideous being with glaring orange eyes and blood-stained teeth. Before Anagel could draw a breath to cry out at the awful sight, the picture was gone. She saw instead a cozy tower room in some keep, with rich hangings and fur rugs upon the floor, and a table spilling over with stacks of ancient books. A handsome man with snow-white hair, wearing a robe of black and silver, sat on cushions before a fire, with a lovely young dark-haired woman beside him. He kissed the palm of her left hand. In the other she held a wand of bright metal, topped by an open silvery circle, with three folded wings surmounting it. And the woman was Haramus. No, no! Anagel tore the coronet from her brow and dashed it onto the mossy forest floor. No, the visions lied. Brave Cadia in the hands of Labernaki, threatened by Skritek. Wise Haramus, consorting with a foul sorcerer or Agastus. Never, never! If these two were indeed lost, then who was the woman prophesied who would overthrow Labernock and restore Ruenda? Herself? How ridiculous! What a joke! What a cruel, cruel joke! She flung herself on the ground and sobbed as though her heart would break, cringing away from the discarded coronet as though it were truly as loathsome as its name. So this was her talisman, the end of her long quest, the fulfillment of the White Lady's solemn command. The talisman was a liar, a spinner of nightmares worse than any her own craven self could ever concoct. It was nothing but a monster. But in her dream, Queen Calantha had said that her sisters had gone on other roads. It was she, Anagel, who was being washed and readied for... What? Gradually her sobbing eased, her breathing slowed and became more regular, and she fell fast asleep. She woke suddenly an hour later. Had there been a sound? Perhaps one of those mysterious screams? She was unsure. At any rate, she felt much better. She bathed her face in the streamlet, washed her hands, and ate a bit. Then she picked up the coronet and studied it for a long time. The three grotesque faces on it seemed to be smiling slyly. It is a sign, she decided, and a tool. I know one thing it can do, conjure visions. But whether those visions are the embodiment of my own fears or true things, I cannot tell. But I am going to find out. She put it firmly on her head and Imu's hat over it and started back the way she had come. My prince, the puns can go no further. 
the sergeant who had been poling the lead boat up Kavuko stream called out the unwelcome news, whereupon the straggling string of overloaded craft all gathered together in a rocky pool below a stretch of rough water where the creek ran hardly calf-deep. Antar, his knights, and the Blue Voice gathered in one group to confer, while the exhausted soldier boatmen refreshed themselves by sloshing about in the stream, munching some of their meager rations and lying in the shade of the peculiar goblet trees. None of the labor knocking knew the true nature of the goblets, but they had learned well the lesson of avoiding unknown fruits, and so left the offerings of the trees unmolested. From here, we must walk, Antar said. Since the heat is so oppressive, I suggest that we doff all armor, save for our helmets, breastplates, and back pieces. My prince, the sergeant shouted from the opposite side of the stream. I think I have found traces of the fugitive. They all went splashing over, and there, beneath the great drooping fronds of a patch of fodder fern, they found one of the oddly made Wavilo boats. In its bottom was folded neatly a small leather rain cape of Nisimu design. This cape is of the style worn at Travista, the sergeant said. I remember well the stamped decoration about the hood. Such were offered for sale in the market of Lusagira Square. It may belong to the princess. The blue voice pushed forward through the crowd of knights. Give it to me. I will subject it to a test. With the garment held tightly in his bony hands, he threw back his shaven head and closed his eyes. Dark powers, hear me. Reveal to thy suppliant who has worn this cape. He lifted the thing to his nostrils and breathed of it, and then intoned in a very different voice, It has been worn by Imu, servant to the royal family of Ruenda, and Anagil, princess of Ruenda. Zoto's tripes, cried the delighted Serenitar, a true sign of the wench at last. I had begun to think we pursued a phantom. The blue voice opened his eyes, restored his hood, and tossed the cape back into the translucent canoe. The princess had it close to her not more than two hours ago. We must be nearly upon her. It behooves us to move on and waste no more time. Very well, said the prince. Sergeant, assemble your men, and you, my companions, prepare to— A scream came from the grove of goblet trees across the creek. With an oath, the prince whirled about. He saw a single soldier come running down to the shore, yelling and cursing. The sergeant hurried to see what had befallen, followed by the noble party. It ate poor old Gummy, the wild-eyed fellow declared. Swallowed him slick as fogberry jam. Everyone began to shout at once, but the sergeant called for two of his soldiers to take up their weapons, and said to the prince, Let me go and investigate. He returned in a few moments, stone-faced, and reported. It was one of the strange cup-shaped trees, my prince. The man-at-arms, Gomledic, ventured to relieve himself against its trunk, and, according to the witness, four slender arms like great worms issued from the tree's open crown, laid hold of him, and hoisted him aloft. The prince and the knights now accompanied the sergeant deeper into the grove, where the goblet tree stood innocuous as a display in a bizarre jeweler's shop but one tree was guarded by two soldiers, and its upper leaves had now closed in upon themselves, giving the appearance of a large ball. From the interstices of this oozed red blood and bodily fluids, which flowed down the trunk and puddled within the other leaves splayed on the ground. They all regarded the sight with horror and revulsion, but before another word could be said, more shouting broke out among the men left at the creekside. To arms! To arms! Hostile natives approach! The devoured Gomledic was forgotten. Antar, Sir Owanan, and the sergeant led the race back to the water, shouting orders. In moments, soldiers were manhandling the wooden punts out of the stream as fast as they could and piling them up to form an improvised barricade. Knights clapped on their helms and drew their swords while the soldiers armored themselves as best they could and readied their crossbows. Sacks of supplies, discarded clothing, and odd bits of equipment littered the bank, and even drifted slowly downstream. And it was at once very quiet. Blue voice, whispered the prince from behind his overturned boat. 
Have you far seen the foe? A moment, a moment. The sorcerer's minion lay beneath the barricade's end, squashed between Sir Rinitar and a soldier, in an attitude uncongenial to trancing. He pulled himself together. His eye sockets seemed to empty, and he froze. Yes, I see them. Across the stream, lurking among the killer trees, there are twenty. Forty. Dark powers for Fend. So many I can scarcely count. And they be not Wavilo, my prince. These natives are larger and altogether more terrible in aspect. Beyond doubt, the cannibal Glismac. Enough, Antar said. And to the others, my men, have courage. They are oddling savages, for all their fearsome look, and inferior to us. We can yet win the day. Look, Owanin said quietly, the first of them. Six beings stole through the ferny undergrowth and stood poised on the opposite bank, not ten ells distant. They were less humanoid than the Wavilo, and taller than men, and carried long spears pointed with flint. They wore no clothing, but a few had jeweled ornaments, and all wore belts, from which stone maces and other implements of war hung. Their heads were muzzled, and their teeth, especially the two protruding tusks in front, very large and sharp. Deep-set eyes of a burning red were armored about the orbits with shining skin plates. These plates also covered their heads and extended down their shoulders, backs, and upper arms, and were a natural part of their bodies. The three-digit hands and feet had both webs and formidable claws. Only a few scattered plates guarded their bellies, and these, and most of the limbs and face, were clothed in thick, rusty red fur. Scanty fur also grew around the margins of the plates, which were in each individual of a slightly different color and patterning. In truth, the Glismac had a savage beauty about them, as well as an air of supreme confidence. One of the six stepped forward and began a croaking harangue, waving his spear. When he finished, he tossed the weapon with all his strength, and the stone blade sank deeply into the tough wood of the prince's dugout. The other five Glismac cocked their arms. Crossbowmen, Antar said. Missiles away! A hail of iron quarrels shot across the stream. Five of the Glismac fell, screaming hideously. The sixth uttered a trumpeting howl, which was answered by hundreds more, and came bounding over the water. His fellows poured from the goblet forest behind, whooping and screeching, flinging their spears and brandishing their other weapons. Within seconds, the small force of Labernaki was engulfed by the horde. The crossbows became useless at close hand, and soldiers fought with short swords or daggers, while the knights laid about with their great two-handed swords, hacking and hewing, until the sheer press of Glismac bodies toppled them. The sergeant managed to gut two of the monsters before a third came up behind him with open jaws and delivered a fatal bite to his neck. The few soldiers who were not overwhelmed in the first minutes ran for their lives, only to be chased down by the long-legged brutes who clawed their flesh from their bones. The fallen were immediately rent limb from limb, and in the midst of battle a diabolical feast began. Eerie glismac howls drowned out the dying cries of the soldiers. By then, Prince Antar and all of his knights were downed, but, strangely enough, the fiends did not mangle them nor strip off their armor, but rather took away their swords and trussed them hand and foot with rawhide cords, and picking them up like dolls, tossed them clanking and cursing into a great blood-stained pile. Several score of the victorious Glismac now began to dance and chant about the heap of helpless humans, who subsided into hopelessness and began to say their final prayers. Others of the man-eaters set about to gather dry driftwood from along the creek, which they made into a great stack, together with a labernaki punts, and prepared to set it alight. It was evident that the next course of the Glismac feast was to be cooked. God have mercy upon us all, moaned Prince Antar, who lay at the top of the tangled mass of prisoners. And may he damn the sorcerer Oregastus, who sent us to this ignoble death, to the deepest of the ten pits of hell. 
The chanting and the howling of the glismac abruptly broke off. The dancing stopped. Those of the mob who were still finishing off tidbits of raw flesh desisted from their gruesome feeding and stood astonished. Every savage without exception now was motionless, open-mouthed, staring at something that seemed to be approaching from upstream. Antar wriggled his fettered body about and finally gained a position in which he could see for himself who was coming. A woman. She stood on the small creekside path, a dozen ells from the pile of knights and within arm's reach of the nearest glismac. She wore a hunting outfit of sky-blue leather and had a pack on her back, and in one hand carried a broad-brimmed grass hat, and in the other a sapling cut for a walking stick. Her hair was golden and fell below her shoulders in shimmering waves. Resting upon her head was a strangely wrought coronet of shining white metal, with trillium amber inset at the front. Her face was a mask of horror and outrage, and tears were trickling down her cheeks. Prince Antar's heart turned over in his breast. He knew that face and it was the most beautiful he had ever seen, and the only one he had ever loved. It was Princess Anagil herself, come by mischance into the scene of slaughter, and surely the fiends would fall upon her next. But they did not. They shrank back as she walked into their blood-stained midst, and some uttered low grunts, and even whimpers. She looked upon the human bones and torn remnants of clothing and the heap of bound armored knights who now lay frozen in their contemplation of her audacity and peril. What have you done? She demanded of the glismac. Tears still shone on her face, but her voice was steady. There were scattered growls and an uneasy hissing. One individual came forth from among those who had danced. He was taller than the rest, and his belt had golden studs, and a gold sheath enclosed his flint dagger. The scales of his body were richly adorned with painted designs of green and yellow and scarlet. The Glismac chieftain pointed at Anagil's coronet with one bloody claw, and roared a challenging phrase in his own language. I have a right to wear it, the princess said unflinchingly. She dropped the hat and wiped the tears from her eyes with the back of one hand. And I say, you have done a wicked thing. These men were my enemies, not yours. They did you no harm, and yet you massacred them and ate their flesh like beasts. But you are not beasts. You are persons meant to serve the triune God and one another. And what you did was evil. The Glismac chieftain uttered a terrible sound that could only be laughter and then he lifted clawed hands, opened his mouth so that his knife-like teeth shone in the gloomy late afternoon light, and advanced upon the helpless girl. Anagil pointed her walking stick at him and said calmly, Lords of the air, defend me. From out of the overcast and lowering sky came a blue bolt of lightning. It blinded the captive knights, and its thunder pained their ears so greatly that they nearly lost consciousness. When they regained their wits, they saw the princess standing wide-eyed and the glismac chieftain blasted to a smoking cinder. The entire horde of cannibal oddlings fell on their faces from fear and awe. Go away, Anagil said in a high, clear voice. Go away and don't come back. A fierce head or two lifted from the ground. The glismac hesitated. And then they were up and running, the entire mob of them, howling at the top of their lungs, and a few still growling defiance. They crossed the stream and raced into the forest, and were lost from sight, and the princess looked down upon the fuming carcass at her feet with both astonishment and fear. Now Antar cried out, Princess Anagil, we here yet live. Will you set us free? She snapped out of her reverie and came running, and with her small dagger cut the rawhide thongs. The knights sorted themselves out, and the unhurt among them helped the wounded unstrap their armor and go down to the water. Prince Antar, when he had done what he could, went to Anagil and lowered himself to his knees before her. Princess, I have no sword to surrender to you, so I, Antar, crown prince of Labernock, surrender my body and soul. I cannot be your enemy. 
You are noble and good, and those who commanded me to pursue you and put you to death are evil. If you would blast me to death as you did, yon brutish wretch, then that is only the punishment I deserve. But if you will spare me, I will serve you faithfully as your slave for the rest of my days. And I, said Sir Owanan, coming forward and also kneeling, and I, groaned Sir Penipat, who was having his wounds washed. This night and that echoed these two, and the ones who were able-bodied came to kneel, until only Sir Rinitar and two of his henchmen, Anbagar and Turat, stood back. Suddenly the mass of ferns that had concealed Anagel's boat parted, and there, sitting concealed in the craft, was none other than the blue voice, who climbed out, waded the stream, and approached the princess with an ingratiating smile. Great and powerful lady, quoth he, making a profound bow. I am slave to another master who has bound me until eternity, but I vow to you on his honor to serve and follow you as well as I may, and I place my poor powers at your command, if you will condescend to accept me. As the blue voice spoke, he turned to Rinitar, and their eyes met for an instant. And perhaps these three brave knights, who shrink from rescinding their oaths of fealty to Labernock, will join me as I pledge a truce to you. We are humans together, beleaguered in a strange land, and we should not be at odds while so terrible an enemy threatens all of us. I, Rinitar growled, I will pledge a truce, as will my men. Anagel gazed upon the blue voice for a moment, unspeaking, and also studied the three. Then she said, Very well. Rise, prince, and also you men who now deem me your lady. In a few hours it will be nightfall. We have nothing more to fear from the Glismac, but nevertheless we cannot camp in this place of disaster. I will confer with a prince and decide what we are to do. Meanwhile... You must gather up what weapons and supplies you can, and remove your punts from the bonfire stack. But do not tear the woodpile apart. Rather place it on the sad remains of your comrades, and before we quit this spot, we will fire it to their honor. Murmurs of approval met her words. She beckoned for Prince Antar to follow her as she walked away down the bank of the stream, and when they were beyond earshot of the others, said, The tall man in blue is not to be trusted. I know. He is a voice of the abominable sorcerer, or Agastus. We shall have to keep close eye on him as we make our way back. You do intend to return to Rwenda, do you not, my lady? In time, said she. Her blue eyes were solemn and the pupils wide in the shadow. But first I have another duty. The Glismac Horde will surely go now to the Wavilo settlement of Let and attack it. They were on their way when they encountered you. We must hurry there as fast as possible to warn the forest folk and do what we can to help them. Aye, said the prince in admiration, we knights shall guard you with our blades while you call down thunderbolts to slay the devilish Glismac. Anagel drew back from him with a gasp of horror. No. But how then shall we save the Wavilo, lady? We are sixteen men, twenty if you count the three unpledged and the sorcerer's lackey, and some of us are wounded. The Glismac must number in the hundreds. Do you suppose we can counter such a vast army of savages without your magical assistance? I did not know the talisman would kill, she whispered, and there was terror in her eyes. I did not know. Antar took her hand. The tears were starting again. He lifted her calloused, scratched fingers to his lips. Don't worry. Perhaps you can try the powers of the thing as we travel and find gentler means of defense. She drew away impatiently, again thinking only of the task ahead. We shall rest tonight, then press on tomorrow, even until night, so that we reach Let ahead of the Glismac. Travel at night? Antar was nonplussed. Lady, we amateur boatmen cannot possibly navigate the great Mutar by the light of the triple moons. And it may well storm again. A tiny smile curved Anagel's lips. We shall have the services of excellent guides. She went down to the stream bank, still smiling, and called, Friends.
35. Hamel came striding up to Cadia, two of his troopers flanking them with torches. His hand again gripped her hair and pulled her to her knees. He was laughing, and she heard other voices join him. Now you are showing the proper spirit, Crane's daughter. Humbly, on your knees. What game has been played here? His eyes darted about, to the straight-standing sword, and then to that odious blackened pile. One charred, skeletal hand seemed to point to the object of power its owner had coveted. There was a long moment of silence, and then Hamel laughed again, but less assuredly. Several score armed men now had gathered, but all carefully avoided the thing lying on the ground. So, it looks as if the voice told the truth and yet did not believe it himself. Was that the way of it, slut? The general shook Cadia back and forth by that tormenting hold on her hair. He strove to take the talisman, and it was bonded to you, and thus it slew him. He loosened his hold on her and ran a finger back and forth along his lower lip. Katie had heard enough of the general to know that he, brute as he had proved himself to be, was also wily and keener-witted than he looked. Some of the men fell away from the edge of the circle about them, giving way to another officer, a huge man. His ragged cloak had once been as ornate as Hamel's, but he went without a helmet, and there was a dirty bandage about his head, a bristle of gray stubble on cheeks and chin. What now, my general? There was a sharpness in his voice which argued that they might be fellows in a fight, but no shield brothers. Hamel had no chance to answer before a voice from somewhere among the ranks cried, Lash the witch to the sword and into the bog with her. There was an answering hum of assent to that. Then another trooper gave different advice. Turn the Skritek on her. To that there was even firmer agreement. The gathering of men had moved farther away from Cadia, the edges of the crowd melting into the dark where the torch and firelight did not easily reach. It would seem that the import of that blasted body was making itself stronger and more widely felt. Hamel swept the assemblage with a glare, which apparently his men knew only too well, for the murmur ceased, as if a door had been suddenly slammed shut. Then he turned to the big officer. What now, Olsorkin? Why, we obey orders. Always we obey orders. We came to find this. Again his grip on Katie's hair caught her tight enough to make her sway back and forth. Well, we have found it. We have something else, too. He pointed to the talisman. If King Voltric rewards well those who bring one of these royal wenches to him, what kind of gift will he bestow upon those who produce a treasure our Grand Minister of State mightily wishes to own? A treasure? Osorkin accented the word strongly, which has already disposed of one who knows far more than any of us about its dangers. Yes. Hamel's tongue tip ran across his fleshy lips. He dragged Cadia up from her knees, so he had not so far to look down to meet her eyes squarely. I think you will be more truthful with us now. There are ways we know well how to handle those who are all courage and zeal, so that in the end they are only too glad to do our will, even if that means slaying one very near to their heart. He snapped his fingers, and again the crowd of men opened as one of the Skritek slouched forward in answer. Pelin! Hamel made an order of that name. From the back rows of the troops tottered a skeletal figure. Cadia, who had seen the merchant guide in the days of his well-fed and honored life among his fellows, could not recognize him at first. It was a human wreck who fell to his knees, rather than make formal obeisance, and looked up to the general with a face like one belonging to the dead. Hamel leaned forward to gaze intently at the talisman. Now he nodded as if he had been answered with just what he wanted to hear. It is still there. In spite of the transformation the sword had undergone, the snakeskin twist the voice had produced for its handling was still safely looped about it. Helen, tell this stupid brute to take that sword up and put it back on the girl's back, using only the cord. The man gulped as if he found it difficult to speak. Then he voiced a stream of gutturals. The Skritek looked at him, at the sword, 
than at Hamel. Fang jaws opened, and the creature made an answer in his own grumbling speech. Pellin's face was white beneath the grime of swamp travel. Cadia saw that his hands were shaking, and that he put them hastily together in a tight grip. Well, demanded Hamel, after a long moment of silence. Lord General, he will not touch that. The guide nodded toward the sword. He says it is of the vanished ones and holds their force. So? Hamel's expression did not change. He caught the loop of snakeskin, jerking the blade free from the ground. Then he wheeled slowly, as if to make very sure that all men gathered there were perfectly aware of what he was doing. The vanished ones, he commented. We have heard a great deal about these vanished ones since we started plowing through this bog. See you, all of you. Need one wearing the emblem of great labor knock? Be fearful of legends. Osorkin coughed. And what of him? He pointed to the charred remains. It would seem that some legends hold legitimate warnings. Hamel did not even blink but Cadia was very sure at that moment that the general held no liking for his immediate subordinate. Through witnessing the slow indrawing of the soldiers, she was also aware that their general's gesture had banished some of their fear-inspired awe. That one, Hamel nodded to the cinders, was one who played with such magical toys. Perhaps those of his master are safe enough, but this thing here is of a different source. A man who handles certain weapons without hurt grows careless. I think this voice took too much on himself. The general was back at Cadia's side now. His heavy paw on her shoulder spun her around so that she might have fallen again. But she was able to keep her feet as she felt the sword slipped slowly back among the ropes that bound her. Hamel had already turned away. He beckoned to a trooper who stood immediately by the nearest torchman. Leveling his hand, he pointed to the Skritek who had refused his order. That one, we do not need, he commented. The Skritek roared and crouched. An axe with a wicked double head appeared in one scaled fist. The creature's defiant cry was answered by several others of his kind. The soldier Hamel had summoned took a leap forward, his sword up and ready. It appeared that this was not the first time the Labernaki had faced one of their unpleasant allies in combat. As the axe left the claws of the Skritek, it moved with such force and speed that it was but a blur in the uncertain light. But the soldier had already launched himself forward, not to meet the weapon, but in a fighting stance. At the same time, his sword flashed, and there was a spurt of dark blood. The Skritek threw up his head with an ear-splitting bellow, his left leg half-hewn from his body, the forearms with their sharp talons out. One paw perhaps more by luck than intention, caught in the mail on the soldier's shoulder and dragged him down. It did not need his shout of pain and terror to bring his comrade's steel out, nor were the other Skritek long in joining the fight. Labernaki soldiers and Skritek fought and died as the battle whirled around the bonfire. One of the torchmen drove off a monster within claws range of Hamel himself by thrusting the fiery end of the torch he held into the creature's half-open jaws. The melee was fierce while it lasted, but that was not long, for the mob of Skritek faded away into the swamp night, leaving three of their own number dead, two still living. Four soldiers lay unmoving, and a number of others nursed bloody gashes and the like. Osorkin had reached out at the beginning of the embroilment, caught Cadia, and dragged her back toward Hamel's tent, which half collapsed as a guy rope gave way. He himself made no attempt to join in the fight but stood watching. When it was over, he studied Hamel with a brooding look. However, he waited to speak until the general, wiping blood from his sword with a handful of leaves, came close enough so that perhaps only Cadia was also able to hear. Our allies must truly have second thoughts on the matter of service, Osorkin observed dryly. You had that two-tongued packvart. He nodded at Pellin, who had crouched into a ball as close to whatever shelter the tent might offer. Play guide to the last point on the river he knew three or four days back. Since then, we have been guided by the monsters. Now he nodded toward the general area where the Wizgu women lay roped closely together. 
All around us, the swamp boils. Nor have we had any word from our advance scouting party for two days. I say, let us turn back now that we have achieved our goal, and you have the girl and that which she carries. Hamel scowled. There may be more treasure to be found. And what if the oddlings rise? We have taken Wizgu prisoners, and our handling of them has been enough to turn all of their blood against us. And now we have antagonized the Skritek. If we must depend for guides on those who have good reason to hate us, we are fools. Oddlings, slimy devils, have any showed themselves willing to take up arms? No, they are puny cowards, spiritless as barnyard togars. The Wizgu rise? Impossible. They can't and won't fight. Is that not so, worm? Hamel prodded Pelin with his boot toe. Did you not tell us from the beginning that these swamp sulkers are cravens? Pelin raised his head and also his skinny arm as if trying to ward off a blow. It was always true before, Lord General. The Skritek they will fight, but only if the fiends of the Mazy Mire attack them. Between themselves there is no quarreling, nor have they ever raised weapon against any of us humans who entered the swamp. I have heard that an ancient oath was laid upon them, forbidding warfare, and they are pledged to it. Hamel snorted. This girl has managed to find her way about the thorny hell, and the Wizgu have helped her, or she would not have been able to reach this point. With her, and those, he gestured to the other prisoners. With us, the Wizgo will not impede us. The next morning they broke camp and marched upriver, following a faint trail. General Hamel did not speak again to Cadia, although he kept her close by as he listened to reports brought in by flankers and scouts. Thus she first learned in truth that the Labernaki force did not travel alone. Something, or someone, skulked along with them, although the men were never able to get a good look at it. Were they being followed by swamp dwellers who had at last arisen to avenge the murder of their people? Dared she hope for so much? Katie aroused from her state of frozen lethargy to hear a badly bitten and mud-stained soldier say, Gams! I'd swear by Zoto's shield to that. Just his head a grinning from a pole planted by a fern patch. No sign of them monsters, either. Just some blurry little footprints showing in the mud. And this. She held out what Katie recognized as a dart, longer than any she had seen the Nisimu use. Still, the shaft was painted with two tiny bands, one blue and the other yellow. And those she had seen before. Jagan, or at least his hunt sign. Gam, Hamel repeated. His mud-caked fingernails grated across the stubble of beard on his jaw. I saw him take on the Westlinger pirates, two of them with one blow. Well, I am sure he did not die, cheaply. Was he done in by the Skritek? That dart is not Skritek. Oh, Sorkin had taken the thing from the scout. They don't do work as fine as this. What has our lady princess here to say? Hamel inquired of Cadia. Her bearers had rested her bound body on the trail. Do you have some other friend waiting to take a hand in our affairs? He poised his hand to slap her. She could answer him with part truth. I have not seen the like of that before. Oh, Sorkin did not give the general any time to force another answer out of her. She may serve as bait if they do have other weapons to use. Don't waste time mauling her here. Let us get on to some solid land if a fight threatens. We can't put up any show of force floundering around in this demon-cursed mud. Suddenly, a resounding roar came from ahead. Hamel's sword was in his hand instantly, and the soldiers behind bunched about their commander. Skritek, the scout yelled, and from the sound of them, they've got some poor devil on the run. Move along, Hamel ordered. Close up. There's higher ground ahead, and we need firm footing. Once more, the cry of the Skritek sounded. Cadia's ears buzzed, and she was near unconscious from the jouncing as her bearers ran along. Her arms had lost all feeling from the bindings. 
Even if she were free and had talisman in hand, she was not sure she would be able to use it. However, behind the pain, the helplessness, and yes, the fear, she still held grimly to the old core of anger. There must be some way she could strike back, if only the magic paralysis would wear off. They raced ahead, depending on flankers for warning. The land now became dry and fairly open, except for some low-growing vegetation. But at the same time, it had the dire look of that stretch of country Katie had crossed with Jagan earlier. Here and there grew networks of fat, grayish ground vines, with leaves which looked hardly more than shriveled buds and which were surrounded by clouds of insects. Crushed underfoot, the vines gave off a putrid smell. And then they came upon a building. It was not of stone, but rather of that same sleek material which had formed the bowl-like camping place she had shared with Jagan, and the place where she had acquired her talisman. One wall was pierced by a doorway, and recessed on either side was a tall statue in the form of those same sentries which guarded the Forbidden Way. Each Sindona held a sword. Katia blinked smarting eyes. The swords, they were pointless like the ones she now bore on her back. The weapons were outstretched and crossed to forbid entrance. Hamel halted to eye what lay before them. There was an eager note in his voice. By Zoto, the very thing I hope to find. A stronghold of the vanished ones, and probably full of treasure. Captain Loscar, you go and give a tickle to those. He nodded to the statues. The rest of you men, get ready with your arrows. It proved the measure of Hamel's power over his troops, in spite of all the recent disasters, that he was promptly obeyed. A young officer raised his own sword so that it touched that point where the pointless blades of the sentinels crossed. The metal rebounded with a harsh clang. Laskar's weapon flew out of his hand, and he gave an agonized howl and caught at his sword arm, falling to his knees. Arrows! Inside! Hamel snapped. The whistling of the Labernaki war bolts, meant to affright as well as kill, was loud. Into the opening behind the two sentinels they sped. It was dark in there with no hint of what lay beyond. Neither was there any answer to the attack Hamel had ordered. He called to the men who carried Cadia, Wunit Vor, push her beneath the statue's swords. The soldiers slung her, carrying poles and all, through the doorway. When the sentinels remained motionless, Wunit and a dozen men ducked down and followed after. It's safe, my general, Wunit called. We need torches. Brands were quickly kindled and passed through. The interior of the building was featureless, except for a single inner door at the end of a narrow hallway. Above it was carved a great trillium. Wait, I'm coming myself, Hamel said. Grabbing a torch, he stooped and entered. Immediately, all the torches of the Labernaki went out. There were masculine screams, sounds of floundering bodies, and then utter silence. Cadia lay face down, unable to help herself. No daylight penetrated this place. The dark of the open outer door might have been a curtain, although she had felt none such as she fell through. She drew a gasping breath. Oddly enough, that paralysis which had gripped her so strongly now seemed to be receding. She thrashed about like a landed fish, trying to rise. The blackness around her was thick and complete, but she was aware of a lessening of that fear which had walked with her since she had been taken captive. The girl wriggled violently. Suddenly her arms were free at her sides, and the talisman lay loose under her body. She tore the remaining rope from her legs. The surface under her felt clear of any dust or drift from the outer world. Instead it was slippery, and now slanted downward at an ever-increasing angle. She began to slide as she used her numbed arms to lever herself upright. Faster and faster she fell, and then she crashed, still holding the talisman, into an unseen barrier, only to continue her slide in a new direction and crash again. Half-conscious, she clung to the magical sword, until she struck one last barrier, flew through the air, and landed senseless on a level surface. The toe of a boot caught her in the side and woke her. Katia blinked and blinked again. Darkness no longer locked her in. She was in a large room, lit dimly by no discernible source of illumination. 
She's a tough one, General. Three men stood in a close triangle about her. One was Hamel, the other two, Wounded and Vore. The other troops stood sullenly behind them. Katia saw that the Labernaki were bruised and trying not to show fear. She lifted her head. Though her arms were strong again, her hand was not quite able to reach the hilt of the talisman which lay partly beneath her. Do you think she knows the way out of here, sir? Vor asked. That may well be, Hamel replied. At any rate, we can use her to test for more damned man traps as we look the place over. Get her moving. No one touched her. She took hold of the talisman and climbed slowly to her feet, her head aching from the battering it had received. Dully, she wondered why they had not tried to take the sword from her. And then she remembered that they had good reason to fear touching that eerie weapon. The gray light shone upon a kind of indoor courtyard. Before them was a fountain flowing with water. On the other side of the fountain was a staircase leading up. She walked over to it, but darkness hung above, and Cadia could not see where the stairs led. On each step was a footprint glowing red. Hamel showed no hesitation. Onward, he commanded. He set foot squarely on the first print, then began to tremble violently, like one afflicted with marsh fever. White-faced, he staggered back, drew his sword, and brandished it at Cadia. Magic, he croaked. Let her lead the way. He pulled Cadia before him so that it was her foot that touched the print on the next stair. By the trillium, she was going to scream. There shot through her a sensation like a blast of flame. Then the talisman she held echoed the feeling of burning heat, but she could not throw it from her. She heard an astounded cry from Hamel. She had reached the fifth step, beyond his reach, and the glowing footprint awaiting her there abruptly vanished. What she placed foot upon was a circle of silver centered by a black trillium. Hamel did not expect the sudden move that followed. She was free, completely recovered from her injuries and the enchantment, and each step before her was marked with the same enheartening symbol. As her foot fell quickly upon each in turn, new strength built within her. Anger boiled up. Let her but turn and she could kill them all. No, that was the response of a fool. Armed men watched her, some armed with bows and arrows. She had only this talisman, of which she was still unsure. A moment later, she had reached a long room at the head of the stairs. Each wall here was crossed and recrossed by a netting of red light. The chamber was centered by a single block of the strange, pale building material, and there only did another color show. For... Rising as if from a bed of well-tended earth stood a carven image of a tall plant made of silvery metal, a trillium plant. The stalk ended in a single large, tightly closed bud. Hamel had followed warily, his men behind him. Now he stamped forward to look up at the plant, one hand on sword hilt. He might be in the heart of enemy territory with his army whittled away, if there was nothing in his stance to suggest that he did not fully believe in himself and his own power. He glared at Cadia, who stood facing him resolutely with a talisman gripped in one hand. We will go no farther, she said calmly. The general glanced back over his shoulder. He did not speak, but Woonit and Vor moved in quickly on either side of him, swords drawn. I have heard... Hamel's voice was low and charged with hatred, that blood is power. This is certainly a place of power. He gave an order. Drive her over to that altar. They harried her with their blades, forcing her back against the stone from which the flower sprang. Aye. Hamel's voice rang loud now. I'm a man of blood. I have learned to pay with blood for what I want. When you die, princess, you will no longer be bonded to that magical talisman. Oregastus no longer has power here. I do, and I intend to hew off that hand of yours that holds the talisman. And when your life's blood is drained, take it for my own. His sword swung up. Over her loomed the giant flower, 
To Cadia's sight, it seemed to quiver and burst into bloom. Was it a flower or something else? Such as the sentinel? She could not be sure, for around it a dazzling green glow radiated. The truncated sword length of her talisman blazed a vivid green also, sharing the potency of the flower. From the pulsing of the light about her, she was sure some change had come in on the altar, for Wunet and Vor and the soldiers fled back down the stairs, their faces fear-stricken and ghastly. Hamel was dusky with rage. He charged at her. By no knowledge she had ever possessed before, her talisman answered, blocking the general's own blade. It seemed to her that time moved oddly, first as fast as a whirlwind, and then as if leaden weights hobbled both of them. Each time he thrust, she parried. He was thrice her bulk, but he could not beat her down, nor thrust past the invincible guard of her talisman. He howled, throwing back his head and giving voice like an animal. Then, to her complete astonishment, he turned to run heavily down the stairs. Katie steadied herself at the altar. Above her, a huge black trillium bloomed on a silver stalk. She dared now to look up. She raised the talisman, and the three eyes on the pommel opened, facing three greater ones at the center of the altar flower. Now it was as if a window in the strange room had been flung open to the full day's sun. The eyes blazed. They seemed to reach deep into her soul. She herself was no longer of any importance. There was no more Cadia of Ruenda, only the Lady of the Eyes. And then all the glory vanished. What had been a pillar of light on the altar flared and was gone. There was no black trillium. The room was empty except for her and her now dulled talisman. Cadia turned to walk to the stairway. The wall colors were fading. All was a dusty gray. She went down the steps and found an open door, and heard the shouts of men and of others, and the ringing of weaponry outside. As one totally renewed in spirit and body, she leapt forward into what was a full battle. Labernaki were falling with poisoned darts stuck into any exposed part of their bodies. Now from the brush erupted hundreds of wizgu, nimbly dodging arrows with curious, half-hopping, half-dancing steps. There were Skritek, too, laying about at the oddlings. Hamel, his tattered cloak of office shorn from his shoulders, was engaged with three diminutive Wizgu, wielding spears. The general aimed a sweeping sword cut to cut down oddlings, but Cadia sprang forward, barely clearing another body to face him. Always afterward, she would swear that some spirit had possessed her. She nearly dropped the talisman, but with both hands she grasped the dull, truncated blade and swung the hilt up, just as Hamel was about to strike her down. To what you have made yourself, she found breath to shout. Return, man of blood. Hamel twisted. He dropped his sword to raise both hands to his throat. His eyes were aflame. Flame lapped from between his lips, ran down his body. From him came such a cry of torment as made Cadia shudder. The three-lobed burning eye looked upon him with all its power, and he fell heavily to the ground. Like the voice before him, what remained of Hamel was only ashes. From the talisman pommel there now licked another great tongue of flame, which split into streams and menaced the Skritek. They broke away to follow the fleeing Labernaki soldiers. The flame vanished. Lady of the Eyes! Katie looked toward the mass of jubilant, oddling warriors. Jagan! That name seemed to come from some other far-off memory, part of another time. You are safe! But another voice also spoke now, one that silenced even the moans of the wounded. Daughter. Cadia turned back to the Sindona at the door. Above their noble heads was a circling of silver, and within it a familiar face, smiling. White lady, have, have I done what I should? Not yet. Cadia drew a breath which was close to a sob. What, then? Must I carry this? She held out the talisman. To the finish? That is so, the calm voice replied. I am what I have been fashioned for. In part, that was a plea. That too is so. 
she still had so much to learn. What lies ahead? There came no answer. The vision faded, and Katia stood with tears running down her scratched and wounded face. She had been allowed a glimpse of something beyond her understanding that she must even now hunger for, but now all she could do was carry on. She turned then to face the battlefield. The Wizgu stood there with Jagan smiling among them. They raised their small hands in salute. They had forsaken the old ways. They had gathered clan and tribe to a single purpose. It must be her will and cause to unite them. 36. After he had been introduced to the Rimericks and acquainted with their abilities, Prince Antar decided that the party would travel fastest by taking only two wooden punts, Anagel's translucent Wavilo canoe, and a minimum of supplies. Before anyone was allowed to sleep, a new set of harnesses and traces for the Rimericks was braided from caught-up leather military cloaks, and holes were bored in the vessels to link them together. After only five hours sleep, the party was off. Since the Rimericks knew exactly where they were going, there was no need for reins. They pulled the three boats, hitched in line, while still in the narrow stream, and reached the Great Mutar in only three hours. Once in the big river, the animals were able to pull more strongly abreast, while the knights also rowed. Princess Anagel's lightweight canoe trailed the wooden punts in which the men hauled away. And with her rowed Prince Antar, the badly wounded Sir Penipat, and the Blue Voice, who had proved to be a hopelessly inefficient paddler, perhaps bungling his strokes on purpose. Having the sorcerer's acolyte in their boat at least gave Anagel and Antar the opportunity to keep an eye on him. He behaved in an exemplary fashion, sponging Sir Penipat's feverish brow in the boat's stern, while the prince and princess conversed in low tones for hour after hour in the bows. The Rimericks hauled the humans along so swiftly that they found themselves approaching the village of Let just as night fell on that same day, only barely ahead of a second great rainstorm. But not ahead of the Glismac. Lords of the air, no, cried Anagel, as she caught sight of towering clouds of smoke rising against a somber sunset. The boats were still moving along at such a rate that she dared not stand. Use your farsight to scan the scene, voice, the prince commanded. Tell us what has happened. Anagel had gone very pale, and when she spoke it was nearly in a whisper. Wait. Let me try. The blue voice gawked at her in astonishment as she closed her eyes and sat still as a stone. But her lovely face acquired nothing of the repellent, empty-eyed look that accompanied the trance of Oregastus's symbionts. After a few minutes, she said, the Glismac attacked the village from the landward side about an hour ago. I cannot tell if it is the same horde that fell upon your men. There seem to be at least three times as many oddlings as we saw up the Kabuko. They have set many buildings on fire. I see Speaker Sastu Cha, and I will try to bespeak him. The Prince and the Blue Voice waited. Sir Penipat said eagerly, if it is to be a battle, you may count on me to do my part. Even one-eyed, one-legged, and one-armed, I can outfight any of the rest of the lads. You know me, my prince. Indeed I do, Penny. His countenance was sorrowful. But I fear there is little any of us will be able to do if the savages have already overrun Let. Princess Anagel's eyes opened. The speaker thanks us for our kindly intentions, she said dully but the fighting is now hand to hand, and nearly a third of the homes are on fire. He is about to capitulate, as is their usual custom when overwhelmed, and pay a large indemnity of goods to the invaders, who will then withdraw for some weeks. But, Princess, the blue voice protested with a fine air of reproach, you have it in your power to save them, if only you would. Silence, you misbegotten rascal, hissed the prince. How dare you address the lady in that presumptuous way? Anagel stared at the blue voice, eyes wide, and her lip caught between her small white teeth, regarding him as though he were a venomous swamp worm that had just slithered into the boat. But an instant later, she said, He is right. 
I could save the poor Wavilo, if I but had the courage to call down killing force through my talisman. If I could conjure up cold-bloodedly the same hate and revulsion and desire for obliteration that I inadvertently focused upon the Glismac leader at the scene of the massacre. Then do it, the blue voice urged, and save your friends. I... I dare not. She began to weep. The blue voice shrugged and smiled. They are only oddlings. They are rational creatures who do not know any better, she cried. The Glismac are like wicked children and must be punished and taught to do better. But how can the dead learn lessons? While you cavil and shed foolish tears, your friends die. I can't help it. Oh, but you can. She screamed at the top of her lungs. I can't. I don't know how, and my heart is sore pained, and I'm so horribly afraid, and I just can't. She bit off her words as though she had spoken the most appalling blasphemy, and looked so frightened and despairing that Antar was near to smiting the wheedling blue voice with his large fist. But before the prince could act, her face changed yet again, like the flipped page in a picture book, and she calmed and said, Prince Antar? If I go, will you go with me? To let? Now? But seeing that she was deadly serious, he drew himself together and said, Sweet lady, I will accompany you to the trap doors of hell if you but ask it. Anagel nodded. In a strange, soft voice, she said, My friends, stop. The train of three boats slowed, came to a halt, and began to wallow in the choppy water, for there was a gale of wind following them, and the sky behind was piled with black and purple thunderheads. They could hear faint rumblings now. Half a league ahead and on their right, Let sent up a forest of sooty columns that spread out when they reached a certain height to form a black roof above the village. Sir Owanen, Anagel called out to the prince's marshal, who rode in the leading punt. Cut the traces connecting your boat to the Rimericks. As he hastened to obey, she herself severed the line joining her boat to the punt ahead. My friends, swim back to my boat so that I may rehitch you. We are coming. Prince Antar and the others still had not grasped what she was about to do, but as she continued to give commands, her intent became clear. You men? Paddle back to us and take Sir Penipat and the Blue Voice aboard. You in the stern of Sir Owanan's boat, cut yourself free of the second punt. Bring me both connecting lines. They leapt to follow her orders, while she herself took the severed traces from the mouths of her rimericks, and with her small knife poked holes in the tough upper hull on either side of the canoe's stem, passed the leathers through, and tied a large knot in them. The other two lines she fastened to each animal improvising reins. The Rimerick said, Share mighten, and we are ready. From her belt wallet she took the scarlet gourd and swallowed deeply. The animals licked her fingers as the prince looked on in amazement. Sir Penipat had been transferred to the other boat, but the blue voice still remained firmly ensconced in his place in the stern of Anagel's Wavilo canoe. Now he fended off the two wooden punts with the knights in them, so that the three craft drifted quickly apart in the wind. I will remain with you also, princess, the voice shouted. I can be of help. Prince Antar cried, Get out of the boat, you ill-omened knave. He turned about and began to lurch sternward toward the acolyte, moving so violently that the lightweight craft rocked nearly to the gunwales. But it was already too late. Prince Anagel signaled the Rimericks and they surged forward. You men, make for the opposite shore, she called to Sir Owanan. You must not be on the river when the storm strikes. If we do not come tomorrow, then save yourselves as you can. Farewell. The pale canoe rocketed forward with Anagel driving, and soon the two punts were lost to sight. Antar had been thrown into the bottom of the boat by their abrupt start, for a while he simply clung to a thwart, fearful that they would flip over at any moment, and he in his armor would sink like a stone. But they only zipped and splashed through the chop like a low-launched arrow, traveling faster than he would have thought possible. The blue voice was with them to stay, 
crouched in as small an area as possible, with his hood pulled down over his face. Antar could hardly cast him overboard. Muttering to himself, the prince settled down somewhat more comfortably, but he was in a black mood. The princess paid no attention whatsoever to either man. Now it came to pass that Prince Antar became chagrined at the way that the lovely Anagil had ordered him and everyone else about. Not that he faltered for an instant in his devotion to the princess. He was as determined as ever to die for her sake. But she who had seemed so pathetic in the citadel dungeon, so beautiful and doomed, going over the cataract, so like a goddess as she smote the glismac, so young and vulnerable as she battled her inner devils a few minutes earlier, was now the very image of an avenging warrior queen as she urged the Rimericks onward. And something deep within Antar looked askance at this change, and even feared it. Her eyes were tightly shut, and the prince doubted not that she studied visions of the carnage going on in Let, and bespoke the Wavilo that she was speeding to help them, and yet how lovely she was, how graceful, even in her mannish garb, with her hair flying and the magical coronet firm set on her brow. She stood against the darkening sky, where the fires burning in the village now painted the cloud bellies with flickering crimson, and Prince Antar's blood quickened within him, and he desired nothing more than to die for love of her. What was to become of Princess Anagil, and of him? He had rebelled against his father, denounced Labernock, and cast his lot with his beloved, who was vowed to liberate her country. But was such a thing possible, even with the aid of the magical talisman? Oregastus could command the lightning, too, and the blue voice had assured the prince that the sorcerer now had in his possession the talisman of one royal sister, and would soon have the other as well. Anagil would want to return to the citadel, but surely such a course would be futile. Over half of the Labernaki invasion force of ten thousand men was still encamped there, and the rest of the army, which had accompanied General Hamel on his pursuit of Princess Cadia, would soon be returning from the swamp. What chance had Anagil, even with her new powers, against the full might of Labernock and the dark powers of Oregastus? King Voltric was now recovered, and more determined than ever that the three princesses should die. No doubt he would count the defection of the son he despised as a small thing. Certainly the damned wizard would be delighted. Or Agastus might even prevail upon the deranged monarch to take him as his heir. Perhaps that had been the villain scheme all along. With far-seeing Oregastus in power, and Labernock setting out to conquer the rest of the peninsula, would he and Anagil be safe anywhere? Or would they, too, and the handful of faithful companions, be forced to flee to some far distant land where— A movement. Antar snapped out of his brown study and turned about, only to see that the blue voice had left his place and was creeping forward toward him. What do you want? the prince demanded truculently. The gale tore his words from his lips. Only to speak for a moment, my prince— I have just now conferred telepathically with my almighty master, and he has asked me to pass on to you a message of the greatest urgency. I care not for your foul conjurer's latest falsehoods. Get you back where you were. Get back, I say. But the blue voice came on steadily, his skeletal face split with a smile of such blatant insincerity that the prince was first infuriated and then alarmed. But before he could react and draw his sword, the minion was upon him, springing like a lothok upon its prey in careless disregard for the prince's suit of azure armor. In one hand he bore a long, slender poniard, and he thrust it upward at the gorget of sliding plates that guarded Antar's neck. The sharp steel slid within, and had the prince not swayed to one side, he would have had his throat cut. But as it happened, the misericord sliced only into the skin at the side of the neck, before the prince's metal gauntlet grasped the attacker's hand, and the blade was withdrawn. The two men began to thrash wildly in the bottom of the boat. Princess Anagil pulled up the rimericks at once. She watched Antar and the blue voice struggling, and she clung to the gunwales of the rolling and pitching craft, unable to move for fear of causing them to founder. Nor could she call lightning down upon the voice without sinking them all. She was at a loss and could only invoke the White Lady— but no help seemed forthcoming. 
The blue voice was incredibly strong, partaking in some way of his demonic master's dark powers. He had contrived to get on top of the now supine-armored man, one knee on either side of Antar's body, and clutched his long dagger in both bony hands, bringing the point closer and closer to the prince's face in its open helmet. Antar gripped the wrists of the enchanter's acolyte, but even his great strength was not sufficient to halt the poniard's steady descent toward his eyes. Anagel tore the coronet from her head and screamed, Don't! Oh, don't kill him! I will give you the talisman! The blue voice lifted his shaven head. A long scratch extended from one ear to the middle of his brow, and blood flow made of his gaunt face a gory mask. His burning eyes met those of the princess, and he spoke through gritted teeth, the dagger not a finger's breadth above Antar's right eye. Put the coronet upon my head! The voice was that of the sorcerer, or Agastus. No! screamed Prince Antar. He will then kill us both. But Anna Jo was leaning forward, the coronet in her hands, and the boat wallowed from side to side, and the first squall of pebble-hard raindrops pelted the three of them, and momentarily flattened the surging waters. And on either side of the boat rose the two rimericks. Their sleek bodies came up almost slowly, and their great jaws were wide open, so huge they could encompass a man's head. Their long barbed tongues uncoiled like whips. With the delicacy that they had exhibited taking mitten from the soft fingers of the princess, these tongues now curled about the lower arms of the blue voice. The man shrieked. He was held fast. Anagel fell back, still holding the coronet. Antar released his grip upon the voice's wrists at the same time that the animals began to swim toward the stern, their great bodies still half out of the water. The sorcerer's acolyte, still screeching his lungs out, was dragged over the prince, then hoist further into the air to clear the length of the boat. He disappeared into the black water off the stern with a great splash, and the rimerick sounded after him. The rain held temporarily in abeyance. Moments later, the two great grinning heads popped up at the bow, near to Princess Anagel. A small shred of blue cloth hung from one animal's tooth. Oh, friend! Take up the reins. A great storm is nearly upon us. It will sink your boat if we do not take you quickly to land. Are you hurt? The princess asked Antar in great anxiety. I see blood upon your breastplate. It is only a scratch. Once again, you have saved my life, dearest lady. And— To let, then, Anagel cried, shaking the reins. And they were off in a cloud of spume, with the discomfited prince again hanging on for his very life. 37. When the blue voice perished, Oregastus uttered a mighty groan, and came out of his trance bathed in sweat, and sank back into the great chair in his study from which he had surveyed the tactics' failure. It is my fault, mine only the blame, and now there are two talismans out of my reach. And if his researches were correct about the Feast of the Three Moons, then only three days and four nights remained in which he might salvage his great scheme. Because he had been bespoken by his blue voice, Oregastus was able to watch with his mind's eye the struggle between the voice and Prince Antar. The boat appeared to be driven by a person invisible, however, since the princess was still shielded from the sorcerer's preternatural sight by the amulet now inset within her talisman coronet. The blue voice had wanted to postpone his attack upon the prince until they reached dry land, but it had seemed to the sorcerer that a better chance of success obtained if Antar were menaced out in the stormy water, with no friendly wavilo or loyal knights about to give warning or come to the prince's assistance. Oregastus did not tell his assistant that if the worst happened, and the canoe was upset in the river, Antar would have perished together with the blue voice being heavily weighted by his armor, while the Rimericks would surely have rescued Anagel and her talisman. But now Oregastus's agent was dead, and Prince Antar still lived, besotted with the princess, and quite capable of drawing uncertain numbers of Labernaki to his new cause. Alive, he remained a stumbling block of no mean proportion to the sorcerer's own ambitions. Thinking furiously, Oregastus rose from his chair and prowled about his study. 
The snow had stopped, and the damned triple moons turned the fastness of Mount Brom into a scene of breathtaking silvery beauty. Princess Haramus had retired. Their conversation this day had been most satisfactory. She now seemed to accept his version of the Labernaki invasion, which thrust responsibility for the atrocities upon King Voltric and General Hamel, with himself as only a reluctant confederate. Almost everything he had managed to explain away or justify. Fortunately, Haramis had not fought to scry Princess Cadia during that sister's confrontation with the late General Hamel. Oregastus judged that any scrying of either sister that Haramis might now attempt would be unlikely to harm his cause. Because whether she admitted it or not, Princess Haramis was in love with him. This emotion the sorcerer was most disinclined to scrutinize. Of course it was impossible that he himself would fall in love with her. And yet some snickering small demon deep within his soul warned him to be on guard. He had not lied to Haramis when he told her he had been celibate. He would have to take great care. His mind was invulnerable to her, but his body certainly was not. When they two had set each other afire, the brief joy had exceeded anything he had ever known before. And it had frightened him to the core of his being. Sexual love was traditionally forbidden to the wielders of magic, and for good reason. It distracted one from great goals, blinded objectivity, sapped the will, and drained away energies that must be hoarded and concentrated if one would become truly powerful. But he needed her, and not only for the talisman she owned. She was the magical partner he had searched for through long years, infinitely superior to the toadying voices. She held the key to the scepter of power that even the vanished ones had feared. And so he would use Haramis, share with her, even take pleasure in her. But he must ever be on guard, not to love her. Tomorrow he would dazzle the princess with more ancient devices, then wring her compassion by telling her more of his life story, if she still did not succumb, as was possible in such a strong-minded young woman. Then would come the delicate loosening of the snare, so that it could be tightened again once and for all, at the crowning moment. Oregastus left off his pacing, and his face relaxed into a smile. He returned again to his chair, and, sitting, passed into a star-eyed trance, and bespoke his single remaining acolyte at Rwanda Citadel. My green voice! I hear, almighty master! Have you found aught new among the books in the Citadel Library? A number of references that may be of import, master. An ancient history of Rwanda speaks of a belief among the early human settlers that they lived in the Age of the Trillium, and this first age's ending and the beginning of the new would be signaled by a notable disaster, and events would culminate on a feast of the three moons when the sky Trillium would manifest itself. One presumes some kind of unusual astronomical event is being described. No doubt. That is most interesting and confirms one of my own theories. Go on. In a book purporting to describe the magical practices of the Wizgu, was given a rough translation of a certain chant. I will quote it. One, two, three, three in one. One, the crown of the misbegotten, wisdom gift, thought magnifier. Two, the sword of the eyes, dealing justice and mercy. Three, the wand of the wings, key and unifier. Three, two, one, one in three. Come, Trillium, come, Almighty. Apparently the Wizgu sing the chant at their own triple moon festival each year, without knowing its exact significance. I can guess its significance, Oregastus said tersely. Again, you have found material that helps to confirm my own researches. Well done. And is there more? Master, one last finding, of, of inauspicious portent. Say on. It concerns the so-called threefold scepter of power, 
which we have agreed is the combination of the talismans. In a moldering chest, we chanced some days ago to find a scroll that was near illegible. Only today was the vellum carefully steamed open. I realized at once that the document was written in Tuzumeni, the language of your own land. That is most unusual. Hardly any folk of the peninsula even know of my country's existence. Go on. Most of the scroll is indecipherable, but a portion mentioning a so-called Great Scepter can be read. It says, The Great Scepter that was broken and hidden by the ones gone away will reappear and shake the roots of the world, making the old new and causing a great star to fall. I see. Oregastus did not speak for some moments. Then he said, almost lightly, There are millions of stars in the sky, my voice. Yes, almighty master. How has King Voltric reacted to news of Prince Antar's perfidy? He fell into a rage when he heard that his son had pledged his sword and heart to Princess Anagel. But in spite of your wishes, he would not agree to disown the prince immediately. Antar is popular among the common soldiers because of his good nature and physical prowess, and he has numerous noble adherents among the relatives of his late mother. His Majesty wants to postpone the disinheritance and deposition of the prince until the return to the citadel of General Hamel's force, which will increase the number of men loyal to the throne. Our king is acting wisely in so doing. And Orgastus added to himself, more wise than I, and I am spared making another great blunder. Dark powers, what has gotten into me that I should miscalculate so grossly? But the powers declined to enlighten him, and he said to the voice, I fear you will now have to give the king more bad news. Hamel is dead. His army is mostly intact, however, and now under the command of Lord Osorkin. You need give Voltric no details, say that the situation is as yet unclear, but the mission of capturing Princess Cadia and her talisman has unfortunately failed, even as that mounted against Princess Anagel. Master! And both my red voice and my blue voice are dead. May one ask how my brethren and the Lord General perished? You may tell King Voltric that both the Red Voice and General Hamel died during a bungled attempt at forcing Cadia to surrender her talisman. The device was magically bonded to her, and it slew the pair when they tried to take hold of it. You must tell the king that Princess Cadia escaped, but say that she fled into the deep swamp and will be no longer a threat to Labernock. And shall I also tell His Majesty the fate of the Blue Voice? Say nothing. For your own information, the Blue Voice attempted to overcome Prince Antar while the two were on a boat. The voice failed and was drowned. Alas! Blue was the bravest of us, and Red the shrewdest manipulator. But you are the most intelligent, my Green Voice, and to you remains the most ticklish of tasks. Keeping King Voltric from doing anything irremediably foolish until I can return to the Citadel. Lord Osorkin is leading his force back at double time. With the river flowing faster from storms already taking place in the mountains, his boats should arrive within three days. You may tell the king that. The monsoon winds have already brought the first rains to the Citadel region as well, Master. Soon the land trails and waterways through this wretched kingdom will be nigh impassable. Because of a certain restlessness among Ruendians in the outlying regions, King Voltric has decided that his entire force will remain here during the rainy season. He and his staff have already worked out plans to quarter half of the army in various Ruendian manors and villages, and the other half on Citadel Knoll. That is wise. And another contingency I should have foreseen myself and advised the king on. I wish you to continue, my voice, to deplore Prince Antar's treachery to the king at every opportunity, 
urge his majesty to disown the prince as soon as the loyal officers arrive. I need not stress the point that if anything should happen to Voltric, my own plans would be in the deepest jeopardy. I appreciate that, master. I will do my best to counsel the king. But he grows increasingly uneasy with the approach of the Three Moons' feast. Certain Ruendian servants in the citadel have slyly made known to his majesty the dire prophecies concerning this event. He would like to return to Labernock. He must not leave the citadel. He would be caught on the trade route by the rains. Master, I have told him this. But even so, he thinks this citadel is a place of ill omen, being so ancient and so pervaded with Ruendian magic. Nonsense. Reassure him. He knows that my own dark powers, those that brought him victory, are superior. And I will be with him myself before the Triple Moons can join. Master, but how? It is an eight-day journey from your tower to the Citadel, even during fair weather. Never mind how I shall do it. Only expect me before this moon feast, and tell King Voltric that I am coming, and that all will yet be well. Almighty Master, I will reassure him, and make light of the doleful happenings, and he will greet you, and be eager to follow your counsel. Excellent. Farewell, my green voice. Master, farewell. When the vision of his acolyte faded, the sorcerer sat with his head in his hands for some time. Then he came to himself, a grim expression hardening his features. Everything will be well. First I shall consult the ice mirror to describe Princess Cadia, and then I shall make sure of Haramus. On the next evening, upon returning to her chamber after having supped with Oregastus, Haramus found a gift awaiting her, a large flat package wrapped in black cloth and tied with a silver cord, together with a note from him. My dearest one, tomorrow I would show you my most precious possession the ice mirror with which I can scrutinize the farthest reaches of the world. I have showed it to no other human being. In order not to offend the dark powers who cause the mirror to operate, I ask you to accompany me, attired in the vestments within this package, which I myself have made especially for you, daring to hope that you have come to share my own delight in these occult mysteries, as well as some small regard for the one who would lay them at your feet in company with his own heart. If I presume, dearest princess, and you would rather leave here early on the morrow, then forgive the boldness of this note, and excuse the foolish one who has been alone so long, waiting for you, never knowing love, until now. I am ever thine, with the most profound respect, or Augustus. Haramis was uneasy at the letter's overly intimate tone, does he think that I am bewitched by him, ready to hand him my heart on a platter? Am I a peasant girl, to become the slave of the first man who touches me? Or does he think me dazzled by all the ancient devices he has collected? Haramis considered the things he had so far shown her. Who knows what those machines might be capable of? They did not look at all like toys to me, and that one he particularly fancied with the look of a crossbow stock about it, had a distinctly sinister aura. On the other hand, perhaps he is not quite the villain I believed him to be. Poor man, what a horrible childhood. Of course his support of King Voltric's invasion is inexcusable, but I suppose he could not have directly opposed the monarch's madness without being driven away from Labernock, and he knew that his destiny lay not in his own distant homeland, but here— in these very mountains, where the cavern of black ice called out to him and surrendered to him its treasures. Had I been in his position, she wondered, what would I have done? Would I have been able to comport myself more cleverly and ethically? Would I have declined to become the court sorcerer of a corrupt ruler, if it meant ignoring the summons of my greater destiny? She opened the package and began to examine the vestments that were alleged to make one acceptable to the dark powers. Once she had seen them, she could not resist putting them on, just to see how she would look. 
There was an underrobe of some fur-lined black material, and matching boots. Over this went a robe of silvery mesh with panels of a gleaming black, very cold to the touch. There was also a black cloak, lined in silver, with an ornate clasp and the star motif on the back. Finally, she took up a most awesome headpiece that she hesitated long minutes before donning. This was a silver mask that fitted closely to the front of her head and beneath her chin, leaving the lower face uncovered. Around its perimeter, beginning just above her shoulders, were sharp-pointed rays, very tall at the crown, that haloed her head with a great shining star, leaving her long black hair falling free behind. The mask was not metal, but some softer material, resembling silvered leather. There were also matching gloves with long cuffs. Fully dressed at last in these garments, Haramis felt an urgent desire to tear the things off, flee from the room, and cry out for her lammergeier to carry her away. Her talisman, which hung at her breast as always, had become cold as ice, and the amber without luster. "'What am I doing?' she asked herself. "'This garb feels strange.' The devices he has shown me thus far are not magic, I am sure of that, but there is something about this clothing. Do the dark powers he speaks of truly exist? He obviously believes in them, and whatever they may be, something gives him abilities beyond those of ordinary men. He might very well be able to rule the world, in time, as is his ambition. Is this why I am so strangely attracted to him? He does possess power, whatever its source, but what kind of power? Is it anything I can learn and use? A spasm of dread shot through her. She lifted the three-winged circle, fixed her eyes on the area within the circle, and said, White Lady, answer me. For a long time nothing happened. Then she thought to take off the silvery gauntlets, whereupon the wand warmed in her bare hands and the trillium amber pulsed with a dim glow when she called. Slowly the pearly mist gathered within the circle, and in it the ravaged face of the archimage appeared, resting upon a pillow. She looked up, obviously in pain. Her eyes, dark slits with tears slowly trickling from them, regarded Haramis clad in the garments Oregastus had given her. So soon. The voice was faint as a zephyr rippling a field of flowers. Has he won you over so easily? But no. I misjudge you, dear child. I see that you have not chosen his way as yet. Of course I haven't. Haramis's anxiety over the white lady's appearance faded into irritation. The old woman's tone had been that of an adult chiding a misbehaving child. Haramis had not called the Archimage because of guilt. She had done nothing wrong, nor was she ashamed. I came here because I was invited, the princess said, with cool courtesy, and because I wondered whether anyone at all knew the truth about Oregastus. I came to see for myself what he was, and to search out his weaknesses, as you yourself bade me. It is true that such knowledge may prove useful, the Archimage said gently. But... Is it wise to remain under his roof? I am in no danger here, Aramis broke in heedlessly. My lammergeier is free to carry me off at any time. Oregastus cannot steal my talisman. He treats me with courtesy. More than courtesy. Aramis flushed behind the silvery mask. Yes, she admitted. I can see that you are intrigued, Aramis fascinated both by the man and by his power, and you think you know a great secret about the devices of the vanished ones that Oregastus does not suspect, a secret that will make him vulnerable. Yes, Aramis said. That is, after all, why I came here, to search for knowledge. There is a great deal to be learned here, and the more I learn, the more questions arise about Rwenda and its magic but I am learning, and all will come right. I am certain of it. Yes, all will come right. But you must come to me soon, and hear my vision. It differs greatly from that of Orgastus. And to some people it would seem less glorious. 
But you must make up your own mind. Between my path and that of Oregastus and his ilk there is a great gulf. You should know both ways before making your choice. Yes, Aramis agreed. I shall come to you soon. Do not wait too long. The aged face faded. The circle was empty. Aramis let the talisman fall on its chain. Then she went to the tall mirror in the bath chamber and looked upon the unfamiliar figure reflected there. Black and silver, the eyes unreadable, the figure tall and imposing, and, yes, frightening. She turned away from the mirror and began to take off the dark vestments, but she knew she would put them on again tomorrow and go with him to the cavern of black ice. 38. Having been warned through the speech without words of the boat's imminent arrival, Speaker Sastu Cha and a delegation of village elders met Princess Anagel and Prince Antar at the riverside landing, not too far distant from the scene of fighting. The Wavilo led the two humans into the shelter of a nearby storehouse, since the rain was now coming down in torrents. It will put out the house fires, the Speaker of Let remarked, but the Glismac warriors will not be deterred. We have already received a deputation of them demanding the ransom, and we agreed to pay. This one fears, Princess Anagel, that you have come too late. She did not speak, only sat down wearily on a bale of goods, still wearing Imu's hat and her rain cape, which she had assumed when they landed. Since she was apparently irresolute, the prince stepped forward. You may remember me. I am Antar, Crown Prince of Labernock, whom you harried from your town a few days ago. I am now the servant of this great lady, who twice saved my life, and so are those of my men who yet live. We have come here at great risk to our lives in order to help you. Before you surrender to your foes, you might let us explain what manner of assistance we are prepared to offer. Say on said Sastu Cha, in his deep, inhuman voice. But you should know that the invading Glismac number over a thousand, and some one-third of our fighters have been captured, and some have already been eaten, and we can fight no more this night. That should not be necessary, said the prince. He took Anagel by the hand and gently bade her rise. Then he untied the rain cape and removed it and took off her hat. At the sight of the talisman the Wavilo were all dumbfounded, and one grizzled elder burst into oily tears. "'The three-headed monster!' he exclaimed, also speaking the human language. "'Praise be to the flower! She has taken it from the tree!' "'And through it,' the prince added, "'slain the leader of a mighty Glismac horde, and routed its warriors, through calling down lightning from the sky.' Sastu Cha asked Anagel, Is this true? It is, said she. A new light had come into her eyes, and new strength into her tired body. The trillium amber glowed in the white metal of the coronet, and the open black flower within was plain to see. You will blast the flesh-eating fiends to charcoal? asked the tear-stained oldster eagerly. Take me to the glismac, Anagel said and you shall see what I will do. At another quay on the far side of the village, where a narrow channel separated Let from the mainland, an enormous fleet of crudely made glismac canoes had assembled to accept the booty. By the time Anagel arrived, mountains of food sacks and heaps of other riches had been gathered together by the defeated villagers and were being inspected by the glismac chief, Haksa Omu, and his underlings. A hundred or so of the Glismac host were gathered on the pier, heavily armed and smirking with blood-stained fangs, oblivious to the pouring rain. A few of the victors prowled the still-smoking alleys in the vicinity, seeking the scorched bodies that they claimed as the rightful spoils of war. Others manned the canoes, while the vast majority of the Glismac army had regrouped on the mainland, awaiting the dividing of the loot. Speaker Sastu Cha addressed the Glismac chief in the aboriginal dialect. There was a brief spell of wrangling, and then Anajo was led forward. 
she removed her hat. The amber in her coronet lit up the rain-lashed dockside like a signal beacon, and at the sight of the talisman, all of the glismac voiced a deafening howl of defiance. Be silent, Anna Jo commanded, and the fierce folk subsided. Then she began to address them in her own language, but Antar doubted not that her words were intelligible to all of those assembled. She said, You know who I am. Your brethren of the Kovuko Valley have bespoken you over the leagues, telling what I have done. The talisman is mine, and since you are all people of the flower, you know that I must be one of the three petals of the living trillium. I am indeed, and I intend to bring peace to all this land. Her words were drowned by a great chorus of roars and hisses, but she lifted her arm, and a mighty bolt of lightning slashed across the sky above, and the simultaneous blast of thunder stunned all the glismac to silence. You glismac are poor. Your wivilo cousins are rich. You rob and kill them because you have done so from time immemorial, and you also eat their flesh because this is the custom handed down from your cruel ancestors. But I tell you that you will do so no longer. A new day has come. The old ways are ended and will not come again. Watching and listening to her, Antar felt a sudden thrill of terror. Before his very eyes, the slender, lovely young girl was changing. She grew taller, moment by moment. Her garments melted away, and she was clothed in a robe of bright lightnings, red and blue and dazzling white. Her stature exceeded the height of the nearby warehouses. She towered into the stormy sky, arms stretched wide, her hair on fire, the amber at her brow as incandescent as a small sun, her voice like the sounding of a thousand trumpets. I will have peace between the Glismac and Wavilo, peace between your race and humankind. Good things will be shared. The children of the Glismac will not make a profession of war as their fathers did, but will learn to work. No person will kill another under pain of my wrath, nor will you eat one another's flesh. As the apparition had grown, the Glismac cried out more and more, and now they were affrighted to the pits of their savage souls. Those in the boats covered their eyes and cowered, and those on the dock and on the opposite shore fell on their faces, groveling. Only the chief, Haksa Omu, still stood upright, his glaring eyes starting out of their sockets and his great jaws agape. The goods on this dock will not be taken, Anagel declared. The Glismac will withdraw empty-handed and remain in their home places until the dry season, pondering my words. If any Glismac force dares to emerge and make war, we will pour our wrath upon it. Three great thunderclaps hammered the air in quick succession, and the disobedient warriors will not live to see the good things that will be given to those Glismac who obey my commands. The towering giantess now had three heads, and each one was crowned with a trillium. We speak now to Haksa Omu, chief of the Glismac. Do you hear, wretched one? The leader uttered a small, whimpering phrase. Prince Antar could see that he was shaking from his plated head to his taloned feet. Will you take your people away and do as I have commanded? The feeble reply could only have been affirmative. Will you wait in peace for me to come again? Again affirmative. Then go! There was a final detonation that blinded and deafened all the spectators, and then the apparition was gone, and so was Anagel. Haksa Omu uttered a quick word, and he and every one of his folk remaining in Let went scrambling pell-mell into the canoes, which set out with frantic haste for the shore. The Glismac then abandoned their boats and scurried away into the night. Out from behind a stack of fine furniture came small Princess Anagel, dressed again in her hunting garb, and with her wet blonde hair straggling down her cheeks. She smiled up at the Wavilo elders and the prince, who hailed her. Powerful lady, the speaker exclaimed, bowing profoundly. You have indeed saved us as you said you would. Forgive this lowly one. 
for doubting you. You did it, Antar cried, and without killing a one of them. I was stupid not to have thought of the way sooner, she said calmly. The Glismak are like children. You do not argue and attempt to use sweet reason with children, especially when they are in a willful and murderous mood. Unfortunately, all you can really do under such circumstances is frighten them into behaving. Then, later, they can be reasoned with and educated. It is so, Sastu Cha nodded his head. Any parent knows it. I could not have killed them, Anagil admitted in a much lower voice, so that only Antar and the speaker could hear. But it was not necessary. It seems that all kinds of thoughts can be made manifest through the talisman. And so, as the Glismak fled, I told them that they would be my people, and I would love them. So will we also be yours, said the speaker. And this one declares to you, conquering princess, that we are now your debtors, and our honor demands that we repay you for the unprecedented thing you have accomplished here tonight. All of the other Wavilos standing about joined their voices to that of the speaker, for even the ones who did not know the language of the princess somehow understood what had been said. Anaja lowered her eyes for a moment. The rain still fell, but not hard, and to the southwest the sky showed stars. There would still be a few clear days before the Feast of the Three Moons. Dear friends, the princess said, your Glismak foes were grown-up children, but I now must face enemies who are fully mature, not only in the ways of war, but also in the spinning of evil enchantments. They would not flinch before my silly horror show, nor be moved by my profession of love. I was sent on my quest by the White Lady, whom we all revere. Long ago, at the time of my birth and that of my two sisters, she said that we three petals of the living trillium faced a terrible destiny. But she also said that all would be well. Throughout most of my quest I could not believe that this last was possible. But now... I am willing to trust. She took one of Antar's hands and drew him close to her. Here is Labernock's next rightful king. He is a good man. In Ruenda Citadel is his wicked father, Voltric. I shall set out for the Citadel at dawn tomorrow, and there I will cast King Voltric down from the Ruendian throne he seized. Sastu Cha, if you and your people would truly repay me, then accompany and defend me as I regain my kingdom. We have some five hundred surviving warriors, princess, and they will go where you bid them. Our war chief, Lamamu Ko, was slightly wounded and rests in hospital, but he will be eager to pledge himself to you tomorrow. Anything that you desire of us, you may have. Anagil said, Prince Antar will be in command of those who follow me. I thank you and your people with all my heart for rallying to my cause, but I must warn you that my enemies are powerful. So is the talisman you wear, said Sastu Cha. The princess sighed. She took the coronet off her head, opened the front of her tunic, and slid the little tiara inside. For the rest of this night, I will let it rest. And so must I, for I am weary beyond telling. You and your prince must accept my hospitality, the speaker said at once, and the other Wavilo elders smiled and bowed, and with many a gesture and word urged Anagil and Antar to come along. So they went off down the street of black and steaming ruins into the untouched part of the village, and after a while the clouds passed on and the three moons shone down and were reflected on the quiet river. As she undressed and lay down to sleep in the room of the speaker's oldest child, who had given up her bed joyfully to the savior of Let, Anagil could not escape the feeling that someone was watching her. Arising, she looked out the windows, into the closet, and even under the bed, but no one was there. And then she saw the talisman's light throbbing beneath the clothes she had piled on top of it. Reluctantly, she took the coronet up. She did not want to put it on, had she not done enough for one day? What if another dreadful vision should come to her, spoiling the sleep she needed so desperately? 
put it on. Oh, oh, Lothok Dung, the princess cried petulantly. Sitting on the edge of the beautiful Rwendian-style bed, she placed the coronet lightly on her hair. Katie, she cried, and she nearly fainted with happiness, for there in the vision was her sister, her eyes dancing and a great smile upon her dirty face. She sat by a campfire with large numbers of grinning whizgu gathered round, and in her lap was a glowing thing, like a blunt sword, with a pommel of three dark balls conjoined, and at their center was the shining amber of a trillium amulet. Well, it's about time you responded to me, Katia said with some irritation. You've been so involved with yourself that you paid no attention whatever to my bespeaking. And I never thought to hear such words from your mouth, either. Katie, Katie! Anna Jo was laughing and weeping at the same time. You are alive and safe! Her sister flourished the glowing thing. Thanks to the three-lobed burning eye, my talisman. I saw you... Anna Jo hesitated. My own talisman vouchsafed me a vision showing you the captive of General Hamill. Katie's face became sober. They took me, a band of scouts of Hamel's force, not long after I secured my talisman. I had yet little idea of what this— she held up the sword— was capable of doing. The red voice of Oregastus learned first, to his death. After that, no one dared try to take it away, but Hamel hoped to force me to give it up. There were Wisgu women under his power he could use to coerce me. Oh, Katie, how monstrous. Katie was frowning now. There is nothing merciful about the war we fight now, sister mine. Have you not yet learned that for yourself? There is power in this. She glanced at the pointless sword she held. But power is a burden. One must use it sparingly, Anagel, and only with a clean mind. Even anger can serve, but it must be controlled. That is a part of wisdom which I have gained. Then your talisman, Anaja whispered, changed you, as mine changed me from a whimpering craven. My talisman gave me power which I must learn to temper with justice. Hamel, and those of the Skritek who stood to be his monstrous weapons, they were judged and shall not walk these ways again for even a sword of mercy such as I now bear can deal death. I I also used my talisman to kill, said Anagel haltingly, but only once, and then by accident. I could not possibly do it again. I could, Princess Cadia said very quietly, if it again became necessary. And it may. There is still a remnant of Hamel's force heading back toward the citadel. But meanwhile, the Wizgu and the Nisimu gather— there is a small army which grows hourly. To me they have turned for leadership. May the talisman grant that I serve them as well as they would serve us. Would they help us to regain our kingdom? They say that they will. The Wizgus seem so timid and frail when you meet them at the Trevista Fair, but they are really brave little things, and stronger than they appear. They can travel very speedily in boats pulled by a kind of giant pelric. Anagel laughed. I know. I have become a blood sister to such creatures myself, and driven their boats. Cadia smiled. So I saw. And tomorrow you will set out with your own army toward the citadel, and your princely sweetheart is your new general. Anagel flushed and said crossly, He is not my sweetheart, but he is a noble and loyal man, and he has declared himself my slave forever. To this Cadia said nothing but only smiled. Anagel now had thought of a more important matter. Katie, besides my sight of you captured, I had another awful vision. My talisman showed me Haramis with Oregastus, and she seemed to be bewitched by him. Katie became deadly serious. There is more than enchantment at work between those two. Annie, I envisioned Haramis myself and I greatly fear that our sister has fallen in love with the foul sorcerer, or perhaps fallen in love with the power he has offered to share with her. It's not possible. Yes, it is, Katia stated, her face grim. I bespoke the white lady through my talisman tonight. 
The Archimage is very close to death, and wishes Haramis to attend her. But Haramis is determined to remain with the Enchanter. I tried to bespeak Hera, but she did not answer me. You might try to reach her, but do not be surprised if she will not talk to you either. Persons who are deeply in love have room in their minds only for one person. This is dreadful. The poor white lady, and our sister. If she has been seduced by Orogastus, then her talisman may be under his control. What can we do? Nothing at all. The Archimage has accomplished the task she set for herself. We three have our talismans. Still, we are free spirits, you and I and Haramis, and must make our own choices. In a voice trembling with foreboding, Anagel said, You... You know that all three talismans must come together if they are to work their great magic properly, and there is a potential in them for evil, as well as good. Yes, so I learned from one I met on my quest. A servant of the Vanished Ones, I believe. Vanished Ones? But how? It is a long story that will have to wait. Rest now, my brave little sister, and so will I. We will meet soon at the Citadel. After the vision of Cadia faded, Anagel tried to bespeak Haramis. She saw a vision of her sister asleep. But as Cadia had predicted, Haramis did not hear the mental call, being totally wrapped in a dream of Orogastus. Anagel removed her coronet. Its light had dimmed. I shall never be able to sleep, she said to herself. But then she thought to touch the silvery tiara and ask it to grant her rest and a moment later fell softly into slumber. In the morning, she and Antar and a great fleet of Wavilo warriors went to fetch the group of knights and camped across the river. Then they sped up the great Mutar to Tass Falls, where they discovered that the rest of the Labernaki force had abandoned their camp, ignoring the prince's earlier order. A third great storm was threatening, as Anagel and Antar and their people paused at the foot of the cascade and discussed what they would do. The princess used her talisman to summon a vision of Tass Town, and the place was nearly deserted. All of the Labernaki flatboats of the prince's search party, as well as those of the garrison, had departed for the citadel in anticipation of the approaching monsoon. There would be no foemen waiting at the top of the waterfall, but there would be no large watercraft capable of transporting Anagel's Wavilo army to the citadel up there, either. We will ascend on the log lift, Prince Antar said. It will easily carry the Wavilo canoes if we make many trips. At the top, we will have to wait until the big tempest subsides, and then paddle up Lake Wum to the mouth of the lower Mutar. No, Prince. The Wavilo war chief named Lumamu Ko stepped forward. There is a much better way to travel up the lake, and we will not have to await the end of the storm. He told Antar what was in his mind. Even though he was a man of stout heart, the prince blanched. Such a thing is possible? Princess Anagel asked, overawed. Even humans have done it, Lamamuko said loftily. There is a certain peril, of course, but if we win through, we could be at Rwenda Citadel in only a few hours. Then we will do it the princess decided. The first raindrops began to patter down on the little army. The Wavilo took no notice. They were equally at ease in sun or shower. The princess called out to the knights, My human friends, pack up your armor for now, since you will not need it for some time, and then we will be on our way. We will go to the vicinity of the citadel and secrete ourselves in the mire nearby. From there, we will summon all the fugitive nobility and common people of Rwenda who fled into the swamp to join us in retaking our country. My sister, Princess Cadia, is likewise speeding to the citadel, together with a large army of Wizgu fighters. If God wills, we will be ready to engage the foe on the Feast of Three Moons. Anagel put on Imu's broad-brimmed hat to keep the mounting rain out of her eyes, and then was the first to mount the log lift. Later on that same day, a pathetic, starving creature paddled into storm-bound Let on a rickety reed raft, and then fell into a swoon. 
the people of the village recognized her as being of the folk, and hence kin, and agreed that she must be given aid. When she came to her senses the following day, and asked after Princess Anagel, the Wavilo were astonished. The great lady is rushing on her way to her own citadel, said the forest folk, with her magical talisman on her brow, and an army of our people at her command. Our warriors have bespoken to us that they ride up the lake on the wings of the tempest, borne on large log rafts with sails widespread to run with the wind. But why might a wretch such as you ask after her? Wretch, 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 shouted Imu. Because she needs me, that's why. And she made such an outcry and commotion that they agreed at last to let her take a canoe when the storm abated, with three strong Wavilo youths to paddle. And thus Imu went off in pursuit of her princess. 39. Oragastus and Haramus went together to the cavern of black ice. She was eager to learn whether his vaunted ice mirror was truly magical, or only another ancient device, as she suspected. Outside the frost-covered door, as he was about to deliver his incantation to the dark powers, he chanced to look down upon her, and saw her bright blue eyes shining wide in the silver-masked face, her lips softly parted in a smile of anticipation. Oragastus thought that she had never seemed so beautiful or exciting as she did now, star-crowned and dressed in the same silver and black that symbolized his own commitment to the dark powers. He could not help himself, but took her face in his gloved hands and kissed her mouth. In time, their lips reluctantly parted. The sorcerer sighed. I hope that the powers will not be angry, but the sight of you, so lovely and mysterious, and so close to me. Oh, Haramus, stay with me, he pleaded, his arms tightening about her. I know that the white lady has called you, but she would take you from me, tell you the same old half-truths and untruths, try to bend your will to hers. Except for her help, I would not have been born, Haramus reminded him. I must hear her dying words. She gave me my black trillium, sent me on my quest. I am sure that she guided and guarded me when I would have perished in the high mountains. I cannot ignore her plea. If you have spoken the truth, you have nothing to fear from my going. She keeps the crown of Rwanda from you. No, she keeps it for me, and with or without it, I am Queen of Rwanda no matter whose soldiers occupy the citadel. She looked challengingly straight into his eyes. Oragastus sighed. Why do we tarry out here in the chill? The ice mirror awaits. He began his solemn invocation of the dark powers, beseeching deities that Haramus strongly suspected to be non-existent, to look kindly upon each of them. Poor deluded man. But she did not smile. Let them seem magical to him, while she continued to weigh his sincerity. She was becoming increasingly convinced that many of the extraordinary powers wielded by Oragastus had nothing whatsoever to do with magic. But, even so, he did use these powers. Can they be countered by my magic, she wondered, remembering his magic tablet? Quite possibly they can but I had best not experiment on his precious ice mirror. He would surely kill me at once if I damaged that. No, I shall watch and learn. Haramus did not have to feign awe when he led her into the chamber of the great ice mirror and summoned its resident demon. Oragastus had proposed that they use the mirror to scry her two sisters, and she had agreed at once, feeling guilty at having neglected to look for them herself through her talisman. But having done it that first day and seen them safe, she had forgotten Anagel and Cadia in her own preoccupations, which seemed so much more momentous. Now, having been cautioned to keep silence, she waited as Oragastus intoned his request, and the mirror, which she could see clearly was some sort of machine, and not even in the best working order, responded with gibberish and produced first a map, and then an amazing, fully-colored image of Cadia, 
followed by a similar manifestation featuring Anagel. Both sisters were voyaging on the water, in heavy rain, and neither spoke, although the mirror gave forth the natural sounds that accompanied each vision. Tadia traveled with a veritable army of Wizgu oddlings, and rode in a native vessel cleverly fashioned of reeds. The map plot of the mirror showed that this Wizgu flotilla was in the upper Mutar, just above Trevista. The great river flowed turbulently, and was laden with uprooted trees and other flood debris, but neither this nor the steady downpour seemed to inconvenience Cadia or her small companions. Some of the Wizgu wore armor of golden scales, as did the princess, and all of the oddlings carried primitive weapons. But Cadia had not even her little dagger any more, but bore only her talisman, that strange thing like a pointless sword of mercy. The vision of Anagel was more alarming. The mirror showed a massive raft built from great logs lashed together with stout ropes. It was equipped with a stubby mast and a broad square sail, which caught the wind blast and sent the big craft charging and crashing through mountainous waves. There was a tiny cabin, little more than an open box, in which Anagel crouched quite calmly. Drenched to the skin, her talisman coronet clamped on her head. Crude railings were fixed around the perimeter of the raft, and many knotted ropes fastened to these and to the mast gave handholds to the numerous passengers. Some of them were prone and bedraggled humans, while others were oddlings of a peculiar and formidable appearance, tall in stature, who actually seemed to be enjoying their wild ride. Haramis was careful to say nothing until the mirror went dead, although her mind teemed with questions. It was clear from the maps that both of her sisters were en route to the citadel, and both had found and were using their talismans. Had the White Lady given them special instructions, or were they acting on their own? Could they possibly be intending to attack King Voltrix's heavily armed troops with their mobs of aborigines? Did their talismans make them think such a lunatic course of action might succeed? It almost seemed that Oragastus could read her mind. Your sisters, he said, after the ice mirror had winked out, have both used their talismans to kill. Dumb with shock, Haramis could only stare at him. He led her from the mirror chamber through the cavern and out into the tunnel that led back to his tower. Cadia and Anagel mistakenly think that they will be able to liberate Ruenda using the talismans as magical weapons. With help from their oddling friends and from Prince Antar, who has denounced his father and pledged himself to the cause of Princess Anagel. She saved his life back in the Tassileo forest, and he is now hopelessly smitten with her. Of course, Neither of your sisters has the faintest chance of success against Voltric. They do not yet fully understand the workings of their talismans, nor their limitations. They undoubtedly think they have only to wave their talismans at the citadel, and all their enemies will fall down dead. But this will not occur. Voltric is protected by my own strong magic, under the command of my green voice. Oh, the silly fools, groaned Haramus. I cannot believe that the Archimage has ordered them to attack the Citadel. They are doing this on their own. The talismans that Cadia and Anagel hold were not intended to be used alone. My researches have made this very clear. The Vanished Ones used the three devices as one, in a great scepter of power, to establish some mysterious great balance of the world. It is your duty, Haramus, to bring together once again the three in one. Wielding it, you alone can rule over a world reborn into peace and prosperity. I rule the world? She laughed. Her mind had frozen at his words, rejecting them even as he spoke. She asked herself what might be the great scheme that the White Lady had held back and was now prepared to reveal. I shall go to the Archimage as soon as I can she decided. As they hurried along, she glanced sidelong at Oragastus through the eye-holes of the silver mask, and saw that his mouth was tight-lipped. He had not spoken frivolously. He believed what he had told her, and she had best take it seriously. 
she would have to go to the Archimage at once and demand an explanation of this scepter of power. But what of her sisters? If he did not know already, Voltric would soon learn from the sorcerer of their advance upon the citadel. He would send his army, and doubtless the green voice also, to meet them. Orgastus, she asked. Could you keep Voltric from sending troops after my poor sisters? Let me convince the two of them to turn away. If they withdraw at once into the depths of the swamp, they will be in no immediate danger. Voltric's soldiers would be hard-pressed to fight an offensive war, or even mount an effective pursuit during the rainy season. But do you think your sisters will listen to you? They always did before. But now... Having their talismans. Haramis's voice trailed away into silent anxiety. I can order my green voice not to smite your sisters with my lightnings or other occult weaponry, but there is no way that I can stop King Voltric from dealing with them or their oddling rabble as he chooses. Their talismans will not protect them. If I were there at the citadel, I might prevail upon Voltric. From here, working only through my voice, I cannot. They came to the tunnel's end and entered the tower, where welcome heat enveloped them. Haramis stopped inside the small foyer and took Oregastus by the hands. There is yet time, for both of us and for my sisters. I do not know what plans you now have. I do not want to know until I have finally made up my mind about us. But... If I fly at once to the Archimage, and then decide, will you meet me at the Citadel to receive my answer? And while you are waiting for me, will you prevent Voltric from sending his army out against Anagil and Cadia? I can make them turn back. I know I can. But I must first learn the intentions of the Archimage. Let me guide you. I already have a plan. No. She took off the star mask and stood there pale and trembling and she was unbending this time as he embraced her and kissed the top of her head. My dearest one, you will do as you must do, he told her. But there is one serious flaw in your strategy. I have no way to go quickly to the citadel. Unlike you, I cannot command the Lammergeiers. I will ask Hiluro to summon one of his fellows to carry you there. His hands tightened about her. You would do this? Trust me so far. The face she lifted to him was wet with tears. You are a man who has long guarded his secret heart. Perhaps you have built such strong ramparts about it that you are no longer sure what lies within. I think that you are not certain which way to take. Like me, you will have to make a choice. Yes, he admitted. His arms fell away and he did not meet her eyes. The Lammergeier will come for you, she said. We will meet at the Citadel just before the Feast of the Three Moons. Expect me. And then she was gone, leaving him standing alone. And her silver star mask lay on the floor looking up at him with empty eyes. Forty. When the wild voyage of the log rafts up Lake Wum ended late on the same day that it had begun, the Wavilo steered the fleet of ungainly craft into the Greenmire forest islands of the lower Mutar Delta, still under cover of the storm. There the Nisimu met them with a hundred punts and greeted Princess Anagel with much deference. The little swamp folk ferried her and the knights and the Wavilo warriors via secret backwaters to a large hummock unknown to humans. This place, which would become the staging area for Anagil's army, was located a few leagues away from a manor on the river Scrocar that had belonged to the late Lord Manaparo of the Oathed Companions. The castle of the manor had been seized and occupied by Labernaki troops, but the outbuildings and dower house still sheltered Manaparo's large family and most of his servants and domestic retainers. The mistress of the manor, Lady Elenus, had been advised by the local Nisimu of Anagil's coming. The lady was brought out to the isolated hummock long after nightfall, and she greeted the princess with tears and guarded enthusiasm. Lady Elenus was a grey-haired dame whose fine face was now deeply lined with bereavement. 
In addition to her husband, two of her sons had also perished in the futile defense of the citadel. She sat with Anagel inside a shelter that the Wavilo had set up in a dripping grove of gondas, and the two of them discussed the princess's plan for besieging the citadel, together with her sister Cadia and the latter's force of Wisgu. That you would dare such a thing so soon after the conquest amazes me, Elena said. And perhaps it is true that Voltrix's forces are not yet completely entrenched, and his army is divided, and they are on unfamiliar ground with the rainy season upon them. But still, you two girls are so young, utterly inexperienced in warfare, and even if our scattered nobles and freeholders rally to you as you hope, your army is yet composed mostly of oddlings. My darling Princess Anagel, I wish nothing more in the world than your success. But the labor Naki are hardened fighting men, and the odds are greatly against you. Anagel only touched her coronet, where the trillium amber glowed. I know not why I am convinced that victory will be ours, but I am. Perhaps this talisman is the thing that gives me the confidence to attempt such an audacious endeavor. All I can tell you, dear Elinus, is that I felt impelled to come here now, with the three moons converging, and engage the labor Naki who hold the citadel. My sister Cadia is of like mind. Lady Elinus drew her heavy cloak more closely about her. A small brazier burned in the shelter, and on it Anagel was brewing Darcy tea, against the penetrating dampness. Elinus said, I was astounded when Anisimu came secretly to me and informed me that you were sailing up Lake Wum. Of course, the oddlings can bespeak each other without words, and I suppose they will have passed the news all over the mazy mire by now. To all the folk, yes, Anagel agreed solemnly. My Wivilo allies have never, up until now, had much dealings with their Nisimu or Wisgu cousins. But the conquest of our country by Labernock was a disaster not only to Ruendian humans, but also to the Aborigines who dwell among us. And so the Wavilo have put aside their ancient customs, and even the peaceable Nisimu are willing to join us and do what they can. Outside, where the rain had stopped and night mists now hung thick, the Wavilo were busily constructing more brush and bamboo shelters for themselves and for others who were expected to arrive at the hummock later. Like all folk, they could see readily in the dark, and went about their work as efficiently as though it were broad daylight. Catching sight of a tall Wavilo axeman, Lady Elinus shivered. I have never seen... Casaleo forest oddlings before, and I confess that their mien is rather frightening. They are not as dreadful looking as the Skritek, of course, and they seem fairly civilized. Nevertheless, I wonder that you are able to put such trust in them. Anagel smiled. Their faces are terrifying, but at heart they are noble, and revere the black trillium just as their smaller kin do. Thanks to the Wavilo, we were able to send word via the Nisimu to the scattered bands of free Ruendians, who are hastening here from all directions to join my army. My own people, and my three surviving sons, are yours to command, Elena said. And you are welcome to what stores of food we were able to hide from the enemy. But there are at least five hundred oddlings here already— and you say that you expect three or four times that number of humans and Nisimu to gather here within the next two days. I fear that we will not have victuals enough to feed such a throng for more than a few days. We will not be here for very long. If we are not victorious during the Feast of the Three Moons, we will have to withdraw, Anagel confessed. But we will win out. I know it. The princess was on her feet, stern-faced, and still dressed in the blue hunting kit that the Wavilo had given her. Lady Elinus marveled at how greatly the girl had changed from the giggling little person she had seen at a royal ball scarcely five weeks earlier, before the invasion. That Anagel had been a shy ornamental with hardly a thought in her pretty head that did not involve court gossip or the latest fashions. This new young woman was frightening in her dedication— and Elinus hardly knew what to make of her. But the princess poured tea for her guest without a trace of her old flightiness, 
as gracious and confident as though the sooty crock were a silver pot, and the damp and drafty shelter, the queen's solar in the citadel. Gradually, Elinus lost her misgivings, and began to think that the impossible venture might not be utterly hopeless after all. This Prince Antar. The older woman lowered her voice to a whisper. It was clear to me when you introduced us that the young man is deeply in love with you. Nevertheless, I feel it is my duty to caution you about placing too much reliance upon him. Anagel nodded and sat down again, her face without expression. He has pledged fealty to me, and so have most of his men. But there are three of his knights who withheld their troth, and these the others watch closely and exclude from our councils of war. But Antar and his knights are labor knocky after all. Dear Elinus, I am no longer as simple and gullible as I once was, and it is true that Prince Antar must still prove his loyalty to me. You say he loves me, and this may also be true, but I have only a fond respect for him, and even that is yet wary. Good, said Elinus sturdily. But I must trust Antar in some matters, since I know nothing of fighting. If we are to succeed, we will do so under his generalship. I know not what lies deep in his heart, but I am convinced that he is a good man, and one who deplores the cruelty of his father, King Voltric. He has told me that there are many others among his people who feel as he does, and it may be that we will, through him, divide our foe's loyalty. I shall pray that you are right. They spoke for a while longer, and then it was time for Elinus to go. The lady kissed Anagel, which the princess quite expected. But Anagel was quite taken aback when Elinus also bowed deeply to her before going away with her servant and her Nisimu guide. To Antar, who had come in when Elinus was taking her leave, the princess remarked, She never showed me such deference before. In fact, being a woman of serious bent, she rarely paid much attention to me at all. The more fool she, said the prince, smiling. But I have come to tell you that our camp is growing apace, and there is now adequate shelter should the rain commence again. His face sobered. The Wavila war chief, Lamamu Ko, feels that the Nisimu, even though willing, will make poor warriors. They are so small, and the only weapon most of them can use with facility is the blowgun. In a frontal assault, they would be useless. We can only utilize them in skirmishes and irregular actions. Then plan to do so, Anagel said serenely. Do you have any estimates on the number of humans who might follow us? With luck, seven or eight hundred free Ruendians might be able to join us here or reach the river below the citadel by the Feast of the Three Moons. These will be mostly knights and soldiers who escaped into the mire when the citadel fell, together with some lords and men-at-arms from outlying manors south of here, who never engaged us, I mean, never engaged your enemies, during the late invasion. Very good. Now, if only the Count of Goik and the other free lords of the far dialects can arrive in time. She broke off, suddenly turning away, her face darkened with chagrin. Antar, who had never heard of the Count of Goik and knew nothing of that worthy's place in Anagel's plan, at that moment realized that she still feared to confide in him completely. He dropped slowly to his knees. My lady, if you command me, I shall say nothing of this Count to my loyal companions. I beseech you to have faith in us, but if you cannot... Perhaps it would be best if you placed me and my knights under arrest. Then you would be freed of any anxieties our presence might engender. I do trust you, Anagel said unhappily, and most of your knights as well. It is Sir Rinitar and his cronies, Turat and Anbagar, whom I feel might betray us. I know they have pledged a truce, but I fear it was a grave mistake to bring them here to the secret camp. We should have left them on the lake shore, as Lamamu Ko advised. The prince bowed his head. Perhaps. But marooned in the midst of the storm, in a swamp full of unknown perils, they would surely have perished before finding their way to a Labernaki garrison, as you yourself agreed. 
I would not have them die, but neither can I let them betray us to King Voltric. Kneeling yet, he took hold of her hand. It was icy cold. Be of good cheer. The three would be lost in minutes if they attempted to leave this hummock and range out into the mire, and there is no one here who would aid them to escape. My fifteen true companions and I will see to them. Have no fear. She sighed and turned her eyes back to him. I suppose you are right. I am taut drawn as a bowstring, anxious about what will befall us in the next three days. The Count of Goik that I inadvertently spoke of, he holds the most distant fiefdom of Ruenda, far to the northeast of the dialects, in the foothills of the Ohogans. Neither he nor the Count of Proc, nor the other lords of the eastern manors were ever subdued by you, Lavernaki. I know. It was to be our first priority after the winter rains, to pacify that country, and also the south. When the Wavilo agreed to help me, I asked them if they would use their speech without words to discover what humans were unconquered. Through the Nisimu I then made contact with those who fled the citadel, and also certain nobles of the garrisoned manors, such as Lady Elena's, and a few free manors of the south. This you already know, but my Wavilo friends also bespoke the Vizpi, the aborigines of the high mountains, and the Vizpi told us of the counties of Goik and Proc being yet free. He nodded. I see. And then, of course, the mountain oddlings called upon those lords to come to your aid. The Count of Goik is a hard-headed man, and he is also my great-uncle, Polundo. At first, he would not believe what inhuman folk told him, that my sister Cadia and I were ready to attack the citadel. But I myself bespoke the Visby, imparting to them certain homely secrets that only members of the royal family know, and at last Uncle Polundo was convinced. When we and the Wavilo quit the village of Let, two thousand armed knights and men, from both Goik and Proc, set off from their remote enclaves in fast river boats. They had a long way to come, but the waterways are already in flood, and yesterday they safely skirted the castle of Bonner, about sixty leagues west of here. If all goes well, they will arrive in time to help us. Antar's eyes were shining. Better and better. Oh, my lady, I cannot tell you how you have lifted my heart. No longer does our position seem so forlorn. We are still outnumbered, but at least we will have greater numbers of experienced human fighters on our side. And he kissed her hand in a transport of joy. Anagel stiffened. Then, seeing his dismay, she smiled upon him. Is my touch, then, so repulsive? He asked sadly. No, by no means. I was only surprised. There are so many things on my mind, you see. She looked so small and bemused, this young woman crowned with magic, perched uncomfortably on a mossy rock with her face lit only by the brazier, that his heart was ignited from pity and love, and he rose to his feet and turned away, so that she should not see the tears that had sprung to his eyes. Yes, my lady, you have much to think on. Too much for a person of such tender years and great sensitivity. I'll manage, Anagel said, rather briskly. He turned back to her. Now I have offended you. I apologize most humbly. And I accept. For an instant their eyes met. Then she looked away and seemed abstracted again, and the rapport that had seemed to spring momentarily to life died a warning. Had he really seen it? Or was it only wishful thinking? He would have cried out to her that very minute, professing his adoration, but she had her eyes blindly fixed on one wall of the tent and seemed lost in a dream, one finger lifted to her silvery coronet. I bid you good night, then, he said. But Anagel did not reply. She was listening to a vision of her sister Cadia that had just sprung into her mind. Haramis said, What? Annie, she told me to turn back, ordered me, as though I were still a naughty child refusing to come in from playing in the stables. Did she give a reason? She is afraid that Voltric knows we are on our way and that he will send troops out to engage us. But that's ridiculous. The Nissimo would know at once if any large body of Labernaki left the citadel. 
they would give warning, and we could easily hide away in the sloughs and backwaters of the mire, where no flatlander would have a hope of catching us. Of course, I told her that, but she got all in a swivet and started swearing upon her amulet and talisman that I was floating to my doom and sure to ruin some great scheme. When I asked if the scheme was hers or one of Oregastus, she became all huffy. Can she have fallen under his dark spell, Katie? Who can say? Has she bespoken you with the same line of tosh? Nay, but I have been so busy and distracted this day that I scarce had time to draw a quiet breath. If she does try to bespeak you, don't answer. Katie, I mean what I say, and tell Hera nothing more of our plans. She has gone to the Archimage at last, supposedly to hear the white lady's version of our destiny and the purpose of our talismans. Perhaps our lovesick sister will recover her wits in Noth, but I shall not count on it. Bespeak her, not again. She must know nothing of our plans until we all three meet in person and have this out. Well, I suppose that is the sensible thing. She also told me that the sorcerer will arrive at the Citadel tomorrow. What? But he was there with Hera in the mountains. She is lending him one of her magic birds as a steed. When I remonstrated with her, actually, I called her a besotted muck for brains. She insisted she was acting in our best interests. Now we shall have his enchantment to contend against, as well as the armed might of Labernock. Oh, Katie! Now, don't lose heart. Hera seems to believe that Oregastus has very little real magic at all. According to her, his thaumaturgy may be based upon nothing more nor less than some fabulous machinery of the vanished ones. The bolts of lightning, the gouts of flame and hail of steel pellets that destroyed the hill forts, the ear-bursting horror that afflicted the dialects townships, even the panic that seized the warfronials of our knights, all some sort of mechanical trickery, and not real magic at all, if Hara is telling true. Katie, I just don't understand this. There must be magic. Our black trilliums, our talismans, the Archimage herself. Magic pervades the entire world. Never mind, Annie. The only important thing to remember is that our sister must not be allowed to stop us. So give no heed to her lunatic admonitions. I am still well ahead of Osorkin and his army. I have more than three thousand Wizgu following me, and I have worked out a plan for penetrating the Citadel and avoiding a pitched battle outside on the Knoll, where we would surely be cut down by Voltrix's cavalry. Oh, tell me, and have you blabbed it to that whittling Antar? Nay, you'll learn of it when our armies meet on the eve of three moons. You misjudge me, and also Antar. I hope so. And I hope I misjudge our sister as well. Meanwhile, take great care and meet me in this place that I show you. When we confer, we will arrange for King Voltric and Oregastus to join us at a very special celebration of the Moon Feast. 41. Day was dawning rapidly when Haluro began his descent toward Noth. Haramis had cried herself to sleep, then dreamed a conversation with a scandalized Cadia, expressing disapproval of her dealings with Oregastus. No doubt Cadia would have tried to stab him and been struck down with lightning for her pains. How dare she call Haramis's conduct reckless? Now Haramis felt horribly bleary-eyed as the growing light woke her. She was stiff in every muscle, but her position on the bird's back did not encourage much movement, so she looked forward to landing. As the bird circled over the small stone tower where the Archimage lived, Haramis looked down in bewilderment. The last time she had seen the place, it had been covered in greenery and surrounded by a lawn dotted with wildflowers. Now only a few skeletal branches clung to the tower, and what remained of the lawn was brown and scattered with spiky weeds. The moat was low, and the little water that remained in it was covered with a foul-smelling scum. What has happened here? Haramis asked aloud. Hiluro twitched, and for a moment she thought he was about to answer her. But he remained silent. Could King Voltrix's soldiers have come this far? She wondered. No, there would be a different kind of destruction if they had. They would have burned and torn down. But this looks as though everything simply died. 
but there is no natural reason for everything to dry up like this, not at this time of year. She thought of the great number of gardeners formerly employed at the Citadel. Perhaps with the Archimage dying, her few servants, and Haramis had heard her mention only one, her steward, hadn't had time to take care of the plants. But even so, it shouldn't look like this. The Lammergeier landed at the end of the drawbridge, and Haramis climbed off his back, her mind busy speculating on what she might find within. Was the Archimage already dead? She was still strong enough to speak to me last night, Haramis thought. A feeling of urgency possessed her, and she hurried across the drawbridge, along a mosaic floor almost covered with dead moss, past the now dry fountain, and across the garden, now barren ground with dead flowers strewn about, their roots still clinging to the earth which no longer nourished them. When she came to the black wooden door which led to the Archimage's chamber, she was not surprised to find it standing ajar. The room was stifling hot, and an oddling, a Nisimu she had never seen before, crouched by the fire adding more peat. He looked up as her shadow, cast by the sun rising behind her, fell across him. Lady Haramus, he said, welcome to Noth. She said you would be here in time. He nodded toward the bed. Greetings. You must be Damatol, Haramus said. The Archimage had mentioned his name only once during their last meeting, but Haramis had been taught all her life to remember the name, face, and salient characteristics of everyone she met or heard of. Her parents had considered it an important part of royal training. Yes, my lady. The little steward bowed to her. It is my honor to serve the Lady Bina, and you. She sleeps now, but she should wake soon. Would you care for some tea? Yes, Aramis said gratefully. I would indeed. Thank you, Damatol. The oddling hurried from the room, and Aramis picked up one of the padded stools and quietly moved it to the side of the Archimage's bed. Sitting on it, she studied the sleeping woman. Bina looked even less well than she had in the scrying bowl, her flesh parched and sinking down about the bones of her face. She woke just as Damatol came in with the tea. Aramis she said slowly. You came. Of course I came, Haramis said. You called me. Besides, I need more information on how to use the talismans. Unfortunately, finding my three-winged circle did not automatically teach me how to use it. Oregastus's library had some information on them, including a book that said the three of them should be joined together to form a scepter. Not yet, the Archimage interrupted her. You are not yet ready to control that power. That requires more wisdom than you have. Much more. Where am I supposed to learn this great wisdom? Haramis snapped impatiently. Grubbing around in the swamp while Voltrix's army plunders my kingdom? Or am I to find it in my sisters, who use their talismans to kill? The Archimage looked sorrowful. They do not yet possess wisdom either she sighed, her voice trailing off into silence. It was several moments before she spoke again, and her question was unwelcome. Why did you stay so long with Oregastus? Haramis frowned, trying to find the right words to explain. I was trying to learn what he was like. You yourself bid me find out his weaknesses. It's odd. He seems to think that the devices of the vanished ones are magical. He actually said as much. He was very upset when I broke one of them. He said it was dead. But machines aren't alive, are they? No, the lady replied. And do you think his devices are magical? No, Haramis said. I cannot explain it precisely, but they don't feel magical. But magic or machine, they give him power, and that power, whatever it is, can be used to do great harm. And while that power exists, I want to know how it works. So you went to Oregastus to learn the use of power? Was that wise? What is wise? Haramis retorted bitterly. You lie here in bed while my home is invaded, and my parents horribly murdered, and hundreds of Visby are slaughtered because you summoned them too late against a foe they could not withstand. Is that wisdom? If so, what good is it? 
I know that you are confused and in pain, Haramus, the lady said gently. But you must learn to look beyond the moment and see the larger pattern. That, Haramus retorted, is exactly what Oregastus said. As if my parents were nothing and their deaths didn't matter. She found herself crying again, hurt and angry and bereft. And now you'll die too, she thought despairingly. And I'll be alone with my kingdom occupied by enemy soldiers, my sisters who knows where, and King Voltric trying to kill me and them. And I don't know what to do, and nobody else seems to know either. I have watched over Uwenda for a long time, Bina said softly. Far longer than you realize. I have loved the land and its folk, and I have guarded them and helped them to grow as they should. It is a great work, and there is much joy in it. But now my time is ending, and yours is beginning. She turned her head to meet Haramus's eyes. You said that Oregastus invited you to come to him. Tell me, Haramus, why did he invite you and not your sisters? Haramus gazed back at her, startled. I don't know. I never thought to ask that. And now that you know the question, what is the answer? Haramus frowned, trying to remember exactly how Oregastus had worded his invitation, as well as what he had asked of her while she was with him. I think he's lonely, she said slowly. He spoke of my reputation for learning and of his desire to share his knowledge with me. I think he's looking for someone else like him. Someone else who can use magic and think the way he does. Someone who can understand what he talks about. And are you like him? The Archimage asked quietly. In some ways I am, Haramus admitted. I don't want to blast anyone with lightning, or invade someone else's land, or kill people. But I can understand the desire to search for knowledge, to try to make sense of the world. To see the pattern of life around you? Yes, Haramus said. Exactly. And when you have this knowledge, what do you do with it? What do you mean? Haramis asked. Would you use knowledge to hurt and destroy, to manipulate and bend others to your will? Of course not, Haramis replied indignantly. That's wrong. People are supposed to be free to make their own choices, not used as puppets for the amusement of those stronger or more intelligent than they are. But why should I have to do anything with knowledge. Why can't I simply study and learn and rejoice in the knowledge and vision I achieve? Why should I have to use it? Because you are what you are, and it shows. I can see it, or Agastus can see it, and any other with a knowledge of magic can see it. The Archimage's voice grew intense. Haramis, you understand words. Most people never realize that words are important, that they matter, that to say a thing is to give it at least a shadow of existence, and to name it truly is to give it life. You hear, you listen, and you remember, and that is a rare gift. Without it, you would never understand magic. Most of it would literally be inconceivable to you. Cadia possesses great ardor and determination, passion and a loving heart, but these gifts, while they are great in their own right, are not what is required for the full use of magic. Your passion is knowledge, Haramis, and that, combined with the royal blood of Ruenda, will make you a magician. If you try not to use your abilities, you, and they, will be used by people like Oregastus. Is that why I feel like a pawn in some game you and Oregastus are playing? Haramis demanded. The Archimage's eyes burned in her face, as if all the life in the old woman were contained in them. You feel like a pawn because you have been one, Haramis. But you are reaching the last square, where you can choose what to become. A queen, of course, Haramis said in surprise. Wasn't that choice made for me long ago? No, the Archimage said softly, almost in a whisper. That choice is not made until you choose it. The important thing is for the world to be brought back into balance, 
which can only be done if you and your sisters can find your own balance. The crown may not be your destiny. What do you mean? Haramis asked in horror. Will we lose the kingdom to Voltric? Will I be killed? Or has something happened to the crown? I left it with you for safekeeping. Did I do wrong in that? By no means. The archimage's voice was feeble, but still audible. The crown is here, and safe. She turned her head toward the fire. Damatol. Haramis would not have thought the oddling could hear that whisper, but he hurried to Bina's side. The time has come, the old woman whispered. He nodded, crossed to one of the cupboards on the far wall, took out a white bundle, and brought it to the archimage. She slowly reached out a hand, grasped a fold of the cloth, and extended it to Haramis. As the bundle started to slide off the bed, Haramis grasped it. It fell open across her arms, and she saw in surprise that it was the archimage's cloak. Put it on, Aramis, Bina commanded in a whisper. It is yours now. Do you mean I am to be archimage? Aramis asked in surprise. I don't want this task, she thought in dismay. It's difficult enough to be queen, and at least I was trained for that. But to be the new archimage, she can't ask that of me. You have the ability, Bina whispered, but it must be your choice. I give you my blessing and my love, and one final warning. Remember that the line between self-confidence and overconfidence is narrow and easily crossed. Guard yourself always. Choose wisely. Then her breath rattled in her throat, and she lay still. Harima stared at her body in shock. This can't be happening, she thought. I'm dreaming. I'm in my bed in Orogastus's tower, and I'm having a nightmare. I've been reading too many books of magic. I... Haramis became aware that Damatol was speaking to her. White lady? She turned slowly to look at him. What is it, Damatol? What are your commands, lady? Commands? He thinks I'm the new archimage. Why, oh, why did I ever get out of bed this morning? Yesterday morning. Whenever it was. She should tell him something. After all, he was only trying to do his job. Unfortunately, nothing came to mind. Let me get you some water to wash with and bring breakfast, he suggested. You must be hungry. Hungry? Yes, now that he mentioned it, she was hungry. Thank you, Damatol, Haramis said blankly. That would be very nice. Damatol served her a simple meal, then led her away to a small chamber where there was a cot. She lay down and slept, and when she woke it was afternoon, and there was a meal set on a small table next to the cot. Haramis ate every bite, and then went in search of Damatol. She found him in the Archimage's chamber, but she was surprised to see that the bed was empty. Have you buried her body already, Damatol? she asked. I would have helped. There is no body, he replied. Do you not remember? No, I see you do not. The flesh that once enclosed Bina's spirit has gone to dust, as will this place once you leave it. Haramus looked more closely at the bed. Yes, there was dust on the pillow where Bina's head had been. Where is the crown of Rwenda? Damatol opened the cupboard in the far wall and took out a bundle, wrapped in white fabric, which he handed to Haramis. When she unwrapped it, she saw with relief that the crown was whole and undamaged. Would it turn to dust if it stayed here when I left? She wondered. I shall get you a bag to carry it in, Damatol offered, hurrying out of the room without waiting for her response. Haramis tried to think of what she should do next, but when Damatol returned with a leather sack, she had not yet decided. Since he obviously expected her to leave, however, she summoned the Lammergeier. Then it occurred to her that she was not the only one with no home. Damatol, do you have a place to go? He nodded. My kin will fetch me away. It is arranged. There is only one last thing. 
He picked up the Archimage's cloak, which was still lying on the stool where Haramis had left it, and put it into the bag with a crown. Why have you given me this? she asked, as they left the building together, fearing she already knew the answer. Because it is yours, white lady, he replied. And now I bid you farewell. A rising wind blew her hair back from her face. She looked up at the thickening clouds and wondered if it would rain tomorrow, on the eve of the three moons. Hiloro dropped out of the clouds and landed beside her. Where would you go, white lady? Do not call me that, Harima said in a low voice. Not yet. She mounted the Lammergeier, holding tightly to the bag with a crown and cloak, and Hiluro rose into the threatening sky. 42. King Voltric and the Green Voice waited on the parapet of the Citadel's high tower, and the dark clouds seemed to billow only a few ells above their heads, hiding the flag of Labernock on its staff. Below, the extensive fortress and its outbuildings and courtyards were peculiarly silent, even though it was mid-afternoon and a time when the surviving Ruendian servitors and freemen were usually hard at work. But on this day, only the steady clang of a blacksmith's hammer broke the stillness, tolling like some discordant bell of evil omen. King Voltric shuddered. Is it the wretched feast upcoming tomorrow? he asked the green voice, that has caused the conquered ones to shirk their duties. Full half of the usual citadel staff claim today to be stricken with ague and could not leave their beds, and those who are at work skulk about listlessly and seem barely able to carry on. Something is in the air, the voice admitted. Certainly there is bound to be another great storm soon. That's not what I meant, Voltrick snarled. Something nasty is brewing, and I think you know what it is, and you are afraid to tell me. The green voice lowered his hooded head in submission. My almighty master will soon arrive, great king, and he will put your mind at rest and answer all questions. The king uttered a guffaw of humorless laughter and abruptly turned away from the acolyte to gaze out upon the expanse of land that lay to the north. The peculiar light made the lush green of the jungle seem especially intense, and the mire smells were also much stronger than usual. If my mind is to be eased, Voltric growled, then why has the sorcerer commanded you to have all but a handful of our troops fall back to the citadel and alert themselves for battle? A mere precaution. Liar! Both of you! Conniving traitors! The monarch swung around and took the green voice by his shoulder. Even one-handed, he was able to shake Oregastus's assistant until his teeth rattled. They're coming for me, the three princess witches. That's it, isn't it? I could have been safely away from here, back in Daraguilla. But you and Oregastus assured me that all would be well, that the witches were captured and their talismans taken. But you lied. And now they're coming for me, just as the prophecy said. Nay, great king, I'm trapped here, Voltric howled. Zoto, have mercy on me. The army hates my guts because they're going to have to stay in this hellhole through the rains. And the knights are bored out of their minds from inaction, and drunk or wenching most of the time. And there is no one left to serve me but cravens and fools and traitorous tricksters plotting to take my kingdom once the Ruendian demon trolls have finished me off. The green voice dropped to his knees and clasped his hands in supplication. Not so, not so. My master will explain all when he arrives. If he does, Voltric bellowed. He drew his short sword and used the flat of it to mash the voice's nose painfully against his face. And if he does not, then your shaven, flap-eared head will take leave of its body, and I will hie out of this sump of iniquity at dawn tomorrow. Better to risk the perils of the rains than loiter here like a stupid nunchick in a slaughter pen. A great blow of the king's foot sent the kneeling minion sprawling to the pavement. And there sounded a cry like a brazen trumpet. Startled, Voltric flung his gaze in all directions but the correct one. 
so that he leapt with surprise when a gigantic black and white bird burst forth from the clouds, uttered another call, and glided to a landing on the parapet. From between its still extended wings, Oregastus looked down at the thunderstruck king and bowed his head slightly. Greetings to you, my liege, he said calmly. I am here as I promised, and prepared to deliver your enemies to you, as I promised also. Soto's teeth! It's one of those things that served the Archimage, and now it serves you. Oregastus slid from the Lammergeier's back. He thanked it briefly, to which it merely rolled its eyes and then ascended into the dark clouds with a single flap of its wings. The Archimage, said the sorcerer with unconcealed satisfaction is dead, and her successor is none other than the Princess Haramis, who once spurned your proposed betrothal, and who is now under my power, although she still does not realize it. By the ten hells! Voltric sheathed his sword, grimacing with relief. And the other two royal sluts? Oregastus walked to the tower's northernmost parapet and sat on the stone coping with his head lowered and his face concealed by the hood of his black cloak. Swiftly, using the speech without words, he gave orders to his acolyte. The green boy scrambled to his feet and disappeared down the trapdoor ladder. Then the sorcerer drew back his hood and smiled upon Voltric with all of the old charm and compelling self-possession that had bewitched a brash prince some eighteen years earlier. The other princesses are indeed coming, Oregastus said. Cadia leads an undisciplined rabble of swamp dwarves, armed with blowguns and stone spears. Anagil's terrible host consists of a few hundred ugly-faced forest oddlings, some faint-hearted Nisimu, a troop of grubby Ruendian partisans, and your son, the traitor, with his cadre of gnat-bitten turncoats. But the princesses have their talismans. Oregastus nodded. But they do not know how to use them properly. They no doubt think that all they need to do is to command our destruction. But I vow to you on my immortal soul that this is not the manner in which the magical instruments function. They are subtle weapons, and the princesses are immature girls, with more spirit than brains, who do not understand such things. Voltric sat beside the sorcerer, a scowl denting his brow, and chewed on his mustaches. He gestured out at the mire. We can't go out there after them, not with the rain starting. We'd never hunt them down in the swamp, not even with the help of those abominable drowners. No, Oregastus admitted, and for that very reason they have been encouraged to come here to the citadel, where our superior forces and my powerful enchantments We'll make an end of them once and for all. Voltric brightened. You will blast them with your lightning, devastate them with the sorcery you used in the conquest. I will lay the heads of Princess Cadia and Princess Anagil at your feet. Haramus, who is my creature, will serve you body and soul. Voltric giggled nervously. I wouldn't mind that. If you can magic her into submission, that is. I always fancied tall wenches, and I'll have to breed more sons somehow. There will be a battle, sire. Oregastus spoke almost with indifference. It will take place within two days, undoubtedly, at the Feast of the Three Moons. Voltric was on his feet again, eyes agleam and voice over loud. Good. Damn it all. That's what we need to get our blood moving again. Sitting here for a month, half the time sick unto death, has turned my heart as stagnant as this accursed swamp. Do you have the strategy for the fight worked out? Most assuredly, my liege. Oregastus now arose also. And this time there is no doubt whatsoever that we will win. My great powers are honed, and I am eager to defend you. The army here in the citadel is ready. And Lord Osorkin will soon arrive with an additional five thousand men. And lest you fret about the alleged power of the princesses and their talismans, there is also this. From beneath his cloak the sorcerer took a bag, and out from this retrieved a wooden box carved with skulls and other symbols of death. 
He opened the box to reveal a dull green sphere about the size of a small ladle fruit, set within a nest of padded black velvet. This is a weapon more deadly than all my others put together. It was the second parting gift to me of my late Master Bondanus. He who gave you the golden pastilles? Yes, they were a gift of life, but this brings only death of the most excruciating kind. It is to be used as a last resort, for its bane will afflict everyone, friend or foe, who stands at ground level within a radius of a thousand ells. If its use should be required, if there is no other way in which to kill the princesses, then I myself shall wield it. King Voltric had paled, and could not take his eyes from the thing. What is it called, and how does it work? It is known as the Doomful Effluvium, and it is a weapon older than the vanished ones, used against them by the ancestors of my master, in their great struggle for the domination of the world. The sphere is of glass. Dashing it to the stones releases deadly vapors that bring death if a single breath of it be taken. I am prepared to use it to assure our victory, even though it will kill many of our own men as well as our enemies. You need not fear it yourself, sire, as long as you remain on the upper levels of the keep. Its heavy vapors cannot rise far above a man's height. Oragastus closed the box and put it away. Undoubtedly it will not be needed. I show it to you only to prove that there is no way that these princesses can win out. We are invincible. The eyes that the sorcerer now turned upon the gray-faced monarch seemed to become as brilliant as stars, and his soft voice compelled trust and drove away all fear. You do believe me, do you not, my king? Yes, Voltric replied in a tremulous whisper. Yes. Knowing that her forces would now have to travel from their secret camp on the river Scrocar to Cadia's hideout some fifteen leagues away in the trackless mire just north of the citadel, Princess Anagel had beseeched her talisman to conceal them from the enemy's magical sight. And, lo, the day mist had thickened to an opaque miasma that blinded the humans, but bothered the oddlings not at all. The princess deemed this the answer to her prayer, and her force set out. The fleet of Nisimu Punts carried the entire host safely past Castle Manaparo to the confluence of the Scrocar and the Mutar. Thence they proceeded up the great river itself, staying in the backwaters along the northern shore until they had turned off to the right into a clogged and twisting little channel. This led Anagel to her sister's staging area, where they arrived at nightfall. The place was another large hummock, but lit only by ghostly lanterns carrying tiny green glowing swamp worms. A Wisgu chieftain, with great circles of red paint about his eyes, and a full suit of golden fish-scale mail, met Anagel's boat at the hummock shore, saying he would conduct her, Prince Antar, and the other Labernaki knights to the place where Katie awaited. In the wan lantern light they disembarked, and followed a path to a simple leather tent where Cadia and her Wisgu battle leaders were poring over a drawing of the citadel keep spread out upon a crude table. There were females there, for leadership was equal, but no long skirts loaded with fine embroidery were to be seen. One and all, they wore woven grass breeches and tunics overlaid with shells and tough scales from shoulder to thigh, not unlike chainmail. They wore helms also, some fashioned of metal found in the ruins. Cadia's hair was braided and coiled under hers. Save for her height, she might have been one of the general company. When the golden-haired Anagel caught sight of her older sister, she forgot everything else and burst into tears of gladness, rushing toward the other with open arms. But Cadia returned the embrace, only hesitantly, and her dark eyes never left the face of Antar, who had remained at the entrance to the shelter together with his men. The prince looked from Anagel to her sister, and there was the beginning of a frown on his face. What is wrong? Anagel exclaimed in dismay. We, we are together once more, alive. Yes, I live, Katie returned stolidly. But who are these who come with you, sister? 
What pact have you made with them? Trust cannot be rooted in the spilling of kin blood. She stared pointedly at the prince. Have you forgotten so easily whose steel slashed our world apart? Anagel gave a cry as desolate as if Cadia had drawn a weapon against her. Antar is not to be feared or mistrusted. I will pledge my life on it, my very talisman. And she lifted from her head the silvery coronet, whose trillium amber had begun to pulsate brilliantly as she approached her sister and held it out. Your Highness, the prince looked to Cadia straightly. What must we swear by that will make you accept the truth? Slowly, Cadia drew from its sheath her own talisman. She reversed it and held it pommel up so that it faced both Anagel and Antar. The three eyes opened, and the watching men muttered in consternation. Sister, turn about, Cadia commanded, and let both our talismans pass judgment. With a stricken countenance, Anagel did as she was bid. O lords of the air, great servants of God, Cadia intoned, reveal to us which of these knights will grant us loving service and which would do us harm, and do unto the latter as they would do to us. There was a soundless blast of blue-white light. Prince Antar and his fifteen loyal companions tottered in their armor, their mouths wide in shock. But on the wet earth lay two other knights, unmoving. After the space of a few heartbeats, Sir Owanan bent over them. Shaking his head, he said, On Bagar and Turet, both stone dead. Anagel cried out for horror, but Prince Antar asked the others, And where is Renatar? He was not among them, nor had anyone seen him since leaving the boat in which they had approached Cadia's camp. Antar would have sent his men searching, but Princess Anagel bade them stay. I will find him, she said quietly, and she put her talisman back upon her head, and her eyes seemed to look through all the others, in the direction of the citadel. He is mid-river, in a stolen punt. Smite him, cried Bluff Sir Penipat. He will raise the alarm. There is no need for that, said a new voice. This time it was Cadia and Anagel who stood stock still and gaping, for Princess Haramus had pushed her way through the crowd of armored men to confront her sisters. She wore the white cloak of the Archimage and carried the crown of state, unwrapped in one arm. Haramus, her sisters exclaimed in unison. Cadia, Anagel. Haramus embraced her sisters, then said, Yes, it is I. You may as well let Rinitar go. King Voltric and Oregastus already know that you are here, and that you intend to attack before moonrise tomorrow, when the feast begins. All of them, Wizgu and Labernaki, Cadia and Anagel, even sturdy little Jagen, began to speak at once. Aramis lifted her talisman. The trillium amber set within the wand throbbed with golden light, as did the amber of the other talismans. Silence fell. Aramis said, Sisters, I know what numbers of followers you have brought to this encampment. She tried not to let her incredulity show in her voice. They deserved her courtesy. I have seen many more boats full of Wizgu approaching this place, as well as a large fleet of heavily armed Ruendians coming in from the free northeast. But if you attack the citadel, all of these loyal friends will die, for this venture is foredoomed. Who told you so? Cadia demanded hotly your dearly beloved sorcerer. Haramis flushed. She hardly deserved that, though perhaps Cadia could not be blamed for thinking so. She looked Cadia straight in the eye. Whatever you may think has happened between Oregastus and me, it is not I who have brought the enemy to our councils. She looked squarely at Anagel, standing close to Prince Antar. Anagel flushed, but said nothing. As for doom, I am not blind. I can see it for myself. Your aborigines are only lightly armed. Count Polundo's force probably cannot get here in time. But even if it does, it will be countered by the five thousand men that Osorkin is bringing down the river. The other half of Voltric's army is already on alert, ready to repel any assault you might mount. The great gates of the citadel have been repaired. Perhaps, said Cadia with a grin. 
we have the wherewithal to open them, and to defeat your conjurer as well. You are gambling many lives on that assumption, Haramis pointed out. Perhaps you do not know that you can no longer count upon the assistance of the Archimage. Why not? Cadia demanded. She has always assisted us before. Are you trying to tell us that she would aid Oregastus in this battle? No, Haramis said wearily. I am trying to tell you that the Archimage is dead. It was Anagil who cried out in dismay. Cadia said angrily, How do you know? I know because I was there, Haramis said, and then her grief threatened to overcome her again. As yet she had shed no tears for the Archimage, but she did not dare to give way just now. She forced her voice to remain steady. I tell you, Oregastus is waiting for you with all the arcane weaponry at his command, and he has called for the local Greenmire Skritek to walk. They are converging upon Citadel Knoll, and will harry and devour any of your people they can catch. Do you really believe you can face all that, and Oregastus's weapons? There was a moment of silence, which seemed very long to Haramus. You will all be massacred, she added quietly. Withdraw, I beg of you. They can't follow you into the swamps at this time of year. No. Cadia smashed her fist onto the table. Oregastus has bewitched you. That is plain to see, for all that you have usurped the cloak of the Archimage. Do you really think I wanted to take her place? Aramis demanded. All of her fatigue, all of her grief for the Archimage, threatened to overpower her again. Yes, I do. Cadia declared hotly. You have always been greedy for power, Haramis. You cannot bear to think that either Annie or I might have a plan that is better than yours. The unfairness of this struck Haramis like a blow. She felt as if she would collapse under it. Cadia surveyed her angrily, but Anagel saw the grief in her face. I think you are being unfair, Cadie, she said. Let us at least hear Haramis's plan. Cadia glared at both of them. She said, What of the crown, Haramis? Will you and Oregastus share the thrones of Ruenda and Labernock after Voltric is disposed of in this great plan of yours? Of course not. Cadia, you simply don't understand. Haramis was almost despairing. How could she make her sister see? It was little Jagan who said unexpectedly, let the talismans prove her true or false, as they did Prince Antar and his men. Haramis drew herself to her full height. As you wish. But if your talismans are anything like my own sisters, you had best be very careful how you frame your test, for I have no doubt that my talisman, like yours, is capable of killing. So be it, said Cadia, as Anagel looked from one sister to the other in open distress. Their thoughts were easily read, even by the labor-knocky knights and the Wizgu. Dearest Haramus, Anagel said forlornly, we want very much to trust you, but we have seen you consorting with Oregastus. Anagel had tears in her eyes, but her voice was steady. We have no other course but to ask if you will give us leave to test you. Haramis regarded her sister with a bemused expression. All of the others in the tent held their breath, and in the stillness could be heard the first patter of raindrops from the new storm, and a quiet murmur of many voices outside. Another band of recruits had arrived. She said quietly, I did not ask to test you, though you brought your prince here. Anagel flushed as Haramis went on. Let it be as you will. She took her own talisman and held it before her face. Test me, then. At that point, all of Antar's knights and the Wizgu left the tent in precipitate haste. Only the prince and Jagin remained, and the small Nisimu huntsman sketched the sign of the black trillium before each sister. Haramis handed Jagin the crown. He took it reverently and knelt in a corner with his head bowed. Cadia and Anagel still stood side by side, talismans raised, but this time it was the youngest princess who spoke. Dear lords of the air, have pity on us three. 
but also show clearly to us any danger we might pose to the great balance of the world. The three talismans glowed a deep crimson, filling the tent with brilliant light. The three princesses were like statues, their eyes wide and lips slightly parted. Then coronet and wand and pointless sword took on a spectral aspect. They flew from their owners to a point midway above them, and there the talismans merged. The shaft of the wand slipped into the three-lobed pommel, and the coronet, with its monstrous visages below the cusps, engirded the circle and closed. Whereupon the three conjoined wings, with their amber center, were suddenly suspended within concentric rings. A mysterious voice spoke. In this scepter of power is the potential for permanent balance, as well as for the ruin of this world. Consider most judiciously before commanding the scepter, and remember that those who made it were in the end afraid to use it. The blood-red light faded. Each princess again held her own talisman. After many silent minutes, Prince Antar spoke. Did the talismans answer? Haramus stared, unbelieving, but it was Anagil who demanded, in the voice of one waking from a dream, did you not see and hear? Nothing, gracious lady, save your own invocation. The three sisters exchanged glances. Without thinking, all three came together in a triple embrace. So it seems I am exonerated, Haramis whispered. Or am I? Of course you are, Katia said sharply. But we will attack the citadel nonetheless. Haramis frowned. Are you both resolved on this? Yes, said Anagil. If you will not join us, sister, then at least do not hinder us, nor give aid to our enemies. I will not, Haramis said. But I must leave you. I must go to Citadel Knoll, and there I do not know what I will do, but I know I must go there. Little Jagan had come from his place in the corner, still holding the crown of state. If you wish, Princess Haramis, I will take you in a punt. I thank you, Haramis said. But before I leave, she said to her sisters, Let me tell you something I learned during my time with Oregastus. Much of his so-called magic comes from devices of the vanished ones, and it is possible that your talismans may be used to break these devices. When my talisman touched one, the device ceased to function. This may work with your talismans as well. She hugged her sisters. Cadia, Anagil, be careful, and may the lords of the air protect you. She took the crown from Jagan, and then white-cloaked Haramus was gone with the Nisimu huntsman, and only Antar was left with the other two princesses. A grumble of thunder sounded, and the rainfall quickened. Cadia frowned at the tall young man in the blue armor. You really saw nothing? No red light, no merging of the talismans, you heard no uncanny voice? Truly not, my princess, Antar said. The vision was for us, Katie, Anagil said, and especially, I think, for poor Haramus. Poor? Katie scoffed. Why, here we stand, outcasts, ready to go to war, while she, with crown and cloak, chooses to watch on the sidelines. If we are able to win out without the scepter, then she will indeed be the luckiest. But if we need it... Cadia threw back her shoulders and grasped the pommel of her talisman firmly. It will not come to that. And then, speaking briskly, she invited Prince Antar to call in again the loyal knights and the leaders of the folk, so that she might explain the plan of invasion to all of them. 43. That night, Haramis slept safe and dry beneath a tree on the shore of the Knoll, in a small park beside the citadel landing. She told her talisman to conceal her from sight, and a mist effectively hid her from the few guards on duty at the docks. In the morning the storm had passed, but the fog lay heavier, enclosing her within a soft gray room, where the only sounds were the occasional chirps and squeaks of birds and insects, and the slow dripping from the margin of the tree canopy. 
the dock guards, she discovered, had retreated to the citadel. The road from the landing led directly to the main gate of the fortress, less than a league away, and she knew that one part of her sister's foolhardy plan involved an attack along this most obvious route. She sat quietly in meditation and prayed for guidance. It was difficult. Other thoughts kept intruding, worry for her sisters, grief for the loss of her parents, and the white lady. Anger at Cadia's accusation that she had usurped the Archimage's robe. As if I even wanted it. But who else is there? Does Cadia think she could be Archimage? As if the thought had summoned her, Haramis saw the slender image of Bina appear before her, robed in her shining white cloak with the hood hiding her face. But the hands that rose slowly to push back the hood were young and unlined, and Haramis felt a sudden pang of dread. What would the face be? Would it be Cadia's? Or some horrible demon? It was neither. The face was Bina's, but it was transformed, radiant and no longer old, it was as if all that was mortal in her had departed, and what remained was her spirit in pure form. Lady, Haramis bowed her head. A hand seemed to caress her hair, and a clear musical voice, which was still somehow Bina's, said, What is it, my daughter? My sisters, Haramis replied miserably. They think I'm in love with Oregastus, bewitched by him, in fact, and Cadia actually accused me of usurping your cloak. But you know that is not true, the gentle voice said. In time they will learn it also. Cadia said I was power-hungry, and she thinks that is why you wear the cloak. It was not a question. I gave it to you, Haramis, but I cannot force you to wear it. It is a burden. And other people, even those who love you, will never understand why you do this work. It must be done for itself, not because someone else wants you to do it, or will praise you for doing it. The work is well worth doing, Bina continued. It is always there, waiting for the one called to do it. Someone must care for Ruenda, must make certain that it grows as it should, or at least that it survives until someone stronger can pick up the burden. There is great joy in the labor, to see the beauty of the pattern and to know that your efforts help to maintain it, to hear the voice of the land and its folk, to feel the cycle of the seasons and the greater cycle of the ages. Bina's voice fell silent, but in that silence Harima seemed to hear and feel Ruenda in a way she never had before. It seemed as if the land had a pulse, a heartbeat, and Harima felt her own heart matching the rhythm she heard. It seemed to her that there was a song in that pulse, a song she could almost hear and understand, if she could only reach out and truly listen. She sat in trance for a long time, only dimly aware of Bina's departure. Then a metal tray appeared before her, and invisible hands lowered it into her lap. On it were four hearts, apparently human, and a pitcher of seawater. Wash these, a voice commanded. In Haramis's dreamlike state, this seemed a reasonable request. She picked up the first heart. It fit comfortably into her hand and pulsed gently with life and warmth. She poured the salty water over and through it, and the invisible hand took it from her as she finished. She repeated the procedure with the second and third hearts, which seemed identical to the first. But when she picked up the fourth heart, it felt different odd. Something on the bottom of it pricked her palm, and she turned it over. To her bewilderment, she saw that it was a device of some sort, not a human heart at all, but merely a semblance of one. She reached for the water, but the unseen hand blocked hers. No, the voice said sadly, that one cannot be washed. He has given up his humanity. The mechanical heart was removed from her hand. I don't understand, Haramis thought. You must be able to endure truth, the voice said. Haramis didn't understand that either. Then for a time, she let her mind rest in a dreamless sleep. When she woke, it was near dusk. Using the three-winged circle, 
She watched the preparations going on within the Citadel, the warriors taking up positions to defend the fortress from assault, and the comings and goings of the knights and officers as they reported to the king. She saw Oregastus and the Green Voice readying the martial devices of the Vanished Ones. Two machines that summoned lightning, one that would screech with so overwhelming a sound that those whose ears were unprotected would fall deafened and bleeding. Two that sprayed a hail of deadly pellets, one that flung great gouts of flame, and another that shot poisoned needles. But as Haramis watched, it seemed that a small voice whispered to her that these engines of death were more suited to offense than defense, and might actually work to the disadvantage of those who tried to use them inside the fortress. She wondered what Cadia and Anagel planned to do. The freshly repaired citadel outworks and curtain walls could not be scaled. They were steep and overlooked by embrasures through which crossbowmen or the wielders of the sorcerer's weapons might shoot. While her sister's talismans might shield their followers from the sorcerer's preternatural sight, Haramis was certain that invaders would be quite visible to the normal eyes of the Labernaki defenders. The new gates were too massive for any ram to burst. Did her sisters think to use the talismans to break in? Pressing her wand to her heart, Haramis asked, Is this possible? And an answer formed in her mind. No. Her heart sank. I will give them what help I can, but I will not interfere, she told herself nor will I offer unwanted advice. They are following their destinies, and I have chosen mine. A great feeling of tranquility spread over her. Sitting here beneath the tree in the evening mist, she had a feeling again of being rooted in the very center of the world, of knowing her place in the greater pattern. I have become what I always knew I could be. But will its price be the death of my sister's? She held the circle upright and asked to see them, and when the vision came, she watched for hours, marveling. Most of their army, under the command of the human Ruendians and Antar's loyal knights, took up a position in the swamp just across the river from her own position at Citadel Landing, which was a league downhill from the fortress itself. Since this put them almost directly opposite her, she listened carefully and looked across the river to see if they were perceptible to normal human senses. Satisfied that they were not, she returned her gaze to the circle. Apart from the main body of attackers, a few hundred Wizgu and Wivilo fighters, led by Cadia and Anagil and Prince Antar, had rowed up the Mutar until they reached that place where the ancient water intake tunnel had its opening. Secured from enemy sight by the talismans, this group had disappeared into the cistern conduit. By the flower, Aramis whispered in admiration. If Cadia and Anagil can open the citadel gates to their army, then perhaps they do have a chance to win. Later, when the triple moons were rising, invisible in the fog, and the feast had its official commencement, Haramis made her own small ceremony and ate from the bag of provisions Jagan had left with her. Then Haramis asked her talisman where reinforcements of the Labernaki army might be. The circle showed her a fleet of over a hundred flatboats hurtling down the river with all the speed the oarsmen could muster. Even if her sisters managed to penetrate the fortress and throw open the gates, they would be overwhelmed once this second group of heavily armed Labernaki warriors arrived. As the picture in the circle faded, she wiped unshed tears from her eyes. So be it. Her sister's fate would be as it would be, and she must get on with her own business. She summoned a vision of Oregastus. I have made my choice, she told him. The sorcerer regarded her without expression. Will you do me the honor of telling me this decision of yours, face to face? I regret I cannot come to you. The Lammergeier you commanded to carry me here performed its service and then disappeared. Very well, she said. I shall come to the high tower of the keep. May I meet you in the cellar there an hour from now, at midnight, Oregastus requested. You know, of course, that none of us here can possibly harm you now that your talisman is empowered. I know, Haramis said simply. 
I shall come. Farewell, Oregastus said, and his handsome face softened in a smile. Fare thee very well, Haramus, my beloved. His image faded from the circle. Haramus began to gather up her things by the dim golden light of the trillium amber inset in her talisman. The mist began to lift, and a breath of chill wind rustled the long leaves of the wydal trees in the path. Among the reeds and shore brush, not far away, some creature was splashing and scrabbling in the dark. Haramus thought nothing of this, and was ready to call her Lammergeier, when the bushes parted and two gleaming golden eyes looked out at her. Princess! a voice hissed. By the flower! Imu! Haramis dropped the bag in which she had packed the crown and cloak, and ran to embrace the old Nisimu nurse. Imu! What are you doing here? The little being scowled and showed her diminutive fangs. Doing, doing, doing! It is a story too overlong to tell now. My brains are all in a frazzle because I have been hastening to rejoin my darling Princess Anagel, and since noontide today, my sight has refused to show her to me. Haramis nodded. It is magic engendered by her talisman, hiding her from the sight of her enemies, and friends as well, it seems. I came to the knoll and spied you sitting here in the park. I could hardly believe my eyes. Do you know where my princess is? She needs me. Yes, I know where she is. But I doubt that she requires your good offices, Imu, for she and Cadia are at this moment leading an army into the citadel to challenge King Voltric. Lords of the air, Imu wailed, and her eyes popped audibly. On such a venture, she will need me more than ever. Tell me how I may reach her side. Haramis hesitated. Do you have a boat? Yes, a small punt with oars. Haramis picked up her things. I will have to show you. They embarked, and Imu rode along quietly in the dark backwaters of the Mutar, following Haramis's guidance. After half an hour, they came to a narrow mud flat, with much of its vegetation submerged by the rising flood. Inland of this was the knoll slope with a high bank cut in it, and the level ground at the base of the bank was thickly overgrown with thorn ferns. The mud was roiled and pockmarked with a great welter of footprints. Here? Imma was incredulous. They've landed here? But it is nearly two leagues to the citadel from this spot, all uphill and on open ground, and I see no traces of them. Imu, they have gone in through the old cistern conduit. My sisters were confident that they could shield their force from Oregastus's sight, at least until they gained the lower levels of the keep itself. From there, they will attempt to open the main gate and the Vittler's gate. Imu was girding up her skirts grimly. How have they ascended the cistern shaft? A rope with a grapple iron was shot up. After one Wizgu climbed it, he hauled many rope ladders into place for the others. The ladders are still there. Scry them for me. Tell me if Princess Anagel is yet safe. No. I will only pray that the lords of the air will fight at their sides. Very well, then, the little old nurse exclaimed. You just pray away but I'm off. And she leaped from the boat, splashed across the trampled mud, and was soon lost to sight among the tall ferns. Aramis sighed and moved forward to take the oars. There were Labernaki scouting patrols ranging here and there about the knoll, and sooner or later they would discover this place of entry and give the alarm. I could bring down the river bank, she thought, burying the entrance to the tunnel. She lifted the talisman, the three folded wings assumed an open position within the circle, and the trillium amber shone at the center where they joined. Let the earth liquefy, and the mud flow to cover this place from hostile eyes. There was a low rumble. The high bank seemed to ripple in the mist, then slid to cover the tunnel entrance. Where the steep bank and the fern thicket had been, there was now nothing but a long, glistening, muddy chute, studded with small boulders. The boat rocked gently on the river. Tendrils of vapor stole about the surface of the water like ghostly snakes. Far away, she heard the drumming of fronial hooves. The Labernaki cavalry was patrolling the road to Rwenda Market. 
A silver trumpet called faintly. Another, closer by, gave brief response. In Haramis's mind, a voice seemed to say, The power is within you, and that is the great peril of it. She rode away in the sluggish backwaters until she was a good distance from the mudslide, and then put in again to shore. Tying the bag with its valuables to her belt, she called, Hiluro! The gigantic bird did not appear at once, but Harimus was not perturbed. She sat down on a rock and gazed at the distant citadel, which had finally emerged from the slowly dissolving fog. Bonfires must have been burning within the inner wards and courtyards, for the great keep and its adjacent wings were brightly illuminated. From the flagstaff on the high tower flew the huge Labernaki banner, blood red with three crossed golden swords. This was now also lit by fires burning at its base. It was almost as if Voltric were saying, Here I am. Take back your castle if you dare. Let my sisters win, Haramis pleaded, gripping her talisman. Please let them win. Haramis. She heard the familiar voice of her lammergeier. I have seen a dire thing. Hiluro landed as gently as a dark cloud, and she ran to him. What is it? Climb upon my back and I will show you. She did, and the creature soared upward, then flew away along the margin of the knoll to where the thick green mire met the Mutar River beyond Ruenda Market. This region was a lonely one, devoid of houses, for much of the knoll in the vicinity was bare rock with only meager vegetation. The sky was clearing rapidly now, and the ground fog almost entirely blown away. The triple moons were still thinly veiled, but enough light now reached the ground that Haramis could see below myriad dark shadows emerging from the mire in several streams, then converging into a single mass as they moved in the direction of the citadel, nearly three leagues away. But what can they be? Surely the second force of the Labernaki army cannot have arrived yet. They are Skritek, summoned by the sorcerer, the Lammergeier said. Oh, triune god, of course. Hiluro descended, gliding just out of reach only a few ells above the ground, and Haramis saw the fiends of the mazy mire, hissing and snapping impotently as the great bird passed overhead. I cannot let them devour my sister's comrades, Haramis thought in dismay. What should I do? A voice in her head said quietly, You are lady of all folk. But what does that mean? The Skritek are folk. She understood then, and she knew what she must do. She said, Hiluro, land in front of them. The bird banked steeply and flew back. He set Haramis on a mossy rock half a hundred ells in advance of the marching monsters and took up a position behind her, great wings outstretched. She put on the Archimage's cloak and waited. The night-keen eyes of the Skritek spotted her quickly, and they came dashing toward her, howling and hissing, moving at such a pace that she was certain she would be trampled. Instead they halted and fell silent, a scant stone's throw away. She lifted her talisman and bespoke them. Who leads? Nine or ten of the shambling scaled brutes ventured forward. Their jaws dripped stinking saliva, and they clenched and unclenched their talons and she perceived that their slow brains were all in a state of turmoil. She said, Do you know who I am? You were dead. He said it. We knew it. I am always alive, here in my country. All folk are my children. All obey me. But you have not obeyed. You followed the sorcerer and went to war, which is forbidden. You did not speak to us. You lost your power. He proved that when he called us, and you did not forbid our going. I speak now. Do you hear? We do, white lady. And every one of the great assemblage of Skritek fell upon the ground before her, penitently. Haramis said to the monsters, It was permitted for you to help the human invaders before, but now it is no longer permitted. Do you understand? Yes, white lady. The response included many a bespoken groan of disgruntlement, but it was nonetheless sincere. 
before you return to the mire, you will perform a task for me. We are yours to command, white lady. She explained carefully what they were to do, making certain that they understood that there was to be no wanton cruelty. Although this was a keen disappointment to the fiends, they were somewhat cheered at the prospect of even a little amusement and agreed to do exactly as she had requested. Hearing this, she gave them her blessing, mounted Hiluro, and flew away to meet Oregastus at the citadel. 44. King Voltric was not a complete fool, and fairly early on had recognized the breach in his defenses posed by the old cistern tunnel, but the Labernaki engineers were afraid to meddle with it, or with the well itself, because they were somehow connected to the main waterworks of the citadel. So Voltric could not close the opening. But for nearly two weeks the king had posted sentries about the mouth of the ancient cistern, and set a relay of men all the way down the long series of stairways leading to it, so that word might be passed upward instantly if any Rwendian invader attempted to gain entry by the subterranean route. But the well chamber was noisome and gloomy, infested not only with the disgusting slime dawdlers, but also with those winged animals of the night whose hooting, warbling cries were so persistent as to drive men half crazy. And as the days passed, with no human intruders detected, but plenty of ghostly ones seeming to lurk in the malodorous dark among the decrepit pumping machinery, the squads of Labernaki soldiers assigned to guard the cistern withdrew instead to the ancient dungeon one level above. There they used their torches to burn off the worst of the creeping things and incinerate the moldering skeletons, and with the ready connivance of their watch sergeants, brought down stools and made a table of the old torture bed and enlivened their dreary vigils by playing cards and quaffing contraband beer. As fate would have it, at the moment when the grapple iron of the first invading Wizgu clanked and dug in its hooks at the cistern's lip, a certain Labernaki warrior named Krugdal was detected cheating in the game, and his indignant comrades took hold of him to give him a drubbing. The soldier's row covered the small noises made by the fixing of the Wizgu rope ladders. By the time the luckless Krugdal was deemed sufficiently punished, nearly forty oddlings under the command of Prince Antar had swarmed into the cistern chamber and up the narrow stairs. The prince himself, attired in his full knightly panoply, entered the dungeon and began to berate the astounded card players for neglecting their duties. The men were dumbstruck at seeing the king's son appear as if from nowhere, and knowing nothing of his supposed treason, stood docile as he tongue-lashed them. When the fierce Wavilo and Wizgu warriors poured into the room, the soldiers were too stupefied to resist, or even cry out, and so they were easily bound and gagged and thrown into the old dungeon cells. Now the two princesses and the battle leaders of the Wizgu and Wavilo companies had a quick council of war. It would take time for the three hundred or so invaders to mount the narrow stairways and reach the ground level of the keep, where they might fight their way to the gates. From the captured sergeant it was learned that the relay of Labernaki strung out along the steps had a changing of the guard less than an hour hence. We must mount the stairs before this time, Princess Cadia asserted. We shall have to subdue the relay of foemen one at a time, using the utmost care so that they do not raise the alarm. One shout, and we are undone. A Wizgu battle chieftain named Preb said, I will take two of mine. We will go soft as mire mist and use blow guns to down the foe. But if you are seen by even one of them, Prince Anthar was dubious. You know that the magic of the princesses has shielded us from the wizard's far-seeing eye, but mortal men may readily see us. Anagil said, I will take the darts and subdue each guard. My talisman will surely render me invisible, as it did before when I was in mortal danger, so no foeman will have a chance to cry a warning. Antar was aghast and tried to forbid her, as did all the other leaders but she was as determined to go as she was positive of her ability to perform the perilous task. Cadia, clad from head to toe in golden scale mail, whose luster was barely dimmed by the mud splashed upon it, stepped forward and took her younger sister by the hands. You are right, Annie, 
The mission is one you are best suited for, and no one shall deny you that which your courage demands. Fair fortune to you, sister mine, and may no evil touch you. Kreb took a bandolier full of the small darts and draped it over Anagil's shoulders. You stick dart and leave it in place, man die, he said. You stick dart and take it out, man sleep for long time but live. But beware, do not stick yourself. I understand, Anagil said, her face calm beneath the gleaming coronet. As you dispatch each sentry, Cadia said, bespeak me. We will follow after in a body, keeping far enough below you that no noise betrays our movements. My princess, cried Antar, stricken, I beseech you. No. She went to him and kissed him lightly on the lips, a caress so fleeting that it was barely a touch at all. But it caused the prince's heart to blaze like a fanned ember, and paralyzed his body so that it was a long moment before he could voice his elation. But by then Anagel was gone, and the oddling warriors were grinning at the prince, and Cadia suggested, rather tartly, that they had better see how things fared down in the cistern chamber. Anagel's only prayer and command was a whispered, Lords of the air, defend me. And then she began a long climb. She came upon the first guard on a landing, a hundred steps above, a lantern at his feet, and his arbalist in his hands. He was a tall and well-built young fellow, clad like most of the labor knocking men-at-arms, in a steel mesh hauberk and a pot helmet, and armed with a short sword and mace, as well as a pouch full of quarrels for his bow. He was whistling softly to pass the time, and making bets with himself which of two lingets creeping up the damp wall would reach the ceiling first. Anagel came soundlessly up to him and lifted a poisoned dart with trembling fingers. Where should she strike? He wore a heavy shirt of quilted leather beneath his mail, and his neck was shielded by hinged plates dangling from his helmet. She told herself, He will fall, and if he fall upon me or upon the dart, then I may not be able to remove it and he will die. Oh, I could not bear it if he should die for he looks a brave and comely youth, and is surely some mother's son. And your mortal foe, a vexed little voice seemed to whisper within her, who would rape and slay you without thinking twice, could he catch sight of you. For even though he is not evil himself, he will follow without question the orders he has been given by evil men. And those who choose the warrior role must be prepared to endure the warrior's fate. Anagel felt herself cringe and realized for the first time that she also had chosen the warrior's way, no matter how she had tried to convince herself that she would deal with the enemy without bloodshed. If I had to kill him in cold blood, could I? She took a deep breath and thrust the dart into the back of the man's hand. Pulling it out instantly, she dropped it and shrank away from him. He uttered a querulous murmur, as of surprise, and his eyes rolled into his skull and his knees folded slowly. The crossbow fell and clattered a ways down the slimy steps, and his helm clanked as he fell prone on the stones. But he breathed. Anagel made certain of that before bespeaking Cadia. Then she hurried upward to the next sentry, her heart pounding and her body infused with a vigor that almost shamed her. Her fatigue and fear fell away like a discarded garment. The eerie passage through the muddy conduit and the vertiginous climb up the swaying rope ladder were forgotten. She was back inside the citadel, her home, and at war with its despoilers. All in all, she downed eighteen of them, and then at last she reached the brewery door and listened at it for a time, not thinking to view beyond it by means of her sight, and hearing nothing she slipped through, and came face to face with the green voice. Naturally he did not see her, but he did see the door open, and he felt the ill-smelling exhalation from the lower cellars. He uttered a colorful curse, and then chuckled and said, Yes, come ahead, you bog-skipping scum, and get what is coming to you. Perhaps we cannot descry you, but thanks to my almighty master we can hear you coming very well, and once your vanguard reaches the top of the stairs, you will meet the welcome your rashness deserves. The green voice had his hood off, and covering his ears were two objects like small caps, with tiny things studding them, 
and a band running from one cap to the other across the top of his skull. But Anagil paid no attention to this magical device. What seized her attention was a machine that two sturdy Labernaki soldiers were manhandling into position. It was a heavy gray box with rounded corners and complex ornamentation on the top and back, and from the front protruded a long slender cylinder of glass with many metal rings and rods strapped about it, and at its tip a peculiar thing made of gold. A thick cord of some shiny black material led from this box to another much larger one, which sat on a wheelbarrow behind a large stack of full grain sacks, six or seven ells away. "'Be careful, fool,' said the voice to one of the soldiers, who had staggered under the weight of the thing and nearly caused it to fall. "'This and one other are the only lightning generators left working, and if you damage it, my almighty master will flay the skin from your worthless body and deep-fry you in seething oil.' Anagil choked back a horrified gasp. The lightning of Oregastus came from machines? And now the green voice was preparing to aim this one down the staircase where Cadia and their army were climbing up. And Prince Antar. Moving Fedox swift, Anagil pricked each soldier in turn. As they fell, bearing the weapon gently to the stones, and the used darts clinked down beside them, the green voice took alarm. Familiar with magic, he must have sensed that someone invisible was there. He hoisted up his robe and ran as fast as his legs could carry him toward the large box on the barrow. Anagil raced after him and flung herself upon his back. As he struggled to manipulate some protuberance on the large box, the princess clutched a fresh dart and plunged it with all her strength into the back of his neck. He collapsed atop the magical contrivance, inert as one of the grain sacks in the improvised barricade. The strange headpiece fell from his shaven head. Slowly, Anagil pulled away from him. She could not take her eyes from the dart, and at first her hand reached out toward it, only to fall back. She seemed to hear words spoken long, long ago, or was it only four weeks since, when she and Cadia and Imu and Jagan looked out over a throne room splashed with blood, and she had demanded in her innocence an explanation of evil. Gentle folk may not safely respond to them gently, because evildoers do not know what love is, mistaking it for weakness. For this reason you, who are a gentle and loving princess, must find a sterner way of dealing with such ones. And you are Oregastus's voice, she whispered, and stood over him sadly until Cadia and the others came crowding into the brewery, by which time the green voice was dead. Then Anajobad, the Wavilo leader, Lamamu Ko, take his massive axe and hack the lightning machine into pieces. When this was done, the little army made its way up to the ground level of the citadel, and the real battle began. In times of peace, the giant flatboats serving the traders were manned by crews of free Ruendian oarsmen who prided themselves on their strength and skill, and earned high wages for speeding their awkward craft up and down the rivers. But with the conquest, most experienced rivermen eloped into the mazy mire, and the Labernaki, faced with the imminent loss of crucial transport, speedily enslaved those who remained, and pressed into service other inexperienced Ruendians to fill the empty benches. They were chained to their oars, fed poorly, and whipped if they seemed to shirk. But even at the best of times, the slave crews were far inferior to those of freemen, as both General Hamel and Lord Osorkin had discovered on their ill-fated expedition up the Mutar. Now, when Osorkin desired to return to the Citadel quickly, knowing from conversations with the late Red Voice that some serious mischief was scheduled for the Feast of the Three Moons, the great fleet of boats seemed to move along barely faster than the current. Scandalous numbers of oarsmen had died under the lash, since they had left the big encampment just below the thorny hill, and the rest were so mortally exhausted that no amount of flogging would speed their stroke. Osorkin called for the flagship skipper to join him in the bows, and demanded some remedy. But Pelin only said, cringing, My general! The rowers are done in and collapsing, and nothing can make us go any faster. Unless you wish to follow my earlier suggestion and replace the slaves with soldiers. 
Damn your soul, Pelin. We will lose even more time if we stop and unchain the oarsmen so that my men can take their places. And even then, they will make a botch of it. They know nothing of rowing. What can I say? The scrawny riverman did not look up. The flood gives us a fair pace. There is naught we can do but ride it. Osorkin ground his teeth, but kept silent. He was a less impetuous man than the late Hamel, whose command he had assumed, and he knew that Pelin told the truth. The flotilla would reach the citadel eventually, even if all the oars were stilled. He cast an eye heavenward, toward the bright fuzzy smear that indicated the position of the cloud-veiled three moons. It was near to midnight, and the feast had begun at sundown. Who knew what dark magic the witch princess Cadia and her Wizgu mob might be getting up to? Turning his back on the riverman, the officer strode up to the forward rail and stood there with his hands clasped behind his back. He was cloaked and warmly dressed against the chill and damp, but had not donned his armor. What is yon ruddy glow in the sky, riverman? Can it be that we are approaching the knoll at long last? Yes, my general. The docks of Rwanda Market are a league away, but you ordered us to proceed to the citadel landing itself, and that is a full three leagues farther by water. Yes, yes, I know. How long before we arrive? Less than an hour. Pelin had taken up a brass spyglass and now peered through it at the Black River ahead. Strange. The surface is greatly roiled up there. One would think the giant mylingal fish were spawning but it is the wrong time of year. Osorkin was immediately alert. Is it enemy watercraft? Nay, nothing of the sort. There is enough skylight for me to be sure of that. And now the same ferment is afflicting the waters of beam. Holy flower! Get back! A series of tremendous splashes, mingled with hair-raising roars, split the night's calmness. Osorkin saw rising up above the boat's gunwale a huge head with shining orange eyes and a grinning mouth that seemed half an ell wide, studded with teeth like white knives. A stomach-churning stench smote him like a physical blow. Skritek! Pelin shrieked at the top of his lungs. But it was the last word he ever uttered. The monster climbed nimbly over the low rail, took the riverman in his talons, and snapped off his head with a single bite of his jaws. Osorkin was beside himself with fear and rage, seeing what his putative ally had just done. What was worse, all up and down the length of the big flotilla, throngs of the fiends were boarding boats, and the screams of terrified troops now mingled with inhuman roars and whoops. Stop, Osorkin cried. Hold off, you misbegotten cornholers. We are labor -knocky. Your allies, your friends. The Skritek who had decapitated Pelin seemed momentarily flummoxed, as though he had just recalled something important that had slipped his mind. He howled out a phrase in his own language, to which his compatriots responded with disappointed groans and hoots. Then he dropped Pelin's gore-spouting body, seized Lord O'Sorkin with particular care, and flung him over the side. The officer surfaced soon enough, coughing and gagging, only to be nearly brained by an oar trailing limply in the water. He took hold of it and clung for dear life, and watched dumbfounded as the monsters tossed each and every labor -knocky into the muddy, swift-flowing water. The chained Ruendian oarsmen they let be. A few other Skritek ventured to nibble on their victims, but these were hissed and roared at by their fellows until they desisted. When all of the five thousand troops were flung overboard, a very tall Skritek, wearing a collar and belt studded with gold and gemstones, ripped down the banner of Labernock from its staff at the bow of the flagship and befouled it. All of the other monsters howled with laughter, then jumped merrily into the river and swam away toward the Greenmire shore. When they were far distant, Osorkin called out, Ho! Oh! Do any knights or soldiers of great labor knock yet live? A few score voices responded, some fearful, others obscene. Climb back into the boats, my lads, Osorkin cried. But as he spoke, the Ruendian rowers began to shout among themselves, finally realizing what had happened. 
The great sweeps dug into the water with alacrity, and the boats began to draw away from the floating labor -naki. Cursing and choking, Osorkin clung like a water vart to his oar, weighting it down, and after a moment it dangled limp again from the rowlock. Eventually he was able to make his way to the vessel's side and climb back aboard, together with a dozen or so others. Arming themselves, they regained control. Three other boats of the one hundred and twenty that had left the Trevista garrison were retaken, while the others vanished into the night. These four craft, carrying such warriors as could be rescued, pulled into the main wharf of Ruenda Market, where they were greeted by the Labernaki dockmaster and the captain of the guard. Fronials! Lord Osorkin raged. Fronials to carry us to the Citadel, or you are dead men! Mounts were speedily procured, and Osorkin led his force off at a headlong gallop along the market road toward the citadel. Of his original five thousand men, seventy-two remained. Forty-five. Hiluro flew to the citadel's high tower and alighted there. Dismounting and embracing the great head of the bird, Haramis said, I do not know if we will meet again, but take my blessing with you as you fly away. You have been a true and loving friend. The bird inclined its beak almost to the stones. I am ever at your service, white lady. Then he soared off into the sky, where ragged clouds now raced, and a high overcast once again veiled the triple moons. Haramis lifted the trapdoor, noting that it had been repaired since her departure, and descended the ladder. There were only a few guards on the tower levels where the treasures were kept, but they seemed not to notice as she went past. More soldiers patrolled the corridor leading to the mid-levels of the central keep, and she also came upon a group of five Labernaki knights staring moodily out a window that overlooked the river, but none of these men seemed to see her. It is as though I were a ghost, haunting my former home, she thought to herself. As Oregastus commanded them all to ignore me, or does my talisman shield me from sight? Am I to be only a spectator in this conflict, standing aloof as the white lady always seemed to do? What is my part in the fulfillment of the prophecy? Finally she reached the solar. The room had been prepared for her. A fire burned, and the sconces had candles lit, and there was a flagon of wine and crystal goblets on a small table next to the open balcony windows. She went to look outside, and her heart sank at the scene that met her eyes. Ranged about the great forecourt of the inner ward were thousands of warriors, men-at-arms waiting in orderly ranks, knights prowling among them inspecting weaponry, or simply standing around the great bonfires that had been lighted. Near the main gatehouse, stout barricades had been erected, and perched upon the central one was a strange machine tended by black-coated minions who served the sorcerer. On massive, high platforms, flanking the entrance to the keep itself, were four other machines and their operators. Along the battlements of the inner and outer wards, and the barbican, were lines of crossbowmen, and catapult crews were ready with missiles and engines at the bastions. The citadel gate that opened to the road outside was now completely blocked by a great pile of rubble that clogged its gatehouse to the rafters. Hopeless. Aramis whispered. Hopeless. And she turned away, just as Oregastus entered the room. He was clad in his silver and black vestments and a starry silver headpiece, but this mask was different from that which he had worn to worship the dark powers, for it enclosed his entire head and hid his face completely. Even the eye holes were glazed over with black glass, and his aspect was so menacing that she gasped aloud. The two of them stood unmoving regarding one another. From some deep and distant part of the keep, a small sound arose that Haramis could not identify. Oregastus unfastened his headpiece and took it off, setting it and his silver gauntlets on one of the benches next to the fire. You have made your choice, he said slowly, and you have not chosen me. No. I chose my path long ago, he said and I cannot now turn away. I know. From a pocket in his robe, he took a small wooden box, incised with grim carvings, which he opened, revealing a green ball. 
Aramis stared at this, uncomprehending. She was dimly aware that the noises that had begun shortly before were now increasing in volume. They were the shouts and tumult of fighting going on somewhere in the lower levels of the citadel. This is called the doomful effluvium. Oregastus put the thing away, his expression now unsmiling and implacable. If I fling it down from on high, every soul within the inner and outer wards, and even beyond, will die in unspeakable torment. Call upon Cadia and Anagil to surrender their lives and their talismans to you. To us! He seized her and kissed her with a strength that neared ferocity. Then he snatched up his gauntlets and star mask and went out, slamming the door. No, Aramis whispered. No! She wasted no more time, but took out her talisman to view Cadia and Anagil and their invading force. The circle did not this time grow pearly. Instead it glowed and seemed to expand and engulf her within it and she seemed to hover high above the kitchen of the keep, where a mob of tall and hideous Wavilo, urged on by Prince Antar, pressed into a faltering force of Labernaki warriors and knights. Hewing about with long-hafted axes and inflicting a fearful carnage, the forest folk demoralized their opponents as well as destroyed them, and as the foemen fell or retreated and the Wavilo cleared the way, tiny scale-armored Wizgu with crimson-ringed eyes, aglow, poured forth from the inner corridors like a tide of molten gold, screeching and flinging spears as soon as they had room enough to maneuver. The invaders passed quickly from the demolished kitchens into the bakery and the scullery, and from there began to swarm into the open area of the inner ward, where the main body of defenders awaited them, yelling and brandishing their weapons. At first, Haramis could not find her sisters, but finally she saw Cadia, a gold-mailed figure slightly taller than the Wizgu, urging the small warriors on and holding her talisman on high. And then she made out Anagil, clad in blue leather, who seemed to shimmer in the uncertain light and who stayed close to the azure-armored Prince Antar. Whenever an enemy came at Antar from behind, Anagil pounced upon the man and attacked him with some small weapon, whereupon the luckless Labernaki would drop instantly in his tracks. Why? Anagil is invisible, Aramis realized. That is why she can attack those brutes with impunity. Cadia must also be screened by her talisman. And they actually seem to be winning. It was true. But once the invaders emerged from the kitchen chambers into the open ward, the advantage quickly swung the other way. The small force of the fighting princesses was outnumbered by more than fifteen to one and the sorcerer's lackeys were at that moment wrestling with their infernal devices, swinging them about so that they could bear upon the area in front of the scullery door. Aramis snapped out of her trance and ran to the balcony, where she could look below and see the conflict with her own eyes. She bespoke her sisters urgently through her talisman. Cadia, the lightning machine is on the barricade nearest the main gatehouse. Break it, or better yet, use it to blast through the gates through the mound of rubble that the Labernaki have used to block the outer entrance to the citadel. Cadia made no reply, but Haramis saw a single gold-clad figure come dashing out from among the mob of Wizgu and go snaking through the yelling mass of knights with the bonfires gleaming on her fish-scale armor. Anagil, near the keep's main door are wooden platforms. But before she could finish, the sorcerer's lackeys began to use their deadly weapons. Golden-white balls of fire flew from two of the machines into the throng of invaders, and where they struck, they clung to skin or armor and inflicted horrible burns. From two other devices, which made a fearful racket, poured a hail of metal pellets trailing red sparks. These penetrated flesh and bone as easily as skewers pierce mushrooms, and those struck by the terrible things fell mortally wounded, if they were not killed on the spot. I see the weapons, Haramis. I am on my way. Anagel. Haramis bit her lip nervously. Be careful, even though they cannot see you. But at that moment, Haramis staggered and was half blinded as the lightning flinger let loose a tremendous bolt. The thundering blast caused even the keep to tremble, and the wine decanter and crystal goblets on the table behind her fell to the floor and smashed. When her vision cleared, she lifted her talisman for a view through the darkness and the cloud of smoke and dust. She was amazed to see 
that almost the entire great gatehouse had been blasted to bits. What was more, the path of destruction had continued in a straight line, demolishing the gate of the outer ward and that of the barbican. The mound of rubble at the main entrance of the citadel was larger than ever. But the massive piers that had supported the gates and a 4L section of the wall on either side were crumbling to fragments as she watched. And Cadia, God have mercy, Aramis cried. Atop the barricade, the lightning device was a blackened and twisted ruin. Near to it were three smoldering corpses that had once been the sorcerer's henchmen, and a single small figure clad all in gold, lying unmoving among them, a pointless sword still gripped in one hand. Cadia must have destroyed the device with her talisman, Aramis thought. But I did not realize she could be hurt doing it. I must warn Anagel. The fool! The speech without words ringing in her mind, Haramis realized, could only be coming from Oregastus. She has used the entire capacity of the device in a single stroke. The defenses are down, and the enemy is on its way across the river. Haramis saw him below her. He stood on a small parapet just above the keep's entrance, the silver starburst of his headpiece flashing as the smoke cleared and the dozens of small fires set by the thunderbolt brightened in the rising wind. His voice, magnified by some magic, called out like a trumpet to the stunned Labernaki warriors who had no notion of what was happening. Stand fast, men of Labernock, stand fast. From behind the sorcerer now stepped King Voltric, in his gorgeous golden armor with its awesome fanged helm, his long sword held high. At the sight of him, the troops below uttered a great cheer, and the fighting between them and the invading Wavilo and Wizgu, which had broken off abruptly when the great explosion occurred, now began again. But suddenly Prince Antar called out, loudly enough to raise echoes in the ward. Men of Labernock, do not listen to that demon! I am Antar, your prince, and I say that Orgastus has bewitched my father and turned him into a brainless puppet. A growl arose from a thousand throats. Be silent, traitor, roared Orgastus. But other voices were shouting. He's right, the prince is right. Look how the king just stands there. And one cried, Why isn't the king out here, leading us himself? And another Stand forth, Voltric. Speak to us. There were more and more shouts, until Oregastus lifted both his hands, and his eyes flared like twin stars. Silence fell. King Voltric knew he would have to speak, but what could he say? His courage was a thing in rags, his great ambitions fled like silly dreams. Reality was the Ruendian army breaking into the citadel in spite of all the magic Oregastus pitted against it. Reality was the voices of his own men wavering in their loyalty. Reality was his despised son Antar, defying him openly. Reality, above all, was the failure of Oregastus to destroy the three princess witches, one of whom was fated to destroy him. Soldiers of Labernock, fight on! Fight, I say! But the king's voice was more a croak than a clarion command. It is my wretched son who is bewitched. Strike down the turncoat. This utterance of his, far from encouraging the knights and men, caused them to clamor louder than before, and Prince Antar yelled, To me, sons of Labernock, down with the sorcerer. To me, I say. The fighting began again in earnest then, and in spite of Oregastus's booming admonitions, numbers of the Labernaki tore off their scarlet surcoats and rallied to the side of the prince and his decimated force. In the confusion, hardly anyone, and certainly not the furious Oregastus, noticed that those black-clad men who operated the terrible flame machines and the pellet-spewing machines had slumped down senseless atop their tall platforms. Only Haramis, open-mouthed at her little sister's temerity, saw Anagel fling the last dart and begin to wrestle the heavy machines to the edge of the near platform and topple them to the flagstones five ells below, where they smashed into pieces. When Oregastus realized what was happening, he roared for soldiers to climb the second platform quickly and defend the abandoned machines there with their lives. 
but the men now saw that the sorcerer's henchman up above had been felled by some magic, and the selfsame magic was obviously still at work, for invisible beings were throwing things down upon them. So no one would move, and Anagel continued from the first platform to the second and finished destroying the weapons that the sorcerer had usurped from the vanished ones. Well done, Aramis congratulated her sister. But now we must help Cadia. Anagel was jubilant. Was it not marvelous, the way she flung the thunderbolt? My talisman shows me a vision of our army coming ashore at Citadel Landing even now, and they will have easy entry through the broken wall. Anagel, Katie has been hurt. Go to her. I am on my way down to help. Haramis caught up the crown of Ruenda and the cloak of the Archimage and hurried down to aid her sisters. There, there, my liege. Can you not see her? Oragastus pointed through the lurid murk to the barricade before the ruined gatehouse. King Voltrix strained his eyes and finally said, Yes, wearing some kind of golden armor, is she? Exactly, and knocked senseless by the demolition of my lightning machine so that she cannot command the talisman. Princess Cadia is no longer invisible and no longer protected. She is in your power. All you need do is hasten there and put an end to her before she recovers, or is rescued by her people. I? The king faltered. Go down there. Are you afraid of an unconscious girl? The sorcerer's voice became silken, persuasive. There are no foemen anywhere near her, my king. Only your own troops, who would be afraid to touch her. But you can make an end of her, your greatest enemy. Cadia is the martial princess, the woman of the prophecy. She slew General Hamel and routed half our army, and instigated this battle. But she has not won. We still have nearly five thousand seasoned troops to counter the approaching rabble, and their female general lies there awaiting your sword. That's true. Voltrick drew himself up. Much good her magic will do her now. Go, my liege. Kill her. Then order your men to advance upon the Citadel Barbican. Cut down the invaders as they attempt to scramble over the ruins. A witch shall die, Voltrick bellowed. And as I hold up her severed head, you shall announce my deed with your voice of thunder. Oregastus stepped to the parapet edge and cried out, Men of Labernock! Your king comes now to lead you to victory. To the Barbican with you. Prepare for the final encounter with the foe. There were scattered cheers. You know, we really do seem to have gained the upper hand down there. The king grinned at the sorcerer. Most of those scoundrels who came up through the dungeons seem to have fallen. Your traitorous son Antar is gathering partisans while you stand here, my king. Go down. Kill Cadia first, then rally the men. To victory, Voltrick roared. He snapped shut the fanged visor of his terrible golden helm. Go, said Oregastus wearily. Go. When the monarch finally tramped off down the stairway, the sorcerer gave a great sigh. Removing one gauntlet, he reached into an inner pocket of his robe and touched the wooden box containing the deadly globe, at the same time forming an unspoken prayer to the dark powers. Would Voltrick be able to kill Cadia, or would her talisman deal with the king as it had with Hamel and the Red Voice? The chance was worth taking. If Voltrick managed to succeed, then it might not be necessary, after all, to wipe the slate clean. Orgastus stood and surveyed the advancing enemy force which had just been augmented by the heavily armed Ruendian brigades of Count Polundo. And then he searched the darkness of the Citadel's inner ward, seeking whatever clues there might be to the whereabouts of the other two princesses. He saw neither Anagil nor Haramus, but only a little old oddling woman, picking her way through the tumult and the butchery, as if searching for someone. 46. 
Imu stumbled through the battle scene, coughing from the smoke, tripping over the dead bodies of friends and foes, dodging around the melees and hand-to-hand -hand combat that made of the inner ward a hell of blood and iron. Anna Joel, she called. Princess, where are you? But when she questioned wounded Wavilo or Wizgu about her royal mistress, none of those who had strength to reply knew, for they did not know that Princess Anna Joel fought among them invisible. Imu saw King Voltric emerge from the keep and call to himself a body of knights, after which he headed almost straight toward her. The fighting seemed suddenly to fall into a lull. Following the orders of Oregastus and their commanders, most of the Labernaki were now streaming toward the ruined Barbican and the Citadel Gate, regrouping to repel the advance of the main invading force now rushing up from the river. But the king, it seemed, had another objective in mind. The witch, Voltric was shouting. With me, men, I must kill the witch. He had beside him Lord Osorkin, who had arrived just in time for the battle, and Serenitar, who had come to the citadel the night before with news of the invaders, and two other knights named Lotharan and Symbolic. The king and these four pushed through the moving crowd of defenders, thrust up their visors to see better in the smoky chaos, and began to clamber awkwardly up the barricade to where Princess Cadia still lay, senseless. Imu saw her too, and with all the agility her old bones could muster, she climbed painfully up the opposite end of the smoking structure and ran panting along its top toward the place where the golden armored form lay. Invisible hands were easing off the scale male hood from Cadia's head, and Imu clearly heard a tremulous voice call out, Cadie! Please wake up, Katie. The Nisimu woman cried out, Anajul, are you there, my darling? The golden-haired princess appeared abruptly as she removed her coronet. Imu, come quickly. Katie breathes, but I fear she is wounded. Two of them, came a harsh shout. Great Zoto, both witches are here. King Voltric and his four knights gained the barricade crest at that instant. Knocking Imu flat, the monarch seized Princess Anagel by the hair, dragging her from her sister's side, and raised his sword to her throat. Her coronet talisman spun from her hand, landing on the charred planks with a dull, chiming sound. Immediately the glow of its trillium amber winked out. Symbolic and Lotharen hold Cadia upright. The sword-like object fell from her flaxed fingers, and its amber also went dull. But her eyes opened slowly and met those of her sister. Men of Labernock, King Voltric shouted, in a transport of exultation, Behold! Two of the witches who threatened the throne of our great country are in my hands. A great roar arose from the throng of soldiers, and from the parapet above the keep entrance, Oregastus's voice boomed, Hail, Voltric! Hail, all-conquering king! Show us the reward of those who would oppose your rule. During this commotion, Imu had been creeping toward Anagel's fallen coronet. Now she pounced on it like a lothok and tossed it into Anagel's waiting hand a scant moment before anyone saw her. Two men seized the old nurse and prepared to fling her headlong from the high barricade. Anagel, still with Voltric's sword at her throat, cried out loudly, Harm her, and you are dead men. The trillium amber in the coronet blazed like a pitch brand, and the men holding Imu froze. King Voltric said frantically, The other magic talisman, that dark sword there, seize it! Wait! Osorkin shrieked, for he recognized the object and the danger in it. But Rinitar had already loosed his hold on Imu and bent to pick up Cadia's talisman. As he did so, Cadia's hand stretched out and touched the hilt an instant before the knight did. The three-lobed burning eye opened wide, and its beams shone full on Rinitar's face. His armor turned incandescent. He had not time to cry out or even straighten before the flesh burnt from his skull, which glowed bright as steel in a forge. As Voldric and his men cried out in fear and horror, the burning knight lurched and rolled to the lip of the barricade and fell to the ward pavement like a human meteor. Now there was pandemonium among those watching, but Voldric, to do him credit, had not moved his sword a finger's breadth from Anna Jill's throat, even though cold sweat stung his eyes, and his heart thudded fit to burst. Anna Jill turned her head to look up at him. Release us. 
You are defeated. Surrender and throw yourself upon our mercy. Voltric howled with hysterical laughter. Nay, witch, first your sister shall die, and then you. My king! Lord Osorkin pointed down, his face distorted with terror. The dark sword! It moves! Gaping, Voltric and his companions watched the three-lobed burning eye rise slowly from Cadia's hand, hovering at waist level. Princess Anagel seemed unperturbed by the sight. She opened her own hand, and the coronet floated away to meet the pointless end of the other talisman. No! The thundering cry of despair came from Oregastus on the parapet above. But it was too late. Princess Haramus became visible, standing between her two pinioned sisters. The crown of Rowenda on her head sparkled in the firelight, and the cloak of the Archimage billowed about her. Taking her own talisman, she slipped the wand into a channel in the sword blade, so that the three-winged circle formed a meridian and equator with the three-headed monster. Within this space the wings opened, and a great black trillium in amber was at the center. Orgastus lifted something that gleamed green. Then he flung it with all his strength toward the courtyard stones. Haramus pointed the scepter of power, and the flying globe of the doomful effluvium flared and vanished in a puff of white smoke. Now she turned to the two knights holding Cadia. The girl's dark eyes were alert, and her muscles tensed for a struggle. Release her, Haranus commanded, but the men hesitated. Let her go, fools, Osorkin cried. No, King Bolter screamed. I forbid it. Seeing the two knights stiffen and stand firm, Haranus moved deliberately, but with reluctance, pointing first at Lotharin, then at Symbolic, with the scepter. This time, the armor did not flame, but within each visor, blue-white radiances bloomed for a split second, and when it flared out, each helm was empty, as was the rest of the armor. Two suits of steel clattered in pieces to the planks. King Voltric gave a throat-searing shriek and dropped both Anagel and his sword. He fell to his knees. Mercy! Lady, have mercy! Haramis pointed the scepter at him calmly. Receive as much mercy as you have ever given, and let the prophecy be fulfilled. Glazen eyed, the kneeling king removed his monstrous helmet. He bowed his head low. As the throng watched in hushed awe, Voltric's own sword rose up, and its point thrust deeply into the base of his skull. He fell, with the weapon pinning him to the wood beneath. All over the embattled citadel, a sound arose like a low murmur of storm-tossed trees. On the barricade, Lord Osorkin laid his sword at Haramis's feet and knelt with bared head. Then there was a clattering and clanking as, all over the great ward, the knights and soldiers of Labernock threw down their weapons and stood numb, waiting to see what would happen next. Haramis faced Oregastus across the wide courtyard. He had removed his star mask, and his white hair streamed in the rising wind. The smoke and dust were carried off, and those fires that still burned blazed brighter for the air fanning them. Overall, the sky was cleared of cloud, and the triple moon stood in close conjunction midway between the zenith and the western horizon, seeming to touch and form a single orb with three lobes. Aramis lifted the scepter and pointed it at Oregastus. Now let our lives and our service be judged, she said. Have we fulfilled what was required of us? Have we done right? Have we acted to restore the balance? Judge us, and judge him also. Oregastus gripped the parapet's edge in both hands, and his teeth were set as his eyes again shone star-like with a terrible brilliance of magic. The spectators uttered cries of fear. Prince Antar, appearing as if from nowhere, took Princess Anagel in his arms. Little Immu stood beside Cadia, the pair of them steadfast. Aramis, 
Oragastus shouted, his voice still amplified by whatever device he was using. I can destroy you yet. I can summon the dark powers and move the very earth. Aramis closed her eyes, holding tight to the scepter, but in her mind she still could see his face. This isn't working, she realized. The scepter must need all three of us. Cadia, Anagel, she said urgently, help me. Take hold of the scepter and concentrate. She felt her sisters close in at her sides, and their hands joined hers on the scepter. The power in it flared suddenly to full life. It bound them all together, Haramis, Cadia, and Anagel at one end, and Oragastus at the other. It glowed with a brightness that blinded physical eyes, even through closed eyelids. But somehow, Haramis realized, she could still see. Cadia and Anagel were at her sides, so close they seemed part of her. And Orgastus confronted them along the length of the scepter. And in the bright power that held them, all illusion was burned away, and they saw themselves and each other as they truly were. It was terrifying. Haramis found herself aware of all the times she had hurt people, even inadvertently, the times she had looked down on her sisters as lesser creatures, especially in contrast to the beauty and strength she saw in them now. She could feel the same emotions in both of them, regret for all their past failures and mistakes, and awe at what they saw in each other. But around and through the thoughts and memories flowed the sisters' love for one another. Haramis understood now, and she knew that her sisters did too. In a certain manner, the three of them made one whole entity, their strengths and weaknesses complementing and cancelling out each other's. In spite of their individual differences, or perhaps because of them, they were one, and they were Ruenda. This must be what Vina meant by balance. Oragastus was perceptible to Haramis as well, but the feeling was totally different. The closeness she had felt to him when he had held her in his arms was completely gone. What she sensed now was his isolation, total and terrifying. He had no connection with Ruenda or any other land, or with any of the folk, and, in spite of what had passed between them, he had no connection with Haramis. He seemed to be locked inside himself, experiencing horrors that the princesses could only dimly sense. Aramis hurt for him, even now, and she could feel Anagel's ready compassion extending in his direction as well. But Orgastus was aware of nothing outside himself, and his self seemed to be unendurable. Aramis pointed the scepter at Orgastus. Judge us she whispered. Judge him. Again the scepter flared. All of them were momentarily blinded, and so many persons screamed from this shock that it was many long minutes before they realized that the sorcerer was gone. All that remained of him was a great black splash like soot against the keep wall where he had stood, and on it, high above the parapet, the white silhouette of a tall man's body. That year, for the first time, the Feast of the Three Moons was celebrated three days late, postponed so that the injured could be cared for and the dead receive their rites of honor. But on the third evening following that of the great battle, when the triple moons in their full conjunction rose above the mazy mire, all of the folk camped round about the knoll and all of the Ruendian and Labernaki humans as well, came together once again in the great inner ward of the ancient citadel. The Wizgu marched in first, led by Princess Cadia, carrying three branched torches and singing their ancient festival song. Then followed the gentle Nisimu, headed by Jagan and Imu, and the surviving Wavilo, marching behind Lamamu Ko. Then came the Labernaki, with their new king, Antar, walking unarmored and carrying only flowers in their hands. And last of all, the army of free Ruendians, led by Count Polundo, who had with him as many knights and nobles as could be summoned by folk passing the news through the mire by means of the speech without words. Haramus, crowned and cloaked and bearing the great scepter, welcomed them. 
Antar came forward and knelt at her feet to offer his nation's formal surrender. But Aramis said, Rise up, King Antar, for I cannot accept your capitulation. She took from her head the great crown of state and held it high. I, who was heiress to the throne of Ruenda, now renounce this crown. I call upon Princess Cadia, my next younger sister, to accept it, for I have been called to a different role, that of Archimage. Cadia stood at the head of the great throng of Aborigines, the trillium emblem glowing on the breast of her golden mail, and her auburn hair falling free over her shoulders. She said, I also renounce the crown, for my destiny is not to be a ruler of humans, but a leader and friend to the folk who have besought me to serve them. I call upon Princess Anagel, my younger sister, to accept the crown she has so richly merited. Anagel closed her eyes briefly, seeing again that strange dream vision of herself running through a forest in pursuit of her mother. And having this time caught up to Queen Calantha, she no longer felt apprehension as her mother washed and dressed and prepared her. That which awaited had been truly hers from the beginning. She also knew that, of the three, she was the best suited to wear the crown. She opened her eyes, walked to Haramis, and knelt with her head held high. When the great crown with its emeralds and rubies and huge drop of trillium amber rested on her head, she rose, turned slowly about, and sketched the three-lobed sign in the air above those watching. Antar was still standing by, and now knelt to her. Will you accept my surrender, great queen? But it is mine already, she said, smiling. Together, I hope, with your heart. And since I am a queen who cannot rule without a king, I propose that we rule our kingdoms jointly as husband and wife, in perpetual peace. She took his hands and made him rise and stand beside her. People of Rwanda, said she, I give you your king. And he said, People of Labernock, I give you your queen. A great tumult of cheering and weeping broke out then, and the folk sang their hymn again, and great quantities of food and drink were brought out, and the real celebration began. Standing close together, the sisters embraced. Then Haramis took the scepter of power and solemnly separated it. The pointless sword its eyes now closed in sleep, she gave to Cadia, who slipped it into the scabbard she wore and tied it in place with a lanyard. The silvery coronet with the three grotesque visages, Anagel mounted inside the crown of Ruenda, which she then resettled upon her golden hair. The wand, with its wings folded and the trillium amber glowing only dimly, Haramis replaced on the chain around her neck. We were one, Haramis said. And now we are again three. Please God that the world has been rebalanced, and the scepter of power will never be needed again. By the flower, Cadia growled. I should hope not. Peace is what we all need. Just think of how much we three all still have to learn. Annie, the tedious statecraft, Hera the magic, and I intend to go back to a certain place of learning and put some very important questions to a being who resides there. There are knotty problems to be solved concerning the future relations between folk and humankind, and I suspect it will take some time to sort out the answers. Anagel asked Haramis, Will you call your Lammergeier after the feast, sister, and fly away to live in Noth as the old white lady did? Haramis looked away, and for a moment her gaze passed over the parapet above the entrance to the keep. No, that place fell to dust when Bina died. I shall go to another place, one that I know of, high in the mountains. Antar came up to the three then, smiling apologetically as he told Anagel that their joint assemblage of subjects demanded that the monarchs lead them in festive dance. The terrible duties of sovereignty, Cadia laughed. Go along, Queen Anagel. The Archimage and I will continue our weighty discussions over food and drink, and when your majesties have danced holes in your shoes, you can rejoin us. Hand in hand, Anagel and Antar went away, and the music began. 
Hurrying across the twilight knoll meadow toward the citadel, the old musician Uzun heard the sounds of celebration and quickened his pace. He could hardly believe his ears. Surely those were the songs of triple moons. But had not the festival taken place three days ago, while he and the others on his boat were stalled on the riverside repairing the broken hull? He had missed the great battle, missed the victory, missed seeing his dear Princess Haramis destroy the villain Oragastus. Missed everything. Or had he? Oh, if only he weren't so incompetent at the speech without words. Those were certainly the festival hymns, and the sounds of merriment floating on the night breeze almost drowned out the calling of the swamp creatures. What a miracle! He would be in time after all. Something on the moonlit ground caught his eye. He stopped and bent down for a better look. The soil was very damp yet from the early rains, and all kinds of fresh growth seemed to have sprung up, virtually overnight. But this was something different, something he could scarcely believe was real, something magical. Myriad small plants were growing in this place that had once fostered only grass and sedge, plants with small black tripartite flowers. Uz and the musician picked one of the black trilliums and held it up to the moonlight. Yes, there was no doubt about it. The place was crowded with them. They were everywhere. Laughing giddily, he gathered as many of the flowers as he could carry and raced off to tell the good news to the people at the citadel. Thousands more of the trilliums remained, spreading their petals beneath the light of the triple moons. End of Black Trillium by Marion Zimmer Bradley, Julian May, and Andre Norton. Narrated by Madeline Bazard in the studios of the American Printing House for the Blind, Louisville, Kentucky. For the Library of Congress, July 1991. For special distribution as authorized by Act of Congress under Public Law 89-522, with the permission of the copyright holder and the publisher. A foundation book published by Doubleday. 666 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10103. End of book.